Or Finger Lakes TV. So Adam, do we need to unmute them to make sure that I'm live or going live or? They don't, they're actually not uh, live on FLTV until 7 p.m. So I just put it on YouTube live and, we're re and I'll record it so that there are multiple platforms to watch the meeting. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Okay, so let's kick things off. Welcome to the September meeting of the Geneva City Council. And um, at this point, I'd like to call for a pledge of allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to and the, to Republic, the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and clerk, I'm going to ask you to call the roll. But um, as you call the roll, please give us time to unmute, please. This will be our test. Uh, yeah, I got to unmute you first, huh? That one. <laughs> can they just do a hand wave? Does that work? Or uh, no? You know what? I'm just gonna, okay. can I? I'm just wondering. Can I just run through and unmute everybody? I don't know. Jan, it looks like I'm learning this, so just be patient with me. Some say ask to unmute. Another one say unmute. So if you see an ask to unmute, please respond to that ask to unmute. That's weird. This is interesting. Councilor Noon? Here. Councilor Galanese? Here. Councilor Burrell? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Here. I'm here. Thank you. Councilor Peeler? Here. Councilor Regan? Here. Councilor Camera? Here. Councilor Salamandra? Here. Councilor Pruitt? Here. Mayor Valentino? Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a couple of proclamations I'd like to read. Our first proclamation is a proclamation for no place for hate. Okay. Whereas the city of Geneva celebrates multiculturalism and diversity as a way of life, reflecting its history and legacy as one of the most diverse cities in our nation. And whereas the city of Geneva will continue to apply a standard of equitable practices and fair treatment toward every individual. And whereas acts of hate, bigotry, and bias are not welcome in our city, I declare that I will use all the laws and tools granted to me and this office by the state of New York to fight against the marginalization of community members on the basis of their race, faith, ethnicity, gender, age, disability, or sexual orientation. And whereas the city of Geneva supports the efforts of the National Association for Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, the Community Compact, the Geneva Human Rights Commission, GHRC, African American Men's Association, AAMA, Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning, LGBTQ plus activists to promote inclusiveness, celebrate diversity, and bring communities together to combat hatred and prejudice. And whereas to foster a transparent environment of respect, dignity, and mutual understanding among diverse groups and individuals via education, dialogues, and community partners. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Stephen Valentino, Geneva City Mayor, does hereby proclaim September 2nd, 2020, as no place for hate in the city of Geneva, New York, 14456. Thank you very much. Stephen, uh-oh, Lori. I feel my mother calling me. The next proclamation. Uh, this is for direct support professionals. Whereas direct support professionals, DSPS, are dedicated, innovative individuals who are at the heart and soul of, for support of people of disabilities. Agencies like Lachlan School here in Geneva, who have spent the last 87 years serving with disabilities, no, knows that no one, that none of what they could do happen without their direct support professionals. And whereas this year's agency are especially grateful to DSPS since they are in the front lines every day during the pandemic. These professionals have worked tirelessly to ensure that our residents are safe and healthy. Whereas every year a nationwide celebration takes place, highlighting the important work of direct support professionals, 
and those right here in our community as a way of showcasing the amazing and often unsung work of these incredible professionals. This is just a small fraction of the recognition they deserve throughout the year. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Steve Valentino, Mayor of the City of Geneva, New York, do hereby proclaim the week of September 13th through 19th, 2020, as Direct Support Professionals Recognition Week in the City of Geneva and encourage our residents to take this opportunity to highlight the important work of direct support professionals across the nation and in our own community. Okay. Now we will move on to the founder update and city manager can unmute herself. Thank you, Mayor. First up is from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, New York State DEC, and for their update. For remedial design, the New York State DEC's contractor met with myself, the Director of Public Works and Engineering, members of the Shade Tree Committee, and the Geneva Historical Society Director to review the remedial designs for Genesee Park. Uh, with the city's consent, a New York State DEC's contractor plan to begin cleanup activities at Genesee Park within the next one to two weeks. Uh, design drawings were completed for 90 Lewis Street, 112 Genesee Street and 118 Genesee Street. New York State DEC anticipates these properties will be cleaned up beginning in September with the exception of a children's play area at 90 Lewis Street that the New York State DEC remediated in 2018. Design drawings were completed for four additional properties on the north side of Lewis Street, west of Genesee Street that New York State DEC anticipates will be cleaned up in 2021. Soil sampling was conducted at 28 properties along Exchange, Wadsworth, and Middle Streets. The analytical results for each property will be shared with the respective property owners later this fall. For their remedial construction, the New York State DEC's contractor conducted additional restoration activities at properties along the east side of Genesee Street north of Genesee Park and at the Genesee Park Place properties. Excavation and backfilling activities were completed at additional properties on the north side of Lewis Street, east of Genesee Park, and restoration activities are underway at these properties. Excavation and backfilling activities continued at 98 Genesee Street and 19 Lafayette Avenue and will be completed this week. Restoration activities will follow. Additional restoration activities were conducted at 110 and 130 Exchange Streets, which New York State DEC remediated in 2019. As noted above, excavation and backfilling and restoration activities uh, will be conducted at Genesee's Park with our city's consent and three nearby properties along Genesee Street during September. Landscaping items were installed at additional properties on Genesee Street and Lafayette Avenue that were remediated in 2019. And additional 2019 and 2020 remedial properties will be completed in September and October. At the city's foundry site, site the remediation restoration is complete and just additional re-leveling of the area and overgrowth maintenance will just be monitored and handled as necessary. And on the resident outreach side, uh, Food Link's curbside mobile market for fresh vegetables and fruits is operating under the COVID-19 guidelines. The times are the Salvation Army from 1115 to 1230 p.m. Uh, Seneca Street Apartments, 1.45 p.m. to 2.45 p.m., and Elmcrest Apartments at 3.15 p.m. to 4.15 uh, p.m. on Fridays. And the Farmer's Market voucher program is available at the Wednesday Farmer's Market, and Jessica is there from 3 to 5 p.m. And the voucher program for the dog park is available again and for residents waiting for remediation. And just uh, last but important, uh, Jessica Avila is available for residents and can be contacted at gnrc at geneva.ny.us or 315-759-7354. And I will be, uh, later in the agenda, we'll be going over the Genesee Park remediation plan. Thank you very much, City Manager. Next is a consideration of the meeting minutes of August 3rd and August 5th. I need a motion to approve. Councilor Galanese, a second. Councilor Reagan. Um, clerk, please call the roll. And we're gonna, I'm gonna do this click thing here. Okay, keep clicking. Galanese. 
Aye. Councillor Burrell. Aye. Councillor Peeler. Aye. Councillor Regan. Aye. Councillor Camera. Aye. Councillor Salamandra. Aye. Councillor Pruitt. Aye. Councillor Noon. Aye. Mayor Valentino. Aye. Motion approved. Uh, next is public comment. And just a, a couple comments before couple public comment. Um, I need everybody that is on our public comment list, which is 27 people, to make sure you're identified. Your identity on Zoom needs to be clear enough for us to choose you and unmute you and allow you to speak, please. That will be important. Um, number two is our rules of order and procedure. So I, I'm just asking that everybody be respectful with your comments. And as you bring your comments forward, um, you can be opinionated, but please be respectful. That's all we ask. And number three is a three minute rule. And Lori's gonna let you know when you're at two and a half minutes and at three minutes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute you. So just in respect to everybody that wants to speak and respect the council and respect the staff and everybody's time in this meeting to keep it flowing, the three minute rule will be fairly strict today. So I'm just uh, giving the heads up before we get into that. So first on our list is we have Susan Henking or Betty Bayer. And if they're here, great. If not, they're being asked to move to the bottom of the list. So I'm going to rely Looks on- Looks like Betty's here. Okay. Yes, I am, but my video isn't working. Can you hear me? Yeah, Betty, it takes a little a second before that kicks in, but you should right. be kicking in soon. I guess I'll read at high speed. <laughs> Uh, oh, I see. It's it's got a prompt there. All right, there we are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the time to uh, speak to the city council tonight, uh, dear Geneva City Council. This is a letter from me and my partner Susan Hanking. We have lived in Geneva for several decades. We write to enter our voices in the chorus, urging the council to require Frank Gaglianisi to resign from the city council immediately. Moreover, we call on the city to move toward a policy which is substantially more robust than those you are considering regarding a police accountability board and the use of body cameras by police. We have written before, I did, submitted a letter, and will persist in raising our voices as long as, as longtime homeowners, taxpayers, and supporters of Geneva. Today we write for several specific reasons. We are city residents that believe accountability is at the core of all fair processes in the city. Two, a truly robust police accountability board protects public and police. Three, body cameras used will, well protect all involved in any incident involving police, including those police who are acting appropriately. The proposal in front of city council is in our view, much too limited and much too insular. In addition, we would like to see a full review of exactly how our tax dollars are distributed. In our view, much too high a percentage of those dollars goes to policing and much too little to the services the residents of our city need and to the proactive policies and programs which create and sustain a world in which options are available to all to succeed. Put another way, we spend too much money on reacting to what we fail to invest in preventing through childcare, anti-poverty work, efforts to reduce racism and other forms of injustice, rape prevention and community building. All too often we leave those to volunteer dollars when they ought to be funded through taxes and that is in reality lazy government. Let us elaborate. We, why ought Frank Ganglianisi resign? There are at least two reasons he ought to do so. First and foremost, he has been elected to represent the city at large and has shown himself unable to and indeed unwilling to represent a variety of city residents including at minimum those many associated with the colleges and those many who affirm the notion that black lives matter. And indeed, he has shown himself unable to represent anyone of color in the city. His behavior provides an unacceptable model to the young people who are our future. Moreover, Frank Ganlianisi ought resign because threats of violence are illegal and immoral, as is the white supremacy which he has affirmed. Removal from office and sanctioning is what he deserves. And that he fails to see this is itself a marker of a significant problem in his capacity to lead. 30 seconds. 
Should he show such poor judgment as to refuse to resign, his colleagues ought to pursue every action required to remove him from office. His threats of violence undermine the very dignity of the city council role. Leaders are held to a higher standard, not the low standard evidenced here. I'll stop there, but the rest of the letter has been submitted. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Betty. Um, next is Heather May. And Heather, I know you asked for time, so I'm gonna ask for a slight delay in the start of the three minute timer to give her the opportunity to get started. Her video's up, that's good. But I'm gonna ask you politely, please stick to the three minutes, please. Thank you for your time. Um, I live on Delancey Drive. First of all, council must pass resolution of censure and request for resignation for councilor at large, Frank Gaglianese, number 47-2020, and councilor Gaglianese needs to resign. We don't need to become Kenosha. I am disappointed, but not surprised that the councilor has chosen not to heed the call of his constituents. I am, however, disappointed and a bit surprised by what I have witnessed from all of city council during the past week's working sessions. The majority of council voted to work from the PPP PAB legislation last month. Law 2-2020 is explicit in the requirement for the board to be independent of the police, yet last night council moved towards a board that will include members of the police as a perceived compromise. The presence of police on the PAB is a non-starter. The police have nearly unchecked power to impact all of our lives. They choose what crimes to investigate, how heavily to investigate them, what resources to use, and whether or not to even show up in the first place. Given the resistance of the local union to even consider PAB legislation, likening it to, quote, the measures that were taken by the Nazis in Germany, end quote, how likely is it for a community member, especially one from a marginalized community, to feel comfortable questioning the actions of police while sitting on a PAB that includes the very police who are part of that union? Even if they aren't worried about retribution, the resident has to wonder if the police will simply choose not to provide assistance at all should they ever need it. Uh, based on the confusion I witnessed last night, I thought I might help clarify why an independent PAB is necessary and dispel the ridiculous idea that there would somehow be two parallel investigations. So I'd like you to imagine that a black man is pulled over, as was the former chaplain of Hobart and William Smith on his very first night in Geneva. After asking him a few questions, the police decide there is no reason to detain him and this, this other imaginary black man is told he can resume whatever he was doing. At that point, there is no investigation from the police. They're done policing, right? This would also be true if he were, say, awarded a ticket for speeding. The policing portion is over, but the black man might justifiably feel that he was racially profiled and poor, pulled over simply for DWB. With a PAB, he could submit a complaint. At that point, the PAB would look at the information that was submitted and determine what they want to do with it. Um, that's not a foregone conclusion. They could add it to other data to see what kinds of patterns emerge, look into why officers pulled him over in the first place, or make recommendations for changes in policies around driving violations, et cetera. There are a wide range of options. Um, finally, I just want to highlight, also based on what I was hearing last night, that it is possible to submit an anonymous complaint that would have plenty of information to initiate further investigation and questioning, such as the time, date, and location of the incident, as well as what happened. Um, if at some point the investigation cannot continue without the person's name, well, then the PAB would take that into account in terms of its decision, right? A decision which I want to also emphasize is ultimately either implemented or disregarded at the discretion of the chief of police. I heard repeatedly in work sessions that Geneva can't have a PAB with the power to investigate subpoena. Can you wrap it up, Heather? Yeah, uh, because it would engender lawsuits that are being threatened by the police union. And I simply want to ask, like, why are we letting them control the narrative and make it seem inevitable? They don't have to sue. They simply said they would choose to. And I'd like to just remind us that current, like, sometimes racist policing practices um, that would hopefully be ended through accountability are already costing the city tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in lawsuits. And that should also be figured into the equation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Next, we have Paul D'Amico and the city clerk will read this one. Yes. Uh, Mr. D'Amico says- giving you, I'm only giving you three minutes. I'll read as fast as I can. 
Mr. D'Amico says, I know it isn't easy being a city councilor. One of the most difficult parts of being newly elected is understanding the rules of procedure, how to navigate. I understand that the COVID crisis and the social justice issues resulting from the police killing of George Floyd made your jobs a whole lot tougher. I have a couple questions for you. Number one, why did you vote in favor of the PPP version of the Police Accountability Board? I think the whole council got ambushed by the July agenda. I don't blame you. I understand how and who can participate in creating items for consideration. In this case, it was poor judgment on the part of our mayor and city manager. The public hearing was approved by council at the July meeting. It was obvious to me that it was a mistake. I watched the whole meeting and I was hoping someone with experience and knowledge of rules of procedure would chime in, but that didn't happen. You spent the month in between the July and August meetings playing defense. And I have to say that even after you both, after you all had time to digest the merits of the police accountability board, still messed it up with your yes votes. The city attorney created a local law based on several factors. What would actually hold up in to a legal challenge, the city attorney took the original PPP version and cut most of it down to what he recommended for the August meeting. What you had on the agenda was a version you could all work off of. You can always amend. My point is it would be a lot easier moving forward with an approved police accountability board similar to the city attorney recommendation uh, that the bloated, legally challenged, able version you approved. Tougher to work down from the PPP version than working up from the city attorney recommendation version. Big mistake is in my opinion. Number two, why would you want a police budget advisory board? City council directs the city manager to approach creation of an annual budget with department heads based on your priorities. City council and, excuse me, city council has three opportunities to modify during work sessions. Why would you want to group any people, why would you want any group of people that know even less than you do to have input? Because it sounds good to the public. It says to me that you don't trust your city manager to come back with a police department budget matching your direction. I don't see the benefit other than to pacify. Do you trust the city manager? Do you trust the chief? I'm curious to hear your response to the police accountability question. I'm not convinced that you understand what your yes vote actually did to the process. You made your job harder, self-inflicted, unnecessary. I have painfully sat through the last two council meetings because I seconds. care about what's going on in the city. I don't sit and watch looking for ways to critique. Your meetings are hard to watch. Hopefully the way meetings have to run will change soon. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have Verna Chaffin, Nepa, who will be read by the city clerk. Yep. She says, my family was born and raised in Geneva. Some were nurses, teachers, and law enforcement officers. I am appalled at the responses I'm hearing regarding the negativity of our police department. This accountability board that has been an ongoing topic sounds like the people of Geneva have problems with our police department. What problems? Geneva has a very professional and caring police force. I would like to know the reasoning regarding this action and the people behind it and what situation has caused this to happen. I'm definitely not against peaceful protesting, but when some of them use explosives during the walk, during the walk in the face of these officers calling them racist and pigs then threaten to burn an officer's home that's not peaceful protest it is a potential threat that police officer is my family my nephew the fear you put in my whole family who were afraid to sleep that night in their home and also their parents who drove around in the middle of the night to make sure everyone was safe that was a big threat and a certain council person in jody dean should be held accountable and that council person needs to be removed for putting my family through this. All this counselor does is protest and criticize the police. With that said, this counselor should not be on any committee involving the police with the hatred she has for them. Geneva deserves more than this. This council needs to focus more on the needs of their ward in this beautiful city and stand behind their police force. Here is a quote from Mark Yearn, president of Hobart and William Smith for the eight, who was Hobart and William Smith's president for 18 years. We were privileged to find out how great Geneva was. This is a community of great people. He and his wife, Mary, made lasting impact upon the college and community. What they have built up in this city, you have destroyed. If you are not happy here, leave. Contribute something good to this beautiful city instead of trying to destroy it. Thank you. 
Next is Jim Jaguar, if you can find him. Mayor, I don't see him on here. Okay. We can move him to the bottom of the list. I'm a snooze or lose person, I'm sorry. If they didn't, if they didn't request to be moved to the bottom of the list, if they're okay. not going to be here in timely manner. Okay. Uh, next is Pat Broccoli. City Clerk will read. You're doing good, Lori. Really tough. <laughs> okay. So, what has happened to this great little city known as Geneva? Having resided in Geneva for 20 plus years, I find it so disappointing to see such convert expressions of violence, distrust, inequality and resistance to change and betterment amongst Genevans. This resistance to change in Geneva has long been a, a subliminal and now obvious theme here. Take note of other New York State public services that have been targeted with accountability to the taxpayers, just as is now being asked at the Geneva Police Department. The New York State Office of Mental Health, Office for People with Development Disabilities, Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, Office of Children and Family Services, Department of Health and State Education Departments each are held accountable by a separate review agency. The Justice Center is committed to supporting and protecting the health, safety, and dignity of all people with special needs and disabilities through advocacy of their civil rights, prevention, and mistreatment, an investigation of all allegations of abuse and neglect so that appropriate actions are taken. In 2013, the agency was created to restore public trust in the institutions and individuals charged with caring for vulnerable, populations by protecting the health, safety, and dignity of all people with special needs. How can the police department be dismissed from similar review? Perhaps the state of New York needs to legislate a similar agency to review the police departments as well. As a member of this New York State workforce, as a public servant, I am represented by a labor union, much like the members of the Geneva Police Force are, are, are today. This does not change our duty to perform our jobs with respect and integrity, nor did our union membership change the legislative action of the state of New York to stop the Justice Center's creation or operation of enforcement accountability. The union can be present as part of the review process. Speaking as a retired New York State employee, we, public servants, are and were expected to perform our jobs justly and ethically as safely protecting, as safely protecting those we serve without conflicts of interest. Despite local and national disregard for regulations of late, to include the Hatch Act, which by the way, was always enforced on a local personal level during my employment. Geneva needs to rise above these conflicts of interest and disregard for public opinion. The protests observed in Geneva have been peaceful and proactive and need to be granted the respect and consideration requested. Not every community has been graced with a nonviolent approach to change, but this does not mean it is to be discard, disregarded or unheard. And failure to take action for the violent seconds. expressions of elected officials also requires review and consequence. Please consider the changes proposed, require ethical council behavior and establish the police accountability board and perhaps restore public trust in the Geneva Police Department and Geneva City Council. Thank you very much. Next we have Curran Mocker and Council Regan will read. And, and Council Regan, if, if I screwed that last name up, please let me know because I don't want to get it wrong. Okay, I'll do my, my Lori-like best here. <laughs> Good political leadership requires integrity and accountability. We have a counselor representing the people of this city who has severely injured public trust. This, op this official showed up at an online community education event, offered appreciative comments to the individuals giving presentations and expressed interest in seriously thinking through the ideas presented. The next day, the same counselor was filmed at a Back the Blue rally, not only speaking disrespectfully about the educational event, but openly expressing hatred for the community members who held it. Clearly, this individual has no integrity. To engage thoughtfully with a group of community members one day and then tell, that, tell a different group that they didn't mean any of that engagement smacks of the worst kind of untrustworthiness in a leader. Further, this counselor's violent words were followed by weeks of increased hate speech in our community, on social media and on the street. Our right to public safety in Geneva must be inclusive of both physical safety and psychological safety. And right now I feel neither with this hypocrit hypocritical, hate-filled individual on our counselor. I am fully supportive of the resolution of censure and request for the resignation, the resignation for Counselor at Large Frank L. Galanese III, number 47, 2020. 
I've been watching the city council work sessions. I was appalled to see that legal opinion offered by the city council is being considered without outside pro bono counsel with specialists in civil rights law. Seeking input from a municipal attorney whose primary obligation is to protect the city from litigation will not get you a policy that protects both the city and the public. Your professional obligation is broader than the city attorneys. You cannot weigh our city attorney's gui guidance, which by nature will be one-sided without input from a civil rights attorney. Placing all on the city council's hands with more expertise when more expertise is needed has only caused delay in your process and public frustration with your lack of progress. In terms of the GPD, I would like to say that I appreciate the police's work and willingness to put themselves in danger for my public safety. But the police must understand that they chose this risk when they chose to be police officers. Black people who have been murdered by police officers never chose their risks and vulnerability. I will back the blue when the blue rallies for a system of checks to keep us all safe. The fact that the majority of our cops who are not bad apples, but folks who care about all Genevans are not loudly and boldly expressing unwavering support for a PAB is frankly shocking. Why not support the very thing that would ensure the public's confidence and trust in police? Supporting a PAB is supporting a trustworthy GPD. Finally, I've been appalled at the city's employment of uh, fire trucks, GPD cars, traffic guards, troopers, and other city officials and staff working the back the blue rallies. This is taxpayer money. Where is the accountability here? Why is the city allowing the GPD to spend budget meant for public safety on rallies against accountability. This is the very opposite of serving public interest and only further injures public trust in city administration. Sincerely, Karen Mocker, Geneva City resident. Sorry, was I? You're muted. Oh, that was asked on mute. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I unmuted you. I'm. I think the mayor was muted. Ah, and, you're yeah. right. Thank you very much. Not so just for. I apologize I, for that. I don't mean to cause delays because I did time this and it's in exactly three minutes. So here we yeah, go. Uh, first, thank you to Councilors Regan and Camera for bringing forward resolution of censure and request for resignation of Councilor at Large Frank L. Gallinese the third. I won't repeat my remarks from last month asking for the counselor's resignation, but instead I'll tell you what has happened since. I've emailed that counselor four times, once a week, each time putting response requested in the subject line. I've also called once and left a voicemail requesting a callback. I have not gotten a single response. The counselor chose to remain in office and is therefore my representative. They're saying that they want to kill me shouldn't mean that as their constituent, I don't get a response. I should not be the one punished here. The emails I send are not hostile. They are requests for answers to two questions. One, what are your reasons for not resigning? And two, how do you plan to make amends for what you said and what meaningful steps do you plan to take to regain the trust of the people of Geneva? My emails explain that I am asking the first question because I have heard so many reasons for this counselor to resign and their decision not to suggest that they have reasons to stay in office. Given that many have taken the time to outline reasons for resignation, the counselor should give us the same courtesy. I explained that I'm asking the second question because the counselor's apology promised to quote, work harder to be a better representative and a counselor that Geneva can be proud of. That suggests the counselor feels the need to do something differently. It's been over a month since that apology. Surely the counselor can at least outline a plan if not point to proof of what they have done to make that change. I hope that all of you will call upon that counselor tonight to answer these questions about a reason for not resigning and a concrete plan for making amends and regaining trust tonight. Um, the second thing I want to raise is a request that the city council remove and replace the city attorney. I do not make this request lightly. Back in July, city staff, including the city attorney, actively obstructed the work of this council and they were given a warning by council about this behavior. This week, we saw more of the same. On August 24th, the city attorney asked for and got the contact information of a pro bono law firm. He was responsible for reaching out. But a week later on Monday, he said, quote, I'll acknowledge I haven't done anything about it. 
These delays are potentially gonna cost the city access to a free alternative legal interpretation, which the people of Geneva and this city council have said that they want. These lawyers need to be formally contracted by the city to begin their work. And now their feedback will be likely too late to be helpful as 2020 will already be amended based on the city attorney's feedback. Is that what he wanted? The city attorney does not support the legislation, which is fine. People are welcome to support or oppose it, but he has let his personal opinion prevent him from doing his job. It is great that he was working over the last week to draw up documents for the council, but if he had simply sent an email, these other attorneys could have also gotten to use that same week to draw up other materials that this council requested. As it stands, that work is now another week behind. The city attorney was warned to stop obstructing this council's work. He has continued to do so and should be removed. My final quick point is my disappointment over yesterday's work session. This council should be creating a PAB which works independently of the GPD. The people of this city have asked for a PAB because they do not trust the GPD to investigate themselves. I ask that you put as much trust in the people of Geneva as you seem to have in the GPD and you take them at their word. They do not trust GPD to investigate and this iteration of the PAB will not be effective. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Anna Wagner and the city clerk will read. This is, I'm submitting this as a public comment for the 9-2 council meeting. I am grateful to Jan Regan and Ken Camera for calling this resolution for the, res the re resignation of Frank Galanese. His toxic rhetoric put his constituents in danger. As long as he is on city council, his presence distracts from an, any actual debate and dialogue. He is a threat to us as individuals and a threat to our ability to get any work done on all the pressing issues facing Geneva right now. Oh, I was waiting for more. Thank you very much. I like the short and sweets. Next is James McCorkle will speak. Council, wait, wait. All right. So, Councilor Cameron, this is public comment. I did let you unmute. Go ahead. You got to. You got to hit the button. I did. Wait, oh, James. the video too. No, what was that? Know. It was old oh, James. That lady's name. It was Anna. Anna Wagner. Wagner. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. McCorkle. Um, Am I all set? Please go ahead. Yes. Okay. So, thank you for providing time for me to speak. I'd like to thank the two councilors and mayor who broke silence and have put forward resolutions for censure and request the resignation of one of the councilors at large. There are many reasons for demanding the councilor's immediate resignation, including the physical well-being of the entire community. But I would like to comment on the need for ethical governance and how this pertains to other issues before you, including the bylaws for body camera task force and the police budget advisory board. When the council person in question said, paraphrasing, I don't need to read anything, my vote is no, this sends a message that perhaps all deliberations before you will be similarly dismissed. Will the body camera and police budget boards, will the city administration, the city attorney, or the police of chief, or the police union say, nope, I don't need to read that, my vote is no. The council member who is under scrutiny here has undermined my confidence in the city government's ethical capacity. When the police union representative states that the PAB is something that the Nazis would institute, really? A Gestapo accountability board? Give me a break. Am I supposed to consider that officer an expert that I can trust his ethical judgment? or as he is officially representing the GPD and the police union, trust them on policy, on the street. I close with two news items. Rochester police have been found guilty in the choking death of a black man, Daniel T. Prude in March. And today in LA, a black teenager was shot 20 times in the back as he ran from the police for a bicycle infraction maybe riding on the sidewalk like my, my, like my daughter was once cited for, but she, she's white. I wonder what the city will do if that happens here in a year, if it does nothing now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next we have Catherine Schlenning Haynes.
Catherine, I see you're unmuted. Just unmuted her. Okay. And she's probably working on getting her video up and going. Okay. Catherine, are you there? Can you hear us? There you go. Catherine, we can't hear you for some reason. It's not yet. You're unmuted, so it's something on your end. You can hear us, I take it. I'm reading lips. I think that was yes, I can. Oh, now you're muted. Uh, can you unmute her again? Okay, you're unmuted, Catherine, but we, I, I can't hear you. There we go. Okay. There you go. There you go. Okay, gotcha. Sorry about that. gotcha. All right. Good evening. My name is Catherine Signing Haynes, and I live in Ward One. I have previously spoken and wish to affirm that Black Lives Matter. I do not believe that elected officials should threaten their constituents, and if they do, and if they do so, they should resign. A specific case is being discussed tonight, and given that several willful statements of identified council person. Excuse me. Um, we, we can hear you fine. I, I know. I realize that. My husband didn't know that. Um, <laughs> uh, should that? Uh, sorry. I do not believe that elected officials should threaten their constituents, and if they do so, they should resign. A specific case is being discussed tonight, and given that several willful statements of harm have been recorded, I support the resolution demanding the resignation of the identified council person. Lastly, I support the PAB. I don't have much more to add to my previous comments on these matters. However, I do want to address something that is of, of a growing concern to me. When the People's Peaceful Protest began after the killing of George Floyd, I was so impressed by the work that was being done to keep the protest, peace, to keep the protest peaceful and welcoming, as well as to put forth constructive uh, proposals for change. I was also pleased that Chief Pasalakwa came to the NAACP rally and indicated that he was listening, that he wanted to learn. Issues with community police relations in Geneva aren't new. The Department of Justice has been involved since the killing of Corey Jackson. I am now losing heart, not because there are differences of opinion. In fact, through differences, often more elegant solutions can be found. But this requires respect and dialogue. I'm extremely disappointed that some members of the community are trying to address their disagreement with the proposals of the PPP and related activities by spreading untruths and sowing seeds of division. An attempt to villainize tools for social change, of which I was part and is now defunct, loosely organized community group committed to social justice through dialogue would be an example of this. Additionally, there are attempts to quote other unquote people um, to just somehow discredit people who aren't born or ra and raised in Geneva, despite the fact that they are engaged tax paying residents of the city. I understand that change in the fabric of a town such as Geneva or an institution such as the police department is not easy. It can be scary and uncertain. And I respect, as I have said before, that it must, be, it must not be easy time to be a member of the police force. It is also not easy to be a member of any number of underrepresented groups that have historically received less than equal treatment at the hands of the criminal justice system. I think that, that we have a community, sorry, I think that we as a community can agree that we want to feel safe in our Geneva. I hope that we can also agree that safety is the right of every citizen in Geneva. We might have very different ideas of how we get there, but please don't let Geneva go the route of so much of the country with animosity, villainization, fear mongering, intimidation, and mistruth. Geneva is a small community and it is not that difficult to engage with one another. Please, please, if you, you or any of your associates are engaging in dehumanizing behavior, bring this to a stop. Bring your ideas to the table, share constructive criticism, disagree, but stop tearing our community apart. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Next is Steph Anir. Okay, I'm just waiting to see if I get a cue for video. In the meantime, can you hear me? We can hear you. And as soon as you're there's your video. Okay. Hello, Mayor, Councilors. Thank you for your time. My name is Stephanie and I live in Ward 2. I would like to divide my time into two areas. First, a call to resign is a needed public statement. It is important for our community to hear City Council acknowledge that a line has been crossed. 
a line that you cannot ever represent people once they hear you say that you would like to shoot and kill people in your community who you disagree with. Every day we dismiss comments we hear. It is easy to dismiss things. It is hard to say out loud that a line has been crossed. Yet when someone goes too far and no one speaks up, a new line is drawn. Now what has been done is acceptable. I just read online, this counselor, quote, could use a piece of hot lead between the eyes, unquote, referring to a current city counselor. I do not want death threats to be our new normal. To the many of you who have already spoken up, I hear you and I thank you. Second, I fully support Local Law 2 2020 to establish a police accountability board. This law requires all five pillars for balance, but I hear some concerns. I also do not want our community to build a combative relationship with our police force. Yet I worry if Union President Travis Farmer speaks for our public police department. Police unions are in the private sector and advocate for only police officers, not the public they serve. Travis Farmer, after comparing proposed legislation to the Nazis in Germany, ends his letter, quote, we will have no choice but to take every measure available to us to stop the implementation of these three proposals if city council adopts them as they are, unquote. As a member of the school board myself who has to put our budget to a vote every single year, engaged community members reviewing the police budget and making recommendations does not sound unreasonable. It sounds smart to get new eyes on the most expensive line item in our city budget. I also read the words, every measure available to us as a threat to sue our city if our city council does not listen to this private sector group who almost entirely do not reside in Geneva. I imagine that our police officers are exhausted and under great stress. However, threatening language does not give me faith that our police want to improve policing in Geneva. Again, as a member of the school board, I love our schools and our fantastic teachers and staff. Yet can we improve? Absolutely, we must. It is our job to do our best for every student and we have work to do. And we cannot improve in a vacuum without our community. I hope the Geneva Police Department agrees that listening to our community and trusting our community's concerns is how they grow better. And I especially hope that you and council will listen to and trust our community. I also love our city. And can we improve? Absolutely, we must. Please support all five pillars of the Police Accountability Board. Thank you for your time. Next is Barney Goldstein. Good evening, my name is Barney Goldstein. I'm a resident of Ward 2 here in Geneva. During last month's city council meeting, I submitted a written statement adding my support to the growing chorus of individuals and organizations calling for the resignation of a current city councilor. I won't repeat what I already voiced in that statement, but the call for his resignation, I think, has become more urgent. Since his conduct that occurred on July 19th, that councilor has remained silent, other than once their public comments were circulated, making a videotaped statement is devoid of heart, conviction, personal responsibility, or self-reflection. Fortunately, those supporting his resignation have not remained silent, as a growing number of Genevans, both individuals and organizations, have voiced support for that resignation. Yet, there are certain individuals, at least on social media, who have come forward in the counselor's defense. Most disturbing to me is the one organization that has publicly supported him, the political party of which he is a member. And reading that committee's comments on its official Facebook site, and then in this week's letter to the uh, editor in the Finger Lakes Times, I frankly feel like I'm living in bizarro world. The counselor's words and their words in reaction to his words speak for themselves. July 19th, quote, this is what the silent majority is all about. This is the country, not the minority little squawkers that think their voice is being heard. It's not, end quote. August 24th, the committee's Facebook site, quote, ill-advised remarks, end quote. July 19th, quote, the college did their whole thing for police accountability. If I could have got a gun and shot the squares in my computer screen and killed everybody, disgusting. August 2nd, the committee's Facebook site, quote, unfortunate choice of phrasing, end quote, to quote, voice his frustration, end quote. September 1st, the committee's letter to the editor, quote, ill-advised comment describing the counselor's conduct as showing, quote, a lack of sensitivity, unquote. 
This demonstrates a huge disconnect between his heinous conduct and the official support for the perpetrator of that conduct. This counselor professes to represent all Genevans and to love the city of Geneva. Their actions during July 19th and since then belie that. Since July 19th, their hateful words and threats in fact have been echoed through hate speech and physical threats to individual Genevans, including members of the People's Peaceful Protest. This counselor's continued presence as a public official emboldens this conduct and perpetuates divisiveness and fear. Perhaps that's what this counselor wants. As long as the council remains on city council, their presence undermines the credibility of the entire council. For those on council who support the counselor's continued presence, it's my opinion that you are enabling dangerous rhetoric and possible physical violence, if not by him, then by his supporters. While a counselor's resignation will not resolve or heal the current unprecedented level of divisiveness in the city, it will be an essential step in beginning that. Thirty seconds. Thank you. To that end, I support the mayor's initial call for his, this counselor's resignation and tonight's resolution for censure and request for resignation to be presented by two city councilors. This counselor's resignation will be a much needed step forward for both the council and the city at large. Thank you so much for your time. Next is Kelly Crawford and the city clerk will read. Sorry, I got this last minute. I... Okay. Good evening. I am proud to say that I was born and raised in Geneva. I attended an event this past Sunday where we were encouraged to voice our concerns regarding city council issues. The mayor indicated that he would be open to hear any comments from community members. Michael Pinko arranged this peaceful event for Geneva residents in order to talk about the issues occurring in our city. I was concerned about the mayor's behavior at this event and was appalled at the comment he made to Mr. Pinko and Mr. Pickey. I couldn't help but wonder why the mayor would behave in such an adversarial manner. Isn't he there to represent all of us? We should be thankful that we have Geneva citizens who are willing to bring us together to effect positive change. I believe that the mayor owes Michael and Daniel an apology. Our mayor mentioned that the community wished he take control of the council members during the city meetings. Our mayor said, had said it was their freedom of speech. No, it's called respect, something many of you lack. I understand this because the city attorney's findings and recommendations regarding the police accountability board were not to council's liking. Two additional attorneys will be hired in a hope that they come up with different findings. Does the council realize that they represent the people of Geneva? Are Geneva residents even aware that this occurred? Who pays for these two attorneys? The city of Geneva representatives have done nothing but create dissension and mistrust. You are so blinded to the actions of another council member's wrongdoings that your goals for your city are questionable at best. You have in your midst a council member who calls for the banning of those business owners who believe, whose beliefs and opinions do not, do not match their own. A paid council member whose goal is to destroy the very community that he or she represents. Let that sink in. It's obvious to most of the council is stuck in a real quagmire. To admit that mistakes were made takes real courage. If we truly care for Geneva, it's time to act. Let's hold those who are not invested in our city accountable for their actions. Next is Mr. Jim Meany will speak. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear okay. you, yes. All right. Um, good evening, Council. My name is Jim Meany. I'm a former resident, <clears throat> and now I live outside the city limits, just like the overwhelming majority of GPD officers. Uh, during the month of July, the public watched as the city attorney refused to follow the instructions of the city council to draft a proposed local law for a police accountability board forcing the cancellation of the August 5th public hearing. And the city attorney went to the media and said it was all city council's fault. At the August 3rd, 2020 special council meeting, city council agreed to arrange a presentation from an outside attorney to provide an alternative legal opinion on the proposed police accountability board. It was important that city council pay a little more uh, for a second opinion, considering the importance of this legislation. Uh, later in office, later in August, council paid a Hancock Estabrook attorney to give a presentation in which he agreed with the city attorney's opinion on the PAB. At the August 24th spe special council meeting, council decided that 45 
500 to $5,000 was too much to pay for that alternative legal opinion. But there was another law firm willing to provide an alternative legal opinion pro bono. And the city attorney was instructed by counsel to contact that pro bono firm to follow up. One week later at the August 31st special city council meeting, the city attorney told counsel that he didn't get around to contacting the pro bono attorney. And then last night, counsel began making major changes to the draft PAB. It was over a month ago that you all decided to seek a second legal opinion and it never happened. City Council needs to relieve the city attorney of his duties for repeatedly refusing to follow their instructions and actively obstructing the PAB process. More importantly, City Council needs to wait until that second legal opinion is in hand before making any more changes to Local Law 2-2020. Uh, finally, during last night's council discussion on the investigative powers of the proposed independent PAB, we heard one counselor claim to have watched a lot of fictional TV cop shows before offering an, opi an opinion on how police complaint investigations should be done. We heard another counselor suggest that an independent accountability board could include 50% police officers and 50% residents. We heard counselors repeatedly express concerns about the financial costs of lawsuits by the police union, the same union that called the prospect of a PAB, quote, terrifying, and literally compared you to Nazis for even proposing such 30 a 30 seconds. And when it was over, your consensus was to move forward with a model where the GPD investigates all complaints, which are then reviewed by the PAB. And just like that, the majority of counsel under pressure from the police steered away from creating bold, meaningful in oversight and towards yet another public relations exercise that will protect the police from too much scrutiny while telling the people it's progress. The people aren't asking counsel for proclamations against hate and implicit bias trainings. The people are asking for independent police oversight and your job Time's is to up, explore and Thank discover you. how you can make that happen. Next on our list is Penny Hankin. Hello, my name is Penny Hankins. I support my Ward 3 counselor, Jan Regan, and Councilman Kim Camera, and salute them for calling for one counselor's resi resignation tonight after he made disturbing and violent remarks regarding citizens of Geneva. He who expressed his desire to shoot his constituents should resign now, for he has shown no genuine concern or remorse for his words. Someone like this is unfit for office. I heard recently at a meeting of an NAACP that this city councilor said he couldn't step down because what would that say to his wife and kids? He would be a quitter after all. Are you kidding me? The question is, what does it what does it say to your wife and kids that you, a man of the people, verbally wished to shoot your very own constituents and call them disgusting? That is what you need to explain to your wife and kids as you are stepping down and taking responsibility as a real human should. Resign now, city councilor, resign and show your family you do have some ethics and have taken responsibility for your words words that could lead to another sick person's actions as we have seen time and time again in this country. And I just have one more thing to offer. In addition, I am sickened by the false equivalency between Frank Galanisi and another counselor in attendance. Ms. Hankins, There's please, no evidence no whatsoever in her case counselor. and Ms. videotape Ms. evidence in his and the story. Next is Cynthia Williams. Hello, I'm gonna start my video. There we go, thank you. So thank you to the council and mayor for this opportunity. Um, I will speak very briefly. I am um, completely in favor of the 47-2020 request for censure and request for resignation for counselor at large Galanese. I thank counselors Camera and Reagan for their leadership in this. I support the establishment of an independent police accountability board as originally proposed, not the city attorney's version. We have heard quite a few comments about why the currently proposed version is a problem. Um, 
I have written to city council. I've written letters to the editor. I think people know where I stand on this. And I, I thank you for your leadership. Next on our list is Mr. Adam Pryor. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Adam Fryer. I lived in Geneva for most of my life. I recently moved for an internship opportunity and I plan to return someday. Um, I plan to die in Geneva, but hopefully of old age and not of being shot by police or certain city councilors or by domestic terrorists. Uh, certain councilors have inspired uh, to make threats towards me and others for participating in city government. Um, so I have been listening to the uh, city council discussions throughout the week regarding the police accountability board. Um, a lot of people hit on these points already during these discussions, um, but my point of view on it is that the police accountability board is not illegal. And I feel like I say this every single time I talk to the council, um, just because the city attorney arbitrarily highlighted the entire document without any citation or reason or legal reference or anything like that does not mean that it is illegal. So just wanted to bring that up for the, the next time. Uh, next time you guys go into discussion, just ask what is so illegal about these points? Ask for the citation, ask for the law. What is it violating? Because due to our research, we it passes. Um, we. Uh, took out the point in the Rochester uh, Police Accountability uh, Board that is currently in litigation, which would mean that the, the Police Accountability Board would met the discipline. That is not in the PPP proposal. The, the police chief can do whatever he wants, but the Police Accountability Board will give its recommendation based on the matrix which they decided upon beforehand between the city manager, um, the police chief, and the Police Accountability Board. There's nothing illegal about that. So let's just get that straight before you guys meet tomorrow. So you know that is not illegal. Um, if you are, uh, so a lot of people hit on this as well, but I feel like if you do not remove the city attorney or at the very least um, seek outside counsel, um, you are doing yourselves and the city a disservice. He is lying constantly. He is not giving you any citation and he's conti he continues to subvert the democratic process uh, of the majority vote of this legislation. So let me skip ahead. Um, a lot of people talked about all this stuff I was gonna talk about, but that's great because uh, we all are on the same page. Um, I was an investigator for Lachlan School. Um, investigations, police can have their investigations at that agency. There's also a justice center, which is a statewide investigative board. These are also a part of the Office of Mental Health, which I also worked for, but I was not an investigator. As an investigator for Lachlan School, uh, I would use my discretion and the agency would use their discretion to halt an investigation if it, would inv if it would overlap with any criminal proceedings going on. Police Accountability Board can do that with counsel with the city manager. That doesn't mean that you need police on the board. Am my time up? Yes. It is? Okay. Next one is Abby Brown, and I'm going to read that. She says, I'm writing. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I'll, I'll get used to this sooner. It'll be over by the time I get used to it. Thank you, Lori. Abby says, I'm writing in support of the resolution demanding Councillor Galanese's resignation immediately. A responsible city councilor knows that their words bear weight both inside and outside of city council sessions. Should he be taken seriously in council meetings if his words outside of his meetings are not considered just as serious? While he is free to attend the rallies of his choosing, he should not be free to make hateful and violent comments about the community members he is supposed to represent as a city councilor. Whether or not his hateful comments were meant isn't an issue here. Such comments are harmful either way. What is at issue is the potential for his behavior to be swept under the rug, to masquerade as if nothing was said, and to have community members worried for their safety. As a city councilor, mistakes of this magnitude should carry serious consequences. I disagree with Ms. Peters when she states in her recent letter to the editor that those whom are calling for his resignation is a way to divide the community. 
I think real harm to the community will instead be caused by the knowledge that he remains a man in power whose hurtful words bear no consequences, which in turn causes mistrust towards city council as a whole. Again, I support the resolution demanding his resignation immediately. Thank you. Okay, next is Kellen Stanfield and Lori, you're going to work again. Take your time. He says, um, I reside in Ward 5. My comments concern establishing a use of force policy. The city is using resources to find implicit bias training and the ongoing efforts to establish a police accountability board. I support the full resolution 46 2020 establishing a continuum of force, continual force approach along the lines of the concept provided by the National Institute of Justice is an excellent step. Also at the July 1st city council meeting, the city manager stated that the review of the use of force policy is underway and that further details would be provided later in the month of July. Has city council followed up with the city manager on this progress of the use of force policy yet? The city is facing a difficult budgetary environment that likely will be prolonged. Given that there is limited or no evidence that implicit bias trainings are effective in modifying the behavior of individuals, I urge council not to allocate more than minimal funds to such trainings. If implicit bias training can be executed at minimal financial cost to the city in accordance with evidence-based best practices, then I am in support of resolution 49-2020. I will add that it, it is curious that none of the findings in the resolution motivate the efficacy of implicit bias trainings. The late date of yesterday, the late date of yesterday was the first time the city attorney's specific concerns regarding the disciplinary language of local law 2-2020 were made publicly accessible. These concerns identify specific language in the draft legislation. First, it is imperative that the city council solicit additional legal opinions. Can it is very disappointing it that this has not been done already. Second, if the additional legal opinion occurs with city attorney on these specific concerns, does the council intend to consider the most efficient method to address them. That is the method that will least alter the legislation. Uh, regarding some counselors and the city attorney's concern of uh, concurrent investigations, concurrent investigations are extremely common in the US. Uh, why would investigating complaints of police misconduct cause particular concerns regarding concurrent investigation? Lastly, okay. I urge the city to make police reform a budget priority. I urge the city council to consider how the rewards of economic growth and development Initiatives are distributed among the community's population. I urge the city at all, at this moment in time, to prioritize the, need, prioritize the needs of generally underserved members of our community. Thank you. Next is Michael Pinko. There we go. You guys hear me? Because we can hear you. Yes, yes. and you. Yep. Uh, I'd like to thank the city council and uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak tonight. And uh, Mr. Mayor, it's good to see you again. Twice in one week. Wow. <laughs> so concerning uh, the state of the city, here we are pushing for a PAB. And at the same time, the, the city council is asking for city workers to reduce either their salaries or headcount reduction to equal an amount of about $600,000. Some families here in the city are gonna be severely impacted by this because some of them don't have more than one person uh, working for the city of Geneva. If we're looking at reducing headcount, maybe we should look at the city management position. There's a good six figure position that we could save some money and spread the wealth of, uh, of responsibilities throughout the city council if the uh, city charter has been re rewritten to do such. Uh, we have certain council members who don't even pay taxes saying that they don't care what the PAB may cost or what such training may cost the, uh, the council or the city, such things like the investigative uh, portion of the PAB. These are things, regardless of, of the PAB, whether it's a PAB light, as I heard yesterday, or a PAB defined PAB, all of it depending on how much is detailed in the PAB is gonna cost the city money. How much money depends on how detailed that PAB is gonna be. If it's more detailed, of course, it's more cost. The same councilor member who doesn't care what it costs, doesn't care 
if we get sued by people like the, the unions. Um, how do we think this way when, when we have such a, a, a position that our city council is in with the finances? My take is it's kind of easy to spend other people's money when it's you're not even don't have skin in the game. You're spending other taxpayer dollars and it's easy to do. Back in 2016, we talk about a PAB, but back in 2016, Geneva made the map in national news with Hobart College was known for having a rape issue. That's kind of interesting because I've never heard about anything that their college security has any accountability. Where's the accountability for them? I never heard anything about that or their accountability. So uh, after the, the uh, college has made the national news, as for the PAB, GPD has their processes. They okay. all, sorry? 30, 30 seconds. seconds. They have their processes. State police have their process. The DA office has their process. They all check on each other. How about we put some of the houses or that Hobart owns back on the market, back on the tax rolls. This will allow some deficits to be uh, reduced and also save some of the people money as far as the city's concerned. Now you've taken care of your $600,000 deficit and possibly given a, uh, a uh, tax credit to the people. Can you wrap it up, Mr. Pinko, please? Sure. Um, I just want to say this in closing, I'm going to say I'm, I'm a little disappointed at the city council for not even offering an apology to the people in Geneva or to Council Galanese for the outburst during the government meeting yesterday. This is a government meeting and that should have been secured. The individual should be banned, uh, not to mention he gloated on social media, kind of saying that it was you guys that allowed him to do that. Thank I'm you, disappointed sir. in that. I hope, Mr. Mayor, you can clarify that. And uh, maybe I should take this complaint to a PAB, huh? Thank you very much. Next is Jackie Augustine. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And I can't turn on my video because I have a bad connection. Okay. Um, uh, I, I wanted to just speak on a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is when I, when I heard, um, when I was contacted by the press about what um, had been said about me as one of the participants in that forum on police accountability, I didn't go to social media. I went right to the source and ask that counselor for some explanation and at the minimum to perhaps reassure myself, my kids and my parents that he did not actually intend to shoot me um, and that he would not support anybody else in the community who doesn't like me uh, taking it out in that way. And I still to date have not gotten a response. I've sent follow-up messages. I've sent copies and screenshots of the um, violent threats that have been made by other members of the community saying that taking his language of poking the bear and explaining exactly what that means and what they intend to do and no response. So it's great that he posted a, an apology to the air on Facebook but there hasn't been anything done to those of us or for for those of us um, about what what was actually said and what the harm was caused. Um, but that's not the, the main point of speaking tonight. I'm a little concerned as I watched the discussion about police reform that there is no discussion of why this is needed or not enough discussion. Um, and I know the former city manager had everybody read that book, Start With The Why or something. I don't know if that's exactly the title, but I agree, um, you know, in your personal interactions, I would hope that as you're trying to navigate a difficult situation, an emotionally charged situation, that the first thing you would try to do is think about the experience of the person who feels aggrieved, who is bringing forward a complaint and try to figure out if you can um, affirm the, the reasons for that. So I, I came to council a couple months ago to explain and share some, um, some minutes from 2011 when the community was asking for a police accountability board. Uh, it keeps getting referenced that this idea first got raised in 2017 at Tools for Social Change. That's not accurate. And I'm sad to hear that we haven't been listening to the community prior to that. 
uh, in 2011, uh, over 25 people addressed city council with their uh, personal experiences of unfair treatment, what they felt was, was unfair and unjust treatment that were not being adequately investigated or dealt with. Um, so it would be great to hear council at least affirm at some point that there is a reason to have an independent review board. Um, and I believe that that, is, that reason is to have a professional, accountable and trusted up, agency. Yes. Um, so I would just say again, and Mr. Pinko had an event and he kept asking why the rush. And I would just ask you, why does there continue to be such a delay when it is clear that the community needs this? Thank you. Next is Andrew Spink. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Andrew Spink. I'm a resident of Ward 1 and a licensed attorney in New York State. I apologize for not submitting feedback earlier, but after seeing the city attorney's memorandum, and viewing the meetings earlier this week, week, I felt it necessary to research some of the issues on my own and submit to the city clerk my own memorandum this afternoon. While, while I admit I am not an expert in this area, I decided to speak tonight because I believe my input and written comments uh, that I submitted earlier today would be helpful to your session tomorrow night, especially since uh, some of you expressed frustration due to the lack of other legal opinion. I respectfully disagree with the city attorney's conclusion that the proposed law would be on the whole unlawful. And in general, I am supportive of the proposed law. I want to echo Adam Fryer's point that the main area of disconnect seems to be whether the Geneva Police Accountability Board's disciplinary finding would be binding upon the chief of police. I believe it would not be binding and this makes a very significant difference under state law. The Rochester law states the board's determination of discipline shall be binding on the chief who shall impose discipline determined by the board in accordance with the matrix. No such language is in the Geneva proposal, and it is my understanding that that was intentional by the drafters. It is only a recommendation, and the only thing it requires of the chief of police is to give a written explanation of the exact discipline imposed in accordance with the matrix within 30 days. If I would make one suggestion for changing the proposed la uh, the, the language in the proposed law, I would recommend that it just be made abundantly clear that, Gen that the Geneva Police Accountability Board's finding would only be a recommendation, as I believe the authors intended. I believe the risks of litigation similar to the RPD Locus Club in Rochester are overstated. If the proposed Geneva law is correctly understood to only recommend discipline and not mandate it, the main issues presented in the RPD Locus Club case vanish. Pages 11 and 12 of Judge Ark's decision dated May 7th, 2020, make it clear that the legally problematic feature of the Rochester Police Accountability Board is the fact that the Rochester Police Accountability Board's decision is binding upon the chief of the police and takes away his discretion. He found this feature contrary to civil service law section 75 and unconsolidated law section 891. However, Footnote 68 of Ju Judge Ark's decision distinguished the Syracuse Citizen Review Board from the Rochester Police Accountability Board on the basis that Syracuse only recommends discipline. I believe the Geneva pro proposal is much more similar to the Syracuse law than the Rochester law in the ways that are legally significant. I believe reaching out to the Syracuse board, if not already done, will be very helpful in making sure our law complies uh, with state statutes. To the to the best of my knowledge, though correct me if I'm wrong, this, the Syracuse board has never been found unlawful by a court. My, man, my memorandum also lays out my thoughts regarding uh, the PAB hearings and my thoughts on achieving compliance with state law. I, I hope you will take the time to review my written comments and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Karen Frost Arnold, the city clerk will read. Karen says she lives in Ward 3. She supports the PPP's proposal for a police accountability board, and she is appalled at the stalling and obstruction of progress that has been caused by some on council and the city attorney. At the last city council meeting, I urged that the city was not being well represented by the city attorney, and I urged them to seek other support. Other free legal advice by experts on this issue has been offered, and the city attorney has blocked this, even after council directed for this to occur. 
it is time to go in another legal direction and get new representation. I also want to voice my support of Resolution 46-2020 that establishes an interim use of force policy based on national professional standards and evidence-based recommendations, such as the use of force policy. We need to get some change actually occurring in this process. The movement for racial justice in Geneva is not going away. We cannot continue to delay and avoid doing something. A use of force continuum will help professionalize the police force and prevent harm to civilians. Now is the time for a revision of our outdated policy. Thank you for your time. Next is Ms. Hannah, Hannah Dickinson. Good evening. So many Genevans spent hours writing up their feedback on a proposed PAB law. This is on top of attending teach-ins, writing our city councilors, and researching on our own. The PPP organizers wrote the law, presented it several different ways to council, met with experts, identified potential attorneys on top of building a powerful and loving people's movement. There are now hundreds of pages of comments from community members collected by Lori, who just does such an incredible job and posted on the city's website. Yet in council conversations over the last several months and days, a number of councilors have demonstrated virtually no engagement with any of this feedback. Some counselors continue to insist that we haven't heard from real Geneva, willfully ignoring the pleas made by residents who continue to show up to these meetings, submit comments, send emails. Some counselors have even gone so far as to say if residents work at the colleges or rent their homes or go to protests, our perspectives don't count. So whose voices do count? At the moment, it seems that in addition to a handful of far-right conspiracy theorists, the police union is having enormous influence on council's decisions. This is the same police union that called counselors in favor of police reform Nazis. Yet I've heard the opinion of the police union referenced more often in council meetings than the views, research, and proposals of all the city residents combined. Mm -hmm. People don't pour into the streets. They don't march through every neighborhood in Geneva. They don't make magazines, organize teach-ins, write petitions, or write legislation if they're happy with the status quo. They don't advocate tirelessly, patiently, over and over and over for police accountability if they trust the police to police themselves. This isn't a trick. It's not orchestrated, not by college professors, not by outside agitators. People from all over the city are coming together. People of different races, ages, backgrounds, political views, people who don't know each other, sometimes people who don't like each other. This kind of movement happens when everyday people come together and say, despite our differences, we think there's a problem and we wanna be part of solving that problem. This is a council that again and again insists we must hear from experts. But who counts as an expert? Are they only an expert if you agree with them? Or if they're in law enforcement? What about the expertise of those black and brown Geneva residents who know all too well how GPD operates and are only asking for some accountability? Thank you. Next is Ann Kossoff Jones, will be read by the city clerk. I am a uh, Ward 3 resident. I wanted to comment tonight to express my extreme concern over the city attorney's engagement in the process of drafting a police accountability board law. As I understand it, the city attorney was directed by city council to consult an external law firm about the proposal for the board, but simply refused to do so. I fail to understand how such a refusal could possibly benefit our city. I feel as a citizen, like, I feel as a citizen, he has failed me. And, I, and he failed in his duty to the city. Okay, and last we have Chris Anir. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, thank you so much for this opportunity. I live in Ward 2, and um, I wanna do two things. Um, uh, first, I'd like to offer my full support for an independent police accountability board in Geneva. Look, we have an opportunity to build trust where it's been eroded. Everyone should be behind us. Um, I also wanna comment on um, a pattern of ongoing verbal abuse. Um, I would like to share my ethics complaint um, from the uh, July 1st, 2020 meeting. 
and because um, I haven't heard yet if there's been any uh, any resolution on that. So I am going to modify it though um, to meet with the city rules prohibiting verbalization of individual counselors' names. Quote. I am submitting an ethics complaint against the subject of resolution 47 2020 resolution of censure and request for resignation for counselor at large frank l galanese the third on july 1 um, 2020 i attended the virtual city council meeting and when i attempted to uh, sign up to speak for the first time um, um, my name however was not called um, and i ultimately requested and was granted the opportunity to be the last public commenter of the night. Uh, during my comment at 10.20 p.m., um, said counselor um, audibly remarked, that is BS. In reference to my opinion that, quote, the uh, Geneva uh, Police Department has lost the trust of so many, end quote. Although I was able to continue my, uh, my comment to its prepared conclusion, this outburst made me feel disrespected and intimidated. There were numerous witnesses and a video recording to this indiscretion. This was my first time contributing to public comment. After this experience, I indeed thought twice about doing so again. Um, in addition to the profanity and insult, I worry that allowing intimidating behavior by a public official such as we ha I have described here will have a chilling effect on citizen engagement in city council, end quote. This was the first incident of vulgarity and censorship directed at me by the subject of resolution 47, 2020. Unfortunately, this was not an isolated incident. The next time it happened, I was threatened with murder. There is a pattern of abuse. This is unconscionable behavior by a public official. Resignation is the only honorable action. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next, we, let me turn that timer off. Next, we move on to unfinished business. And our first um, item in unfinished business is a resolution establishing a use of force policy interim provision for Geneva City Police Department presented by Councilor Cameron number 46-2020. Um, Did you see Karen is down there? I, maybe she signed up. She's not Sorry, on my Karen. list. She's not on my list. I thought I had her for the September 23rd meeting. I, yeah. You're not on the list for tonight. You're, you're on September 23rd. Sorry if there's any misconception. I'm, I'm moving on to unfinished business. Okay. Councilor Cameron. I'm working on, on mute new. Okay. I'm, can you hear? Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, the purpose of this resolution is, first of all, not to not to actually pass a use a continuum use of force policy tonight. Um, I am only presenting this um, resolution in order to um, get some momentum for this to become um, in a, to put this in effect. And, and basically, it's what's behind this. There, first of all, a continuum use of force is a different way of looking at how uh, police uh, uh, perform their beat. And it starts with very gradual um, uh, kinds of, uh, of um, uh, influences on situations and it moves up through a succession of, uh, of more, let's say imposing kinds of police work until you eventually at the end of the uh, continuum, you get to something where we, they call it lethal force. But there's really about, you know, there's a number of, of uh, steps you take before that. And what the reason I'd like to get the city, that's the city manager and the police chief to implement a continuum use of force policy is because it's succinct and it's something that an officer can even carry around in their back pocket. Um, the city's use of force policy right now that's on our website is got 16 sections and it's 13 pages long and it's old. And while it covers everything, it's not something that's easy to keep in mind as to 
what are the what goes first, what comes second, and things like that. And as we speak, time marches on. There are situations and events and uh, that happen in our streets, happen in our homes, in our community, all around that are going to keep happening. Um, and I would like to see us have what I call an interim continuum use of force policy. It's get one in place. It's based on research and its application. Many other communities, many other police departments have used this. And so it's well-researched, it's implemented, it's vetted, it works, and other police departments are using it. So that's the purpose for this. Now, um, just a little, one more thing about this. Here's some other notes. Roughly 75% of the largest cities in the United States use a continuum use of force policy. It's basically a one pager. And um, so I would like to see us, I know a lot of things are going on all over the place. There's a lot of, a lot of balls in the air. We have a lot of work to do, but this is, this is structured as, and it's, it's here, I'll just go right, the action required. This is a resolution of encouragement to the city staff leaders to adopt a temporary addition to the city's current use of force policy. And then it just basically describes uh, the continuum use of force, okay? And so I, I'm urging us to pass it. Um, it, it it's uh, encouragement and I'd like our city staff to take it uh, as council's advice. I need a motion to get it on the floor. Councilor Salamandra, second by Councilor Camera. Discussion, please raise your hand so we can work on this on mute then. Councilor Regan, I'm coming to you first. And then I have Councilor Pruitt and Councilor Wheeler. Uh, I just have I just have two quick questions. Um, one is, would this involve training? And I guess that's kind of uh, more complicated. How would that happen? And uh, second, I, I mean, it seems like it's just a recommendation. It's not a, a directive. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the concerns that were raised about the uh, use of force um, last time, which is that we were stating policy for a uh, city department, which would not be allowed, that that really wouldn't kick in because it's, it's a recommendation. But um, yeah, so I guess I'm curious what kind of training would be involved. Are you asking me? I think that's yet to be determined. Uh, city manager, would you like to jump in? I would say that, that we worked through that with Chief Pasolacqua and he would be able to provide that guidance about what it would take if, if for getting his team up to speed. Council Pruitt. Thank you, Mayor. Maybe I missed something, but why would it be temporary? I, I thought it was already agreed that there would be a, a, such a use of force policy review. I thought there'd be a task force that would be assigned to it like there were with the others. And frankly, I've already done a pretty thorough review and have the notes made up. So why is there an interim policy being put in place versus the more involved uh, you know, re, uh, review? That was my question. Yeah, you. It's a well, question, I guess you can, yeah. Okay, my what answer is... Well, no, it's, it's um, I, we don't have to call it an interim one, but I, I want the city manager and the, and the chief to feel that given the fact that they've got busy schedules, this is a safe thing to initiate. And yet they'll like to revisit it because maybe the longer term uh, job is to take the city's current use of force policy, the 13 pager, the 16 sections, and to integrate this in a way, and that might take more work and, and, and everything else. What I'd like this to be is just a temporary one-off that is printed. And if, if training is required, just to make sure that everybody understands it on the force and uh, they can, uh, you can laminate it and put it in their back pocket. And uh, I don't think it'll weigh down their equipment, but it's a way to sensitize them uh, to um, a, a different approach uh, th that some of them may be practicing anyway. 
Um, so uh, that's, I think that's the way, the way we do it. And um, I'd leave it to Sage and to uh, the chief to work out the details. Councillor Peeler, I'm trying to unmute you. There you go. Um, I have two questions, maybe three, depending on how they're answered. I think all of them can be answered by the city manager. One, the first one is, if this recommendation encourages a policy change within the staff hierarchy of which you manage over, what are your, what are your initial thoughts on this recommendation? And, and unless I'm incorrect, I'm wondering if this is a divergence from what we're uh, chartered to do as a council as far as interfering with staff operations directly through recommendations. And secondly, if this is a conversation that you are going to ultimately have with Chief Pazalak, well, why wasn't he instructed to be in this meeting tonight? And those are my questions, thank you. Great, so I might have to have the, the first one repeated, but the, all of this, this, what this recommendation says is that we are gonna be looking at many policies through the whole process of a police reform collaborative, which is the logistics of that are under underway. And um, that what says to me that this is top priority for looking at it fully. And it would be you know, great in that process. Community input is also important, uh, but it says it needs to be accelerated. I think a lot of the continuum is in practice. What I'm hearing from Ken is that the length of how you digest that policy is in such a form that he wants it to be top of mind uh, for an officer of looking at the range. And I don't want to speak, if I'm not understanding that correctly, uh, Councillor Camera, please let me know. Um, but that's one of the things that you seem to be bringing forward of, of really wanting it to be front and center as a uh, common knowledge for an officer, which they um, have, you know, the breadth of the policy as it stands. Um, so this to me is saying, if you all pass it, I think that you can, I mean, this is your policy. So you're, the chief is the ultimate policy decision maker for the police department, but you're saying this is really important to us. We'd like that to be top uh, working on. I think that's in your purview to do. There may be just the details and the logistics of other review items. It is an accredited agency. And so there'll be some outside input as well as we've been wanting this process to be community also um, have the opportunity to get feedback. So what I'm hearing is we want this to be accelerated if you pass it. And this is Ken has brought, brought forward a suggestion on a model that a lot of other police departments use for us to look at. And then uh, we would like to just be able to incorporate other feedback as well. Um, and so the uh, chief is not here. If the direction is made, we'll have it implemented in terms of next steps and give updates to you all. And I apologize, Councilor Peeler, if, I, if there's something that I was remiss in answering, please let me know. Yeah, the, my, my only follow-up is, is I understand how the inferrals are listed under the whereas is but the therefore be it resolved doesn't actually have us request any type of review. It says that we encourage the use of force to be modified. So I'm wondering if we should possibly change the vernacular to focus on the investigation or the, the exploration rather than simply encouraging a modification without knowing what those impacts are techni technically are yet or, or uh, any, any of those things. That's um, because I think inferring the spirit of this is not necessarily uh, the same job as approving what this resolution really is. Because, and I believe that should be in the language of the uh, of the resolution. Thank you, Councillor Pruitt. I'm ready to call. The, oh, I see Councillor Noon. Okay. Well, can I or can I can I back up just a second, Council Report? I'm sorry. Rules of order would have Council Noon go first, and then you get a second shot. Okay, thank you. Ken, did you consult with the police chief 
prior to creating this interim resolution by any chance? Uh, no. Okay. So I guess I mean Emil has spoken early, you know before, and I understand Sage just said it's in our purview to to go ahead and pass this, but it clearly is uh, we are providing some sort of direction uh, to the police chief as to dictating his policies. You know, once again, which obviously is not supposed to be done. Uh, but my issue really is is that this is just an interim too. So we're just again passing something to kick something down the road. Uh, to eventually be addressed later. Uh, I think we should come right out of the gate and, and address the use of force policy right from the get-go. Uh, take a look at it, what needs to be addressed, what needs to be changed, what can be kept, uh, and, and, and have that conversation with all the key stakeholders. Uh, and, and not just, again, do this placeholder nonsense of of you know creating an interim report and, and that why which we keep doing with these placeholders and then trying to modify things as we go. I think we should just do it right right out of the gate and, and this is a great opportunity to address the resolution that the PPP brought forward about looking at the use of force policy. Uh, but let's do a policy that's actually going to carry some weight and not something that is just an, another placeholder. Councilor Salamandra trying to unmute that. And I see Councilor Burrell, I see you. Councilor Pruitt, I got you, but I got to go around the horn. Once again, I'm disappointed to hear um, that people on this council think that the police chief is should be a sole decider about how policing is done. We are a city council. We were elected to guide policy. And so um, it it might be that um, we can't directly, but through a system of city council um, reviewing the city manager who reviews the police chief, I just want to res resist this idea that um, the chief is the boss of, of it all. Um, it's, it's really alarming, actually, when we hear that the city council has no control over the budget or of discipline or of any policy of policing. I mean, I, I find that very scary. Um, and secondly, about this resolution, I think um, I don't find anything objectionable. I think this needs to be done. It's, I think it's insufficient, but it does get us started. And so I support it. Also, Burrow, I'm going to try to unmute you. There you go. So to use Councillor Cameron's words, um, this, this appears to be a resolution light. So it sounds like a, a positive vote um, is actually pushing this across the table to, the, um, to Chief Pasolacqua um, and asking for his feedback to make this part of policy. And I guess I'm just looking for a clarification on, on that the, a yes vote is indeed that as it says in the therefore yes and, and then is that right to the city manager and to the police chief yes right so so then my second comment is i i guess we're fast forwarding and in this in this process we're getting the jump start on the on the governor's orders for i mean this is part of police reform by april of 2021 and and i and i applaud ken for bringing it forward so um, I, I think it's wonderful. Councilor Pruitt. I think actually uh, Councilor Noon just stated most of the stuff that I was going to state. I think I also want to commend Councilor Cameron for bringing it forward, but I think it is insufficient. And it's really one of the major things that the, uh, uh, the movement is wanting to address. So I, I think it's a crucial to, to have these, you know, like a task force meeting like we had, where we can speak openly, have the, I don't see, I don't see how it could possibly hurt to have the chief there and to go through really the entire policy. Now, if there's some way to put this in for a month or two, then have to revise it. It seems like that's a lot of extra work. And uh, as has already been said, we've got till April, you know, really what if it's November that we get this up, you know, solidified. My, my vote would be to really table this until we can get more information and have more discussion, unless they're putting this in for a couple of months is not gonna be disruptive. Yeah, I have Councilor Peeler, and then I've got Councilor Cameron and Councilor Salamander. Rules of order. we got to go around the horn here. Um, you guys want to beat this one to death. So, Councilor Peeler, you're next. I'm not beating it to death. It's, it's well, I'd like to call the vote. If you want, listen, you can make a motion to table. The, the rules of order, 
Counselor, if you would like to make a motion to table, then you make that motion. If it gets seconded, then this, the commentary stops. So I'm perfectly okay with that. Didn't we table this last month though? And did we ever untable it? <laughs> we didn't table this last month? No. No. That was Marina. <laughs> so I have Councilor Peeler. I did offer to table it. Oh, is that a motion? Yes. Is there a second to the table? No. Councilor Peeler. Clerk, please call the roll. No. And let me... Wait, you no, that's the rules. Just I thought the we rules. had a discussion on it. No. Once it's a motion to to table, it, it gets called to vote. But the discussion wasn't finished. The discussion gets killed when you make a motion and second to table. If it passes, it gets tabled. If it doesn't pass, we come back to the discussion. Counselor, please. Okay. I think I've got everybody okay. unmuted. Councilor Pruitt? Oh, yes. Councilor Noon? Aye. Councilor Galanese? Aye. Councilor Burrell? Oh, Councilor Burrell, let me help. I got to unmute you. I'm sorry. There you go. We're, we're voting to table it, right? Yes. yes. Correct. It, nay. Nay. Okay. Councilor Peeler? Aye. Councilor Regan? Nay. Councilor Camera? Nay. Councillor Salamandra. Oh, let me, I'm sorry. I I'm, I'm, did it once, I'm coming around again. There you go. Nay. Mayor Valentino. Uh, nay. Okay, motion defeated. Now we're back in discussion. Okay. Is there anybody else that wants to talk or can we call the vote? No. Councillor Cameron, please continue. The, 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 only, the thing I want to point out is, is the reason I'm arguing for it to for us to pass it now is to turn, to put the ball in is the is because every day is a risk. Every day going forward uh, is a risk to our officers and to our residents and to, uh, and, and the fact that situations happen and we can't predict the future. We don't know what's going to happen. So the thing is, is that the idea is, is that just think of it as, um, you know, it's a precautionary thing to do. And regardless, it, it, there, none of this work will be wasted. If, if, for example, the chief and Sage agree that this particular, uh, this, this continuum use of force policies, by the way, they're gonna find a lot of cities use it. It isn't like there's a thousand different versions of it. It's something that's, that's you know, was actually, I think is, is 10 or 15 years old and has been adopted more and more by cities, which is how we get to the 75% today. So the thing is, is it, it's, it's, it's not a, it, it's a tried and true thing. It's, and so given the fact that we live in a dynamic society and things happen and, um, you, know, and te, you know, and because of some of the things that have been said, there are tensions in this community that we regret um, the, the whole idea is to get this in place and as a temporary thing where, because we might want to revisit it and, and ingrain it more in the policy, but if we right now by itself on a, uh, on a, you know, on a laminated card and distributed to all the police officers based on the, what the, the city manager and the chief decide with a memo and a little bit of training, it, it's not going to go to waste because we know ultimately we want to do this. So that discussion and that information in the headspace of our officers and, the, and, and, our, you know, and our constituents is an investment in the future. It's an investment in what we ultimately are going to do with a continuum use of force policy. And so I, I think that's the reason. That's why I'm arguing for a vote. Council Pruitt. Of approval. It, Ken, is it your impression that this would be agreeable to our constituents? I don't know that they've been involved in, in getting approval on this. Is, is this something that they're going to appreciate? 
Councillor Salamandra, and then Councillor Galanese, and then Councillor Peeler. Well, that was a question to Ken. I'll, I don't know if he wants to answer. Okay. You have to answer. You have to answer that for yourself. Oh, I, I think that I know enough on. people. I know enough people in this town that would appreciate the. Okay. The the precaution, the extra caution, this the the concern. We could have the whole job done in six weeks. What, why would we just do an six, And six I don't know. Six weeks is forty two days, and that's forty two days of question marks about what's going to happen. Okay, Councilor. So you got your answer, Councilor Salamanja. Um, I agree with Ken um, that every, anything could happen and it's important. And I uh, I know I said, did we table this last month, but we did table a, a people's peaceful protest version in July, correct? So we've already been ignoring this. And so um, if the options are to ignore it further or to uh, vote for Ken's, I say now's the time. Councilor Galanese? Yes, well, well, something like this, a policy change uh, affect our um, creditization through the state, Sage or Emma. This resolution is not driving a policy change at this point. It's driving a, a, a look at the current policy with a recommendation back to change it. Councilor Peeler. To stay in the, and, and, and Ken, I'd like your opinion of this too since this is your bill, to stay into the theme and the purpose of this, I'd like to propose an amendment to this that just changes the word encourages because that's really what we're, 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 we're encouraging something that None of us even really have read. We don't know this policy. We don't know this national just. We don't know this justice organization. So we're in, we're endorsing an institution as a blanket, and it just we don't that information isn't here, right? And now we have to go research. We have to go re research that. And uh, I, th I think instead of encourages, we say encourage to explore instead of encour encourage. Or I'm sorry, not encourages to. And the modify is the word. So encourages the city manager to explore the Geneva use of force policy compared against this other national policy guideline. And as ra rather than modify, because we're not, we're not even asking her to, to explore it or consider it. We're asking her to modify it. And I think that's really the point of the, and this is why I believe Sage spoke to the intent and the heart of all this this legislation because that's what re re really what we're doing but when we ask her to modify it or encourage her to modify it we're not really asking her to consider it so i i that's that's and i also think we should scrap the entire last paragraph it's not it's not um doesn't speak to the it's actually apologetic to the previous paragraph it says we know this might cause problems but we're going to ask you to do it anyways if we're endorsing this, who cares if it causes problems, right? So I, I think we should kind of stand behind this and change modify to explore. And if, and if you think that's great, Ken, I think that's great. And I also think it speaks to the theme of what this is. And it gives our staff direction is, and that's what we're doing. It gives them direction without giving them demands. Procedurally for clarity. So council, you have a motion on the floor to make an amendment to change the word modify in the second last paragraph to explore and to eliminate the last paragraph. Do I have a second on that? No, wait. no. I don't There's a motion on the floor, say, counselor. There's a motion, counselor, order. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second for that motion? Motion dies. Now, counselor, do you have an? Wait, you want me? Oh, if you, no, you were barking, you want do you want to keep talking? No, well, where's the pro, where's the thing where it says that, that this we know this will cause problems? The the motion that was just made was for an amendment in the second last paragraph where it says, therefore, now more now be it resolved that the city of Geneva City Council, the word modify, change to explore, and the last paragraph to be removed. That was the motion. The motion was not seconded, so procedurally, the motion dies. Okay, that's fine. I'm good with that. Vote your conscience. Deep now. Okay, Salamandra. Councilor Salamandra, please. 
Oh, let me let me let me hit that button, or somebody else hit that button, or um, there you go. Hey, so I, I was interested in what Councillor Pruitt said. Um, I understand he's done a lot of work on uh, this, and I'm I'm interested in what the answer is if a task force could be created, including Councillor Pruitt um, and other councillors who want to work with the uh, city manager on this. So, if it seems like Councilors are agreeable to that. I would add that as an amendment to this that a task force of counselors be created to work with um, Sage. So there's a amendment on the table to add language that a task force be created to address the use of force policy. Is there a second? Second that. Second by Council Pruitt. Discussion. Councilor Cameron. The, the whole idea is that who, everybody's on a task force right now. Everybody's on a different task force. They're doing all kinds of things. This is going to delay it. That defeats the purpose of it to get this thing into, into play. So um, I, I say, I say, let's not do that. Let's, let's, I expect the chief and Sage working together can, can pull this off. And if they adjust a couple of words in that use of force continuum, I am, I am not, I have no issues with that. Okay. Um, this use of force thing is based on a, a very well researched documentation. Okay. Uh, I have the city manager who'd like to say something. And then I have Councilor Peeler and Councilor Reagan, then I want to call the question. My approach is not to work in a bubble just with the chief. The chief doesn't work in a bubble by himself to direct, to create oh, policy. And so, I, 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 the intent of this, I think, is the urgency of this being up on deck ASA right now, correct, Ken? And so that is well heard, but I, I am not comfortable myself who, you know, being two of us, the chief does, um, you know, reviewing policy gets feedback from many folks, including the folks that do the accreditation. And you're, wel you're welcome to talk to anybody you want. I, I know, but well, I, I would... I'm just saying that I'm just wanting to say that the process is, is not going to be just uh, the, the two of us and that the current, you know, you support, there is a continuum. And I think what Ken is saying is that it's not clear in the policy and really wanting to spell that out. And so um, that is so very duly uh, noted. And so I, I think the, I should say on the modify, it is encouraged. And so I do see that the, that you'll be getting back from us a response of, of where we landed and, and why on this, that's all. Councilor Peeler. Um, I wanna agree with Ken. I, th I think a task force takes away from the efficacy of the, of the, uh, of the bill and it should be kicked over to the manager and the chief because it's their jobs and we should trust them to do it until they've proven they can't. And, um, and that's why I suggested that amendment because you can see where there's cause for concern because the task force also, and the proposition of the task force also implies that some, that the exploration, the job of the exploration will not be theirs first or, and, and, and say it's just said, it's not gonna be theirs only anyways. So I think that's really important. So. Thank you. Hey, Council Regan, and then we're gonna- Yeah, I, I, just, I just want to question why we need to have it in the menu, I, I, in the amendment, as an amendment. I'm certainly in favor of a task force, but I don't know why we have to have it in the amendment. I, I think um, we could ask uh, our city manager to, to uh, see that that happens, and I don't have any doubt she would do it. So, I mean, I hope that does happen, uh, but I don't think it needed to be an amendment. And I just encourage that to happen, and, you know, I, have a passport put together. I can agree, but we're following procedure. Council Burrell, and then I'm going to call the vote. So, so the city manager and the chief of police want to have a meeting, and we don't have to call it a task force. And I really would like to get some things done. And Ken has done a lot of research on this. And Councilor Pruitt has also done a lot of research on this. So what would be the drawback? of having Councilor Camera, Councilor Pruitt sit in in the roundtable meeting 
with the chief of police and the city manager. So you can put any label on it that you want, but, but why can't four people get together? Two counselors that have actually researched this and the people that are making the decision. And then we can get something done and, and move on to um, what the goal is of this, which is, which is revising our, our policy. Sounds great. Okay, clerk, I'd like to call the vote on the amendment to add a task force, please. And we're going to start. Council Regan, I see you shaking your head. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to unmute you. There was a motion to make well, an amendment. I thought that was actually, I uh, didn't get a second, but it, maybe it, did get, it did get a second. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm ready to vote. Okay. Is that me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Pruitt? I vote yes. Okay. Councillor Noon? No. Councillor Galanese? No. Councillor Burrell? Aye. Councillor Peeler? No. Councillor Regan? Aye. Councillor Camera? No. Mayor Valentino? Nay. Now let's call the vote on the original resolution that Councilor Camera presented. I think everybody's still, let's unmute everybody. Councilor Salamandra? I'd like to sign up for that committee also, and I. It was not approved. Yeah. Oh, she's, you're muted. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on unmuting as fast as I can. The informal one. I know it wasn't in pr approved, okay. but how Jan okay. said. Okay. So, so voting to approve, you said yes. Councillor Pruitt. I'm voting no because I don't think we'll hear about this again if we just go for the light program. So I have to vote no. Councillor Noon. I, I echo John, not for an interim. And, and Ken, stop watching the cop shows. Um, and I vote no. Councillor Galanese. No. Councillor Burrell. Aye. Councillor Peeler? No. Councillor Regan? Aye. Councillor Camera? Aye. Mayor Valentino? Aye. Motion approved. Okay, moving on to new business. This is a reading from our ethics committee. We have a few of these tonight. So the first one is. This is from our Geneva Ethics Committee. We are contacting you as a result of the 40 plus complaints filed against uh, you, followed against um, Councilor Galanese in the last 48 hours regarding the public comments you made at a rally on July 19th. You are quoted in saying in reference in the Zoom, to a Zoom call in honor hosted by various Hobart and William Smith community individuals as follows. The college did their whole thing. Police accountability, if I could Got a gun, I would have shot squares on my computer screen, disgusting. In addition, you are being cited for publicly stated decision to vote no on policy regarding public input evidence arguments. You are quoted as saying the police accountability board, I don't need to hear anything. My vote is no. Little squawkers who think their voice is being heard, it's not. After reviewing the documents and evidence, the Board of Ethics has found you guilty of violating tenants 1, 3, 4, 6, 12, 13, and 16. We have therefore Recommended Mayor Valentino and City Attorney Bove that you have a central place in your personnel file and the City Council evaluate your recent behavior and discusses if you are fit to consider continue as a City Councilor. And I'm passing this over for the resolution presentation to Council Regan. I'm sorry, Council. Uh, we're, we're clicking on each other, I think. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> This difficult resolution is presented to express our reaction as city council and as individual counselors to the hateful words spoken by counselor at large, Frank Galanese, in reaction to an educational forum on police accountability boards held July 18th. His words are included in this resolution, but they are now familiar to us all. We have heard them on recorded video and heard his acknowledgement of them on a Facebook page statement but we've heard nothing further from the counselor to explain these statements. And now it appears that he has moved on behaving as if it's all business as usual. 
Well, many of us feel it's hard to be over statements as unnerving as these. There are many things concerning about Councillor Galanese's speech that day, including his outright expression of unwillingness to listen to views that differ from his opinion and the belittling of those committed to ideas he does not share. But what cut right to my heart was his expressed desire to get a gun, shoot, and kill all of those on his screen. Among those 80 or so individuals he was referencing were many of his constituents and many of his colleagues here on council and in city management appearing right now again in those little Zoom boxes on his screen. Do we believe that he would take action on those toxic words? Do we fear someone else might take them as a call to violence? Individuals will answer these questions differently, but leaving these concerns alone or aside, his violent words cannot be ignored. Ethic boards, legal action, organizations, and citizens individually have and will continue to weigh in on how Councillor Galanese's words affected them and what appropriate response should be. We as council are not a part of those groups and not a part of those boards, but we have a right to speak as well. And our constituents and, and Councillor Galanese should know where we all stand. We cannot make a councillor resign, but we can and we should express our abhorrence to behavior such as that displayed by Councillor Galanese. And we can censure and we can request his resignation. With this resolution, I will move for just that but first, I'm asking uh, the resolution's co-sponsor, Councillor Cameron, to add his comments. Um, uh, thank you, Jan. Um, I, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about this and um, wrote up a few things. And, you know, it just goes back to the beginning of this. We, we, we are not, I guess we kind of think we're in a little microcosm here and um, we can all get technical about the resolutions and everything else and blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, is that we live in a, the country and we're, we're part of that bigger story. And that, that big story that's going on in this country is people are asking for social justice. They're asking to be part of the American experience and not be treated differently. And that story is going on here. Um, one of the things that I, I'll just read a couple of things here. You know, I, I kind of feel like Geneva has to write its own story regarding the major upheavals that are going on all around the country. I think that many in this country, <clears throat> um, I, I think many in this community kind of uh, don't, you know, who, who, who are upset with the whole idea of this police accountability and everything are claiming something that I think is kind of sad. And that is, as they, if they oppose those things, one of the phrases I've heard a lot is um, in, in this debate is, I'm a lifelong Geneva, uh, or I've lived here 30 years. A number of callers and others who I've spoken to publicly, or, or, I've, or I've heard speak publicly have, have prefaced their remarks by asserting this uh, fact. And the fact is, is that the, the real fact is, is that this has origins in the whole idea of blood and soil, or I was here first. And I think that that's, that's very, very sad. It's very sad because um, I thought that anybody that has, you know, um, uh, a citizen a citizenship, has a right to speak, and has a right to have their opinions, and they have a right to do it without being threatened. And so, you know, there's this whole thing about the social contract. The, the reason, the reason that, that we exist as a country is because a bunch of people left tyranny, came over here, and started something and agreed to govern themselves in a way that would be good for everyone, and they created the Constitution. So there's no, there's no, you know, the United States is not a, is not a thing. It's an idea. And the idea is that um, we're, we have a social compact. We have a constitution to regulate ourselves. 
And we've all given up a little bit of our freedom in order to create this. And that's the thing that people, some people refer to as the American, American exceptionalism. So we're part of this story and that's what's underneath our work on the police accountability board and creating more justice for all our residents. But it's, these words are so hateful um, they have a tangible impact on people today in, in this community. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. I, don't, I didn't used to lock my car. I lock my car now all the time. Okay. I have my little sign on the back of it. It says, uh, elect a clown, expect a circus. It's a target. It's a piece of crap car. Everybody knows it in town. But I lock it now because I'm afraid. Okay, so it has an impact and I don't think I'm alone. Um, you know, let me just read. A social, con social contract theory says that people live together in a society in accordance with an agreement that establishes moral and political rules of behavior. The US constitution is often cited as an explicit example of part of America's social contract. It sets out what the government can, can and cannot do. That's a citation from Stanford University, another radical institution, right? You know, so, but here's the thing is, is that um, one of the, this fellow, Edward Morrissey wrote something about nothing, uh, an article in, the, in, the ma in a magazine called The Week or This Week. The title of the article is nothing about quote, blood and soil is American. Okay, and he talks about the fact that it goes back to German peasantry and everything else and how that morphed into Nazism. But there's some there's a couple of passages here which are really good. What then makes us Americans? Legally, we can point to birth in this country or naturalization after Im immigration, but that reflects a status of citizen citizenship for an individual. What makes us American as a whole is true American exceptionalism. exceptionalism. Our identity as a nation based on the rule of law rather than blood, soil, language, or any physical or external factor. Perhaps after 240 years, the staggering experiment of American independence is difficult to grasp. We were not the first democracy, nor were we the first republic or even the first colony to rebel against its mother country. What set us apart was the complete break with a political model of our mother country and the adoption of voluntary compacts as the basis for our governance. America did not break with a constitutional monarchy to simply establish another one. Instead, we entered into a social compact, a social compact in which we created laws by which they were, we would be governed and that law would apply equally to all. So I'm, I'm gonna make a little segue here to the to pro sports. Um, Counselor, please. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be finished in a few minutes. Well, even the, the, the point things, is, is this wait, wait, counselor, what we're counselor, all doing here. Counselor, order, please. Because you're giving a narrative. When we presented a resolution, the resolution is presented and then it's, there's a motion to put it on the floor in a second. And then discussion takes place. This is a very long narrative, bringing a resolution okay. to the floor. Please. I apologize. I, if you'll let me come back afterwards, I, I second this. I was, well, I there isn't even a motion. I, was, I, I thought I was supposed to, to comment on it, and the, the, the <laughs> microphone had been passed. It was passed to present the resolution, not to give a, a school lesson narrative here. Okay, okay. So, so then I'm, so I'm I, saying it's I need a motion. I move. Thank you, and I need a second. Thank you, and then I need discussion. I can't wait. Well, also, would you like to continue? Thank you, Mayor. You know, there, you might all know that recently the Washington football team is no longer called the Washington Redskins because Redskins is an unacceptable word to use today. Now, there's a bunch of people that resent this political correctness, but the owner of the Washington Redskins now refers to the Washington football team and he there's been a lot of sexual harassment in the front office going back years. They have a history of it. 
But he went on record to say, we are taking all steps necessary to create an organization that is diverse, inclusive, and respectful of all, okay? There's, there's Roger Goodell, National Football Council, League. Counselor, is this relative to the resolution? Yes, it is. It is relevant because can, it's can about me why these how? words, why these words, it's, I'm asking everybody to vote for this resolution. It's not, a, a, it's not at this point anymore necessarily only about the counselor's behavior. It's also about these words. And that's, the fact is, is well, that- That's not what the resolution says. The, the resolution starts out with those words. They're right there for everybody to read and they will be there, I hope, for the historical record. Um, but basically, Roger Goodell said, I wished four years ago, we had listened and created a dialogue with Colin Kaepernick, who took a knee and was basically, and he said, he said this about pro football players. These, these people are not unpatriotic. They're not, not disloyal. They're not against our military. In fact, many of those guys were in the military and their military family. And what they were trying to do is exercise their right to bring attention to something that needs to get fixed. And that misrepresentation of who they were and what they were doing was the thing that really gnawed at me. And then I just one, I'll, I'll finish. I have one, one more. I hope so. Okay. You, you've got... Um, um, because we lost, we lost sight of what this resolution was about. By no, it's going, about the words. It's about but the fact. Nothing in this resolution reflects what you're saying. Okay. That's my point. Also, Pruitt, I have you. Okay, I'm off mute. Uh, I'm curious, uh, really, uh, about a couple of things. I'm not sure that the resolution it, it should shouldn't be split. There's both a censure and also a requirement or a request for uh, for resignation. And I see nothing in the city charter that allows for a request for resignation. Also in tenant three, part of that very tenant that, that uh, is being applied toward Councillor Galanese is the very thing we're doing is charges of verbal attack upon the character and the, et cetera, et cetera, as it goes on. So I, I think it sort of seems like referendum if you will to begin with, but I think there's a couple of other things I have to state because a personal message that I sent to Frank uh, right after uh, this happened, and I saw, uh, heard about something on Facebook where he was apologizing, uh, I, I sent him a personal message and said, you know, things will get better, things will move on. I realized that what you mentioned when you said kill wasn't really uh, true, and that it's a euphemism. And I understand what people are saying out there that that doesn't necessarily apply to Frank. He's not a murderer. I've known three generations of his family. I know it's not in his heart to be that way but it can, it can influence other people. And so therefore I agree, it's abhorrent behavior. The choice of terms was catastrophic. I thought it was, it's unbelievable really, but I also believe in the American way that Ken's espousing, and that is there should be a trial before execution. I heard uh, uh, Jessica Farrell mention a couple of things, which is true. I think we ought to give him a chance to, to speak up. I think the resolution should have been, Frank, we want you to address this and really explain what happened to tell us what you believe. And the reason why that could be important because that can influence these nitwits that are out there saying things like extreme sanctioning and everything, which I think is a criminal act. If we had a PAB in place, this is the sort of thing that could be brought forward. Now, um, I'm worried where this would stop also. Um, if in fact, you know, you look at one side of the fence, uh, there's somebody on the conservative side, there's also somebody on the liberal side. And I've heard from people almost equal amounts that, that, they, that they should be terminated. I think of the rest of us, almost everybody on here, uh, I think uh, Councillor Burrow one time for the use of her term Rosie, I think uh, Councillor Peeler for having a sign at one time, I think, uh, you know, Ken has been censured also, I've been called a dirty politician, uh, I mean, it goes on and on and on, I know the mayor, and so geez, we're, we're like, a, it's like a bunch of pack of wolves here on each other, we, we can't operate like this, we got to get back to not using, you know, personal issues, in any of our discussions here. It can't be personally related. So I looked at this as being twofold, two areas of issue, personal and also political. Uh, on the political side, um, the, the issue should be focused on, not again, the, the individuals. And I, I look back at what uh, the President Lincoln had said. He liked having a team of rivals because you wanted to have balanced decision-making and whatever you're doing for a broad audience of people like we have in Geneva, or in that case in the country. 
So I like to have the far left and the far right now, and all of us that are in the middle to be able to come up with the most balanced decision making that you possibly can uh, in this in this PAB. Now I know Frank was saying absolutely no PAB forever, you know, but what he was meaning not while it's illegal, as we were being uh, advised by our council, I think he should be called up to explain himself and maybe soften things up and at least influence those other people over there that are, are taking some of his words and carrying them to extremes. Uh, we need balanced decision making out of this group, not political decision making. And think about this. I, I look back at a little over a year ago when uh, Councilor Grieco's position was getting, uh, you know, open. And uh, I didn't know anybody that was interested in it. So I threw my hat in the ring. And boy, what a furor that started after a while. I mean, it, I, I agree. It took months of occupying the council for uh, as a major issue for months and people picketing and signs and petitions. It took all of the air out of the room. You think that wouldn't happen again, right in the middle of a pandemic and in a social movement? It's gonna take a lot of our effort away from what we're doing. He's gonna to have to be replaced. The devil you know, if that's the way you look at him is better than the devil you don't know. He's already been involved in a lot of initiatives ongoing that I think would really be vacated and have to be started all over again. So if you care about the movement and getting things done, don't replace Frank or, or Laura or me or Jan or Ken or anybody else. Don't get involved with the personnel. If you don't like what they're saying or what I'm saying, focus on what the issue is and try to change that and, and make some positive change with the issues. Uh, remember that we're all duly elected and it's service that we're providing to the community. And really you gotta lighten up on us. We've been, everyone up here has been derided, city management, the city attorney. Uh, I get literally hundreds of messages and I, I get them all day, all the time, people talking about this stuff rather than the issues that we're facing. People are in broad, red lines around here. People are, can't pay their rent. The, the, most of the businesses in town are suffering. The whole economy, I mean, really, we have bigger issues than Frank Gallinese to consider ourselves with. And so I'm, I'm really thinking that, uh, that, that, that uh, I'm going to ask you to really re relax on this issue, recognize that we've got a panel, we've got a council, we need to work together, and we have to focus on the work and not each other. And I hope that's, that's the way we'll vote tonight. Thank you, folks. I have Councilor Regan and then Councilor Noon. Um, I, uh, I have many comments um, about Councilor Poor's remarks, but um, I, I have, I mean, I think I've said, you know, really what I want to say. I, I do feel there were lines crossed here that are different than, than other people who are, have been called upon to resign in different ways or, or been cited with um, ethics reviews or whatever. Um, uh, I agree on the multiple perspectives, but I, I just feel like that was his statements were just a little bit too far. Uh, I think he crossed a line. Um, I had other thoughts, but I, I'd rather let other people express it because I think I've said really what I need to. Okay, I have Councilor Noon and Councilor Galanese. Councilor Noon, I'm asking you to unmute, but I'm not sure if we're clicking at the same time. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna quit clicking. There you go. Thank you. So there's obviously no question what Frank said is absolutely deplorable and his words are beyond ill repair. Hatred, racism, big, and bigotry obviously have no place in our society. And those who express themselves in that way really should be having some sort of self-reflection and asking themselves who they really are. Words matter and perception is reality regardless of if we mean what we say or if we don't. Our city is deeply divided and this type of language clearly only leads to further division amongst one another, which is obviously present here on council. City council should have held an emergency meeting right away to address the situation, but we failed to do so. When leaders act swiftly to address a hate incident, it can make community members feel validated and comfortable. Council needs to take this incident provide action to truly address the root of the issue. This resolution fails to do that and obviously doesn't provide any roadmap whatsoever of how we can heal and grow as a city versus all it does is cast more division. We should dig deeper and work to kill the root of the problem here, which is obviously systemic racism, uh, which we all know exists, uh, racial bias in our community, as well as bigotry, xenophobia, et cetera. And with that said, I am going to encourage that we develop a code, and I mean soon, listing enforceable consequences for this behavior recently demonstrated and a process for impeachment so that voters can have a mean, means to remove elected officials. 
Without literal and not figurative consequences, people will obviously continue to feel emboldened to conduct themselves loosely in any way that they see fit and in an unprofessional way, which is just some, simply unacceptable, which obviously has been dem demonstrated by more than one counselor. If this resolution passes tonight, don't be fooled. It obviously is not gonna provide any sort of concrete solutions. It's not supported by our city charter or any sort of state law and removal for an elected official and does not bring about Mr. Galanese's resignation. Frustration and anger and division are rampant. So let's develop a process for a resolution of this and future violations by elected officials. At our next meeting, hopefully, or at some time in the relatively near future, I intend to offer a motion as such to bring such changes. Right now, the decision to resign is obviously up to Mr. Galanese's alone, despite the wishes of all those who spoke tonight and all those who continue to spe speak, sorry, on social media, as well as sending us emails and further phone calls. A referendum as impeachment processes would allow would bring this question to conclusion. So I think tonight we clearly need to be looking for actual solutions and not just proposing a, a resolution with no further action. Thank you. Councilor, Councilor Gallinini. I just want to say that uh, when this all first started and, and unfolded, people had called me up as yourself, Mr. Mayor. And it was a quick conversation as it unfolded so fastly when we had a person, uh, the Geneva Believer, who completely smeared me without anyone getting my side of the story. And my side of the story was never told because it was at a rally, a lot of things happened. And I felt after all the vicious attacks by all the people that it affected, that why should I answer to these people who have dehumanized me one after another after another? Why do I owe them an explanation when it seems like the norm for some people are to interpret individuals' words to fit, to fit a political agenda or a narrative? So that made me, I'm not gonna say angry, but it frustrated me, it scared me because I've been a lifelong resident of Geneva for 47 years and I've been in good standings. And for people to say that I'm not open-minded, I met with the NAACP two times prior to anyone else being there. So I was very open-minded. And second of all, the words that I spoke that everyone's taken offense to of shooting the computer screen, I was repeating what somebody in Canada had told me telling somebody else that. And when the, and it said disgusting at the end, disgusting means that I was disgusted that I had to be defending our council and the, what do I wanna say, our uh, inability to function as a unit. But no one wants to know those things or go into detail. And I feel like it was a private conversation that was hijacked and then created by the Geneva Believer to take those words and enhance them to, to, to totally ca character assassinate me is not right. No one should have it done to him. And Jan, you can laugh all you want because you, you're a hypocrite. Counselor, counselor, just as counselor, much wrong as me. Counselor, and I will no not personal attacks. No over personal. and over again. Because no one knows the real truth. I don't have to tell the real truth. And I'm sitting up here before you all right now trying to give something. You can keep laughing, Jan, because you, you consider counselor. yourself a good person. I'm gonna to have to mute you if you keep going. Okay, then you guys don't wanna know. But if you think that this is easy for me, not one person on this council would have sat for two and a half hours the last council meeting, an hour and a half this council meeting be dehumiliated, be dehumiliated. I wouldn't let that to happen to anybody on this council from this day forward because no one should have to go through that, no matter what they did. I apologize and it was sincere. I had surgery. 18 hours before that, it took 25 takes to even get something out. So don't tell me I wasn't in, that I was not sincere because there's a lot of this whole conversation you don't know and I don't need to provide you with it because you wanna know what? I'm not resigning, I'm not going anywhere. And if you wanna keep on acting like this towards me, then so be it. But I am so sick and tired of people attacking me in some indirect way and I'm just supposed to put up with it. I represent people in Geneva and I'm sorry that some of the people that say, that I'm so hurtful and I'm the boogeyman of Geneva now, I'm sorry, but I'm not. And even if those were my words, shooting your computer screen is not a threat. If it was a threat, I would be arrested. There'd be, there would be uh, restraining orders against me. This is all a ploy 
And it's a political attack, a character attack. And I am very upset because I've had great relationships with the black community my whole entire life. I grew up with them. I've gone through the Geneva City School District with them. I, I coach these, some of these people's kids. It, it, it's, it's just mind boggling to me. It's upsetting to me. You don't know what the soul searching I have done. I got to live with this every single day. I would never bring up a resolution to hurt any one of you, but it seems like it's fitful for a lot of you on this, on this board. I could have did the same thing to Laura or other people on this council and no one did. You want to know why? Because that's not what it's about. It's about building a team that functions properly to move the city forward. And that's what I've intended to do on the days that I campaigned. Those are the things that I will continue to do. And I am very, very disappointed that no one came to me. Even the mayor called me up and in two minute conversation said he'd get back to me, never did, puts out in, in split seconds because this is 2020. Things happen so fast, but no one wants to hear the real version. Not the made up version. Yeah, you heard a, Yeah, you heard me talking to somebody, but what was the conversation I was talking? Did you ever ask that question? Who, what was the conversation? In, in, a, in a spur of the moment, the mayor did ask me that, but geez, I was at a rally, people yipping and yelling and yelling and screaming. Okay, days later and stuff, you think about things, you know what you said and you know what the conversations were. Do I know the people? Absolutely not, because I was one of very few Geneva people that were there. But I started in Canandaigua and came back to Geneva and I defended people on this council through and through because I wouldn't badmouth them to outside cities because you are part of my team. Regardless if I agree with you, don't agree with you, if your policies are different than, than mine, or if you're anti-police and I'm pro-police, I shouldn't be ridiculed for that. I shouldn't be ridiculed because I had surgery and I have a cast on and I have a bracelet on that backs the blue. I do back the blue. I will continue to back the blue. I don't, I do, will not back bad officers. I am all about police reform. I am about BLM movement, the sediment of the whole thing. No one wants to ask those questions of me. All they want to do is smear me and come up with this version of me that is not me. I know it's not me. I know I would never hurt anybody. And I'm going to leave it at that. You can come up with any conclusions you want if you've already done that without asking me. And if that's how we're gonna continue as a council, it already is so dysfunctional. I scratch my head after every single meeting and I'm sure every one of you do too, as, as well as the general public. We just keep going in a circle and in a circle and in a circle because we're not working with each other, we're working against each other. And it needs to stop. And I'm asking for unity in the city too. Yes, the things that the Geneva Believer puts out there and then why he has the audacity to say that I'm instilling violence? No, people like him instill violence because they put stuff up on social media that just goes around and around and around. Because if he cared about Geneva, he would take a step back and, and really look at what he's doing. I'm tired of this. I grew up here, six generations. I love Geneva and everyone in it. And I would give the shirt off my back to anybody. And I'm over this. I'm not going to resign, so you can take this resolution, do whatever you want with it. I'm here, and I'm here to work hard. I'm here to do what I intended to do. I didn't work for months going door to door, lying to people, as some of you think. I went door to door. I'm a construction guy that works 50 to 60 hours a week, breaking my back, but so much so that I care about Geneva to work another 50 to 60 hours a week because I want to move this this, this city and all of our counselors in a positive direction and make Geneva proud of us. Yes, there are people upset with me. Yes, there are people who, you know, have different views towards me now. But you want to know what? I'll take that. But it's not going to stop me from doing what I intended to do from the get-go. And that is to move Geneva forward in a positive position. You ask why I haven't said anything or haven't been on social media? The atmosphere is at top peak right now. Anything that I would say would just fuel the fire. So I said nothing because I want to be no part of that because of what happened from right from the get-go. Why would I want to move a, have a city that I love so much at each other's throats when it was already being said that I was the cause of it? I backed off because I didn't have any intentions from the beginning to do that. And so here we are tonight, a resolution to remove me from city council but is not binding whatsoever. It's a virtue signal to you your political party into the people that 
We're sitting on that Zoom meeting to all come against me to create this narrative. Well, I got news for you. If, if that's the way you want it, then that's the way you have it, but I'm not going anywhere. I apologized and it's upsetting to me that this has taken place like this. It really, really is. And that's all I have to say. Now, if you want to call me individually and you want to hear the, the, the whole entire story as a council, one-on-one, -on -one, I'll be happy to tell you. But not one of you has taken the time out to really ask me what's going on. You, there's been a few of you that have called to see how I was doing, and they wouldn't want to be in my shoes. And I respect some for that. But the rest of you, call me. I mean, I met with Ken, John, for lunch several times. Had a great conversation. And this person that I'm being put out to be is not me. And I thank you for my. Okay. Okay. So we have a resolution on the floor. And um, I have a comment. So the resolution on the floor asked for censorship, is which the ethics board asked us to do. And I agree with the censorship. I think that's the censor. I think that's uh, important based on the, the facts in front of us. Um, everybody knows where I stood as far as Councilor Galanese goes. I did make a phone call to Councilor Galanese. Um, I didn't time it, so I'm not sure exactly what the time frame was. And I spoke from my heart. Um, I was shocked at the, the events that took place. But I also did let him know that I was going to ask for his recognition. And I did that publicly. There's an investigation going on, so you, you will not, I'll, I'll give you a chance to talk. So there's an investigation going on that I do not want to interfere with. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, I think the community knows, as council knows, where I stand with Councilor Galanese and his position. I also did go back and listen to the raw footage. So I'm, I'm not just taking what was posted on social media as my information for making my decision. I had to make that, that well-rounded fact-finding discussion where I went in and actually looked at the raw footage in order to make my decision. So that's, that's where my tech came from. Is there anybody else that would like to talk besides Councilor Galanese, Councilor Regan, and then Councilor Peeler, and then Councilor Burrow, and I'll come back to you, Councilor Galanese. Was I next? <laughs> yep, you, you were next, then Council Peeler, then Council Burrow. I, I just said, yeah, just a couple of comments. First of all, what I what I neglected to say to Councilor Noon's comments too is, is um, uh, and I'd like to address Councilor Galanese as well. I, you know, the, part of my problem was we didn't hear any of this. It, I, I don't think it was up to say, I mean, that would have been a good move probably to call us together with an emergency meeting. You know, I, I maybe that should have happened. Um, but that didn't stop Councilor Galanese from speaking up. And I know several people who have asked, including people who made public comment tonight, to ask him these questions and he has not answered. He sat quietly without, without comment. Instead, what we got was a Facebook apology, which was an admission, you know, really of, of what he had said without without anything to counter it. And and that's really, uh, you know, I don't know what he, he could have said that would have made me feel a lot better. I don't know if I would have put this forward, though, if I had heard something that that would have softened it. But I, we didn't hear anything. And the words were caustic enough for me with, without, you know, without hearing something to to move forward with this. Um, also, I'd just like to say one, one little comment. The whole idea of this resolution, in addition to, um, well, the biggest thing is to be able to voice our, our concerns. We have been told not to speak. And I was, I was talked to, uh, the attorney did talk to me about making sure my language, the language in this resolution would not interfere with the investigations, et cetera. But I feel we have a right to speak too. And, and um, that's really why I put it forward. So uh, the mayor has already said what he thinks and this is our opportunity to, to do the same. Councilor Peeler and then Councilor Burrell and then Councilor Galanese. Oh, Councilor Salamandra, I'm sorry. So I have Councilor Peeler, Councilor Burrell, Councilor Salamandra, Councilor Galanese. Okay, Councilor Peeler. Yeah, there's a couple of key points that I wanted to bring up that echo John's sentiments. And it really has less to do with the current situation and more to do with the current climate. And I fear 
that this is going to serve as precedent or to create a rut of constant censure, of calls for resignations, of cyclical attacks that was is going to throw us into perpetual chaos. And th the next resolution that we're dealing with is a censure request for Ken Camera for a similar reason. The people didn't accept his apology. And I've reviewed the, and, and this is a, in reference to the ethics board's d decision for to censure Frank, I've reviewed the ethics board policy. I, I don't see where they can recommend, I don't see where they can recommend censure. And along with the report, I didn't see any analysis of how Frank's words, though bizarre and violent in nature and definitely regrettable, uh, are in violation. It would have been nice to see that technical breakdown of how those words were in violation. Now, to get on to the to the actual statements, a lot of the information people just heard from Frank, we're hearing it too. We didn't know this. And but unlike some people on this council, if Frank was referring to the Hobart William Smith session where everyone was in those squares, I was in one of those squares too. So I had to review the source footage because I refused to I refused to take the information from the doctored video, from the augmented edited video. And I had to, I watched it three times. I couldn't hear anything. I heard Frank's voice, I couldn't hear anything. I had to put earbuds in, I had to turn the volume all the way up, you know, and I have a thousand dollar laptop. And then I heard it, then I heard it. And I had to figure out what he was talking about because he wasn't telling us. Since I was one of the squares, I had to say, well, did he want to kill me or did he want to shoot his laptop? And I assessed that he wanted to shoot his laptop. And because I didn't hear, I didn't hear anything else that he, that he just referred to. I was under the impression that he was so angry about the current situation that he just wanted to destroy his laptop and end everything. He wanted to kill it all and just kill his laptop and kill the feed. And that's how I interpreted it. So if we're going to really talk about perception is reality, we probably should include perceptions of other people that were in that session too. And I chose to take that interpretation because it sounded reasonable and rational. And this happened almost a month after the fact, and I didn't feel threatened. What I really felt was insulted. And I think that's a big difference. And right now there's uh, the, the climate that we're in is not good. I mean, just tonight, Frank was asked to be a real human and resign, inferring that he's not human now. That, that happened. That, that was tonight. So I'm, I'm going to vote no on this. I'm going to vote no on Ken's. And I don't want to create this perpetual uh, climate of disarray in our family. And, this, and we are a family, and we're a dysfunctional family, and I want to get through this. I also take the objective knowledge that I do know that uh, Frank did separate his shoulder, I think the day or day before what, what, was ha what happened to him. I'm, I have problems and I haven't slept for a few days and I'm in a ton of pain. I know when you're in a ton of pain, you make re regrettable con uh, comments. Um, while it would have been nice to hear all these things from Frank about what really happened, uh, that, that is also regrettable. So I don't support his comments, I condemn them. I'm not gonna get involved in this resolution and in this bizarre extension of our ethics board, which I cannot find is or ordained or in our ordinance for them to actually uh, levy punishments or even levy recommendations as what our council should do. They can recommend a discussion. They can, they can, they can rule over their uh, decision of how violations or how the tenets of our ethics were violated. It's very, it's very bizarre and unprecedented to hear uh, charges of uh, punishment on the council. It's almost like a council review board, right? It's, I believe there's supposed to be an ethics review board, not a council review board, or not a morals review board, right? Because this, this is largely an ethical and moral conundrum. So uh, yeah, that's it. That's how I interpreted it as a person in that meeting. I wasn't even sure if he was talking about that meeting. That's just the current po popular thing to consider. We don't know what he was talking about. We know more about what he was talking about now. Um, but I don't want to be involved in this cycle of public condemnation. Um, I also spoke to Ken about this uh, resolution, 
and I said, why don't you just include your public opinion in your in your uh, comments in your council report? And he said something really bizarre. He basically said, I want to I want to shout this to the world. I want this to be known that we made a resolution demanding this information. And I thought that was a bit uh, uh, a bit in violation of our ethics code. We could be attacking Frank's character, and now we're getting right back into violating something out of uh, ideals and ethics. It's uh, it's not really something that a council should be involved in on a regular basis. And I've said I've said my piece as a square, and I'm not a square. I think I'm pretty cool, and I don't want to uh, I don't want to dwell on this much longer. Also, bro. Yeah, am I on? Yep, you're on. Um. I, I guess uh, similar to what I tell my staff, um, you know, you, you get paid for doing the hard things. You don't really get paid for doing the easy things or making the easy decisions, but um, this is painful and it's painful for many more people than just the people that are lit up on our screen right now. And if everyone can be reminded about what we did after a roll call tonight. We had the mayor read a proclamation about no place for hate. And if that proclamation was a resolution and it could be grandfathered, it would be a unanimous vote on what we're talking about right now. And I think of the word heinous, and generally it's an adjective that's put before a crime. And Councillor Galanese did not commit a crime. And everyone knows that we have no power to ask him to do anything. But because the words are what they are, and I have such a hard time reading them, and such a hard time listening to them, um, it affects me every time I have to hear or read them. And Frank is so strong, like he just mentioned, to go through everything that he has gone through and not to resign, I could not do that. Meaning I could not stay here. I've already been asked by people who encouraged me to take this seat to resign because of the perceptual association with being part of Geneva City Council. And I, I spoke to Frank before the resolution was actually printed. And I thought that the resolution was just about asking Frank to resign. And when I read the meat of the resolution, we talk about the tenants in the Board of Ethics. And although I don't have a resolution prepared for tonight, but I'm hoping that all nine of us can agree that starting right now, can we put the Board of Ethics for the City of Geneva out of business? Can we give them nothing to do so we are always acting in the right way of the position that we were elected to fill? And I can already see some violations for ethics that have already transpired this evening. This is not a political resolution. I resent that. I'm not even part of a political party. And quite frankly, as most people know, I don't even enjoy politics, but I certainly love making decisions to move my community forward. And as Frank said, no apology is gonna work because of the words that are out there. And I would encourage Frank, as he just spoke to us tonight, 
because I believe we have 68 people that are probably quite interested in actually hearing the whole story in whether the recording was wordsmithed or whether there's all these other variables that caused these words to be put together. It's still the words that are so difficult for me to hear and read that I believe for the next 39 meetings, we're probably going to be hearing about this issue. And Frank, you are a strong man to sit in that box, but I really think that being a stronger man would be to consider or to reconsider with your family who you cherish far more than the people that you are looking at right now, if you would just reconsider resigning. I don't want this to affect anyone's friendship or decision-making going forward, but there's been a lot of really wonderful things that have been said about this resolution prior to me speaking. And I agree with so many of them. I don't wanna be part of a dysfunctional governing body. So because the resolution is what it is and it wasn't what I thought it was gonna be prior to speaking or prior to this and speaking to Frank, it, I, I, it, I really have to vote yes understanding that as everyone else does we don't have any power but frank has to make the right decision for the community and that's that's really my piece this is this is not a prepared statement um i have some notes here but um i really hope that before we vote if it takes a half an hour or an hour I, I think the entire story should be heard tonight if Frank is willing to share it with us. I think that that would go a long way. That's my piece. Okay, I have Councilor Salamandra, I have Councilor Galanese, I have Councilor Pruitt, and I have Councilor Cameron. Okay, um, I also listened to the undoctored um, raw footage and um, heard what, um, Frank said, I was also on that teaching that day. But when I, I listened to Frank's words just a few minutes earlier, and he was saying that he doesn't have a problem if someone disagrees with his, him politically, like if he's pro-police and say people call me anti-police, that there should be no reason that we can't get along. But an email that he wrote me on June 29th following a work session called me irrational. It told me I'm the problem in Geneva, that I'm poison, that I spew my ideology and hate for police, and that I, and then try to be the peacemaker, and he is over it. So it, I, I take issue with what you said earlier, because I think it's an, I mean, yes, that sounds very nice, but that hasn't in fact been the way that you've, you've been behaving. Um, I did not want to talk about uh, myself. I have been very um, quiet on a um, list of allegations brought to me. I've had dozens of ethics complaints. And while you were listing them earlier, several council uh, people brought up my name. But I would like to say that to this date, I have zero founded ethics complaints when dozens have been submitted. So I'd like to take a moment to address an issue that's been brought up numerous times in and out of council meetings, often the issue not referred to directly, but vaguely hinted at my behavior, um, like Councillor Noon, Councillor Peeler, Councillor Galanese have done tonight. People want my behavior to be punished, to be stopped. In fact, many people have been calling for me to resign or calling the mayor or other counselors to demand my resignation because of my behavior. I'm not going to resign. And the reason I won't resign is that I didn't do the things I'm being accused of. It has been claimed that I threatened police officers and their family, 
that I threatened to burn down their houses down. This is not true. It is a lie. Whoever told you that is either lying or themselves was lied to. A number of people have made all sorts of claims about things I did or said on July 19th, the same day where uh, another counselor made some frank remarks at a Back the Blue rally. There was an HR complaint and an ethics board complaint made about that incident. I have submitted my account of what happened that day and I will let the process go forward. I can assure you though that at no time did I call anyone names, I did not threaten anyone. The calls for my resignation and the hand-wringing about my behavior have been going on for a long time, since I was elected. In fact, which some people wish had never happened. People spread lies and filthy rumors about me during the election and it didn't stop when I took office. There was a manufactured controversy about my sitting for the pledge, which is my constitutional right. A new media outlet was formed to denounce me and spread lies and have truths about me and my beliefs. Someone screenshot a comment I made on my friend's page and made it look like I was talking about the police station, even though I never did. People to this day regularly refer to me as the crazy woman who wants to burn down the police station. Since the police station is where city council meets in normal times, this allegation is absurd. It has been said, including by my fellow counselors that I push for police accountability because I have an irrational hatred of police, that I have made up my mind and refuse to trust our police officers and so on. I also find this insulting. I have had numerous professional, respectful interactions with Chief Pasolacqua over the years before and after becoming a counselor. I have worked with the GPD officers on several occasions to represent my constituents and open a dialogue between police and people who need police services. It's true at times I have had to insist that GPD officers file accurate reports and follow proper procedures. I encourage anyone in their interactions with the police to be similarly assertive about their rights and what needs to be done to resolve a situation. It is not disrespectful to demand your rights and that everyone be treated with dignity when they encounter the police. Most of all, a few people want me to go because they don't like my politics, my ideas, or my beliefs. They think I shouldn't be allowed to think the things I think or believe I do. The lies and rumors being spread about me are consistently sexist and classist in nature. There are some people very angry that a working class waitress is serving on council. It doesn't matter that much to me, but it should matter to the people who have feelings that de demonizing me for my beliefs is downright un-American. I campaigned on police accountability. I even talked about defunding the GPD to re redirect services to desperately needed services or resources that is. I have also been upfront about what I think, what I believe, what I support and what I oppose. What I didn't do is admit on camera that I don't listen to my constituents. I didn't belittle them and call them squawkers. I didn't ridicule people who have suffered from police brutality. I didn't openly fantasize about killing Genevans. I didn't make a mockery of the democratic process. I didn't privately reveal that my public statements were a lie and I didn't thereby undercut any public any trust the public has in me. So for those reasons, I will not be resigning. And because Councillor Galanese did all of those things, I support the resolution calling for his resignation. Councillor Galanese. I just wanted to say that this is so, so double standard and hypocritical. It really, really is. And I have nothing more to say tonight. If somebody wants to call me individually, I'll tell you everything you want to know, but I wasn't given the opportunity and you, Mr. Mayor, you told me you were going to call me back, but the next second there's a press release asking for my resignation. So the process of how this was handled was wrong. Number one. Okay. Number two, Sage, our city manager, she knows how HR works. I didn't get, I didn't get any, I, I guess I'm under investigation for uh, workplace violence. I seen when that happened with Laura, there was a, a letter sent to all this council. I didn't get I didn't get that respect. I didn't get any of the respect. From day one, at three weeks after this incident happened, it comes to fruition, it comes to light. And never once has any of my fellow counselors called me up and asked me, geez, what happened? No one. Two second conversation for me to put it all together when it's like, holy cow, this is really happening right now. I mean, when I walked into this event and I said, you know, squawkers, this, I'm going to just, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest. You want me to be honest? 
from day one when we had that first city council meeting in July, the people of Geneva, the, the, the majority of people in Geneva when this whole PBA started, never had a voice. But we listened to 26 uh, college professors, one after another in an orchestrated rant going on about how they are the voice of people of Geneva and they weren't. There was, they, they, don't, they didn't represent, and I know this for a fact because at the NAACP meeting that I had, they were pretty upset that there was people speaking on behalf of them. They did, no one knocked at their door and asked them how they felt. So what I'm saying is not a false. And so when I say squawkers, I was meaning the Hobart and William Smith professors. I'm not gonna lie about it because they were the minority of the voices being heard in Geneva at the time. Why should I have to apologize for that? Why should I have to apologize for wearing a back to blue? And people say, oh, you're getting angry. I'm an emotional person that I speak from the heart, especially when I'm getting back into a corner and I know that I didn't really do anything wrong here. And I will stick to that. My words that I spoke that did come out of my mouth of me repeating something that somebody else said, they were hurtful. And when I hurt people's feelings, I, I feel terrible. I've done a lot of soul searching over the last three and a half weeks. You don't know what I've gone through. But I can tell you one thing, I've learned a lot about this and I learned a lot about people. And I promise you, I will not let anyone on this council go through what I went through. It, it, it was disgusting. It was unraveling, mindful at night, th sitting here thinking about it. So if you don't think that I learned something about this, you, you, you all need to really, really look in the mirror and ask yourself if you're really human because we all make mistakes. And me and Laura can go back and forth. Let me tell you, I would protect Laura Salamander for having to go through it, even if she did do something or anyone on this council than to have the people come up one after another and just punch you in the face over and over again. So bad that I felt like at the end, someone was gonna come get me, handcuff me and send me to a maximum security prison where there was no windows and throw away the key because that's what it felt like. No one should have to go through that. We're all human, all of us. And I'm not asking for a second chance because I don't need to have a second chance. I will not resign. I'm gonna do what I want, intended to do from the get go and I'm gonna do it well and my actions will speak louder than words. And in the end, we can, you'll, you're going to see, I don't need to come up with a plan or explain myself, but I will give you this option that you can call me and you want to have a peaceful conversation and hear the whole entire thing. I'll be more than happy to tell you. But as far as the Hobart and William Smith professors that wrote me emails demanding me to tell them this and demanding to tell them that, I'm not. Because you said some very nasty things to me that you think that I said towards you that gave you that right. I didn't entertain it any further than there, and I'm not. And you are a constituent of mine, and I will represent you, and I will voice my opinion and my vote on this council the best I can to move Geneva forward as a whole and represent all people. But I will not, because I know that you didn't vote for me for the get-go. You, you always have been against me. I ran for supervisor. I, I know this isn't my first rodeo, and that's fine. But I will represent you and give you the best representation. I apologize, like I said, for whoever's feelings I hurt. It makes me, it, it, it really bothers me. But like I said, I'm done talking. If you want to call me, you want to meet with me, I'll tell you it all. And you can say you listen to this video. Well, I want one of you to tell me if you heard the other person talking back to me. Because none of you can say you heard another person talking. Yes, I did. In, in that video. You cannot hear a clear conversation going on. You just hear me because I talk very loud. And it's the truth and you can go turn your headphones up all you want because there is more than two, three people standing there asking me things and me bouncing stuff back off of them. I don't need to explain myself, but I will. But I'm done talking. I apologize that this resolution and this even, this even took place because this right here is not what I want Geneva to have happen to it. We have big business to be discussing other than Frank Gallinese. I wasn't even gonna speak tonight because I feel as though problems like this I don't know who said it earlier, should be handled internally with each other, but here it is, we're wasting time when we could be talking about the financial crisis and moving Geneva forward with all this other stuff that is, is hindering us to move forward, but we're talking about Frank. And all I'm gonna say is I'm sorry, and let's just move forward because I know I am. Okay, so I'd like to bring this to the end and have Councilor Pruitt and Councilor Cameron. So after that, I'd like to call the vote, please. I, I hope I'm 
I would like to have heard a, a different tenor to the contrition, but by the same token, I do like to have the, the diversity and, and balance in the, on the council of, of everybody who's here. And so for that reason, I'd like to ask for an amendment to the resolution whereby we split the censure and the resignation request. And, and is anybody willing to second that amendment request? You could all vote for both of them. Councilor Peeler seconds it. So we should vote on the amendment then. Yeah, uh, I'm, Councilor Salamander wants a comment. I just want you to repeat it because I my computer went. So what we're looking for is an amendment to split the uh, the discipline, if you will, between uh, ask for resignation and censure. I believe a censure is is necessary and warranted here. Resignation is a little different, but everybody can vote on both any way you want if you agree with the amendment. Okay, so we have a motion, we have a second. Clerk, please call the roll as I start to unmute. Everybody pay attention. I'm trying to unmute everybody. Please. Pruitt. Pruitt. Aye. Councilor Noon. Aye. Councilor Galanese. Aye. Councilor Burrell. Nay. Councilor Peeler. Aye. Councilor Regan? Aye. Councilor Camera? Nay. Councilor Salamandra? Aye. Aye. Mayor Valentino? Aye. Motion carried. Okay, now that we've got them separated, we'll take the censor first. And I'm going to ask Clerk to call the roll on. Oh, I'm Ready? sorry. I'm sorry, wait, Councilor. Wait a minute. I'm clicking. So we're doing two separate resolutions. Yes. Yes. Okay. But so, so we, have to have a, we have to have motions, don't we? First, a motion for the first and then a second. And that's exactly that's exactly where I was headed. This is a motion on censor for Councilor Galanese. So I have a motion. I have a motion from Councilor Pruitt. I have a second from Councilor Camera. Clerk, please call the roll. No. Oh, our discussion. All right, go ahead. Yep. Well, I just want to finish a little bit of the discussion, uh, you know, whether it's both or one at a time. Um, I want to point out just that, um, um, and I just address uh, Councillor Galanese um, directly. Um, I recall after the Black Lives Matters movement exploded on the, you know, nationally and everything else, and our local Black Lives Matter and PPP people were starting to march and everything else, that you posted stuff on Facebook that just sort of indicates that you're on your way already. I mean, you characterize, if I'm, if I remember correctly, it's just from memory, but I, after you made this post, which inclu included something in it where you said, these people, and this was a reference, I think, to them, as well as the college people, are destroying our way of life in Geneva. And you urge people to call counselors. And I remember a weekend where I just got phone calls all weekend. And that was fine. I mean, I've had many phone calls before, but this was the most phone calls I've ever had in a compressed period of time. And- Councilor Cameron, can I just ask you to kind of stick to factual, not vague information? Please? No, this is, this, this is a factual. I don't think he'll disagree that what? he had a post. He said, it said something like there were 700 followers. And my point that I'm making is that Practically every caller that was responding to that post, we had to spend 15 minutes correcting impressions, um, uh, you know, uh, mistruths, uh, uh, exaggerations, and everything else. The whole Facebook exercise that that let loose was completely wrong and made. So, so I think Frank's lives that lives in that space, and he said he's emotional. Well, unfortunately, I think Facebook is not the place for him. Now, um, the other thing is, is that Frank's saying this is a minority. The college community and the people that that spoke up are a minority. I don't know. We haven't made any uh, polls, but why would it matter whether if they were a minority or not? Why are they labeled as communists and anarchists? and people that want to destroy our community, and people who've only been here a little while. It, it's, 
It's ridiculous. It's back to the blood and soil. The thing I started out with, you know, uh, it, it's I've lived here all my life. It doesn't it doesn't matter. You know, if you arrive and you're you're respectful and you join in the political process, that's what that's what the idea of the United States of America is. So I just think that this these comments and everything else. So, I, yeah, I'm going to vote for censure for the okay. words. Councilor, Councilor Galanazian and Councilor Regan. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of appalled at some of the comments that Ken makes. He probably has an ethics folder that's filled to the tilt. And he's, he has the audacity. Counsel, let's talk. stick to factual information. Okay. Please. Well, he talks about Facebook. I should stay off of Facebook. Well, what you were referring to is when the two officers that you wanted to fire um, wasn't on the agenda, but it happened to be on the agenda. So I, what I was saying Not was hire. About whatever the fact may be. You were wrong. You never want to admit when you're wrong. Right. And Facebook is the most powerful way to talk to people in the 2020 era out of anything. So you can be a dinosaur and be back in times all you want and not believe that uh, Facebook is anything, but it is. It's powerful, very powerful. Someone can put something on there today that can really do damage. I'm an example of that. Okay. Yes, you are. 37 years of my life, I've never had really anybody really say anything bad about me. But I'm the big boogeyman in Geneva now. Okay. So can we move on. It is what it is. Councilor Reagan. Yeah, I just have a point of order question. I mean, I actually uh, don't think it will affect the. You know, I, I, we know what his vote will be, but um, considering these are about Frank, is that a conflict of interest? I'm just point of order. I'll abstain from the vote, so you don't even have to worry. That, that's uh, that's what I was curious about. Thank you. Okay, clerk, please call the roll on censor of Councilor Galanese. Okay, so just so we're clear. I have Frank, my hand up. You have a comment, Councilor Peeler? Well, just, just I have a point of order. No, hold on, Councilor Camera. I'm asking Councilor Peeler a question. Councilor Peeler, did you have a comment? I did. Thank you. Just a justification comment. Um, my opinion is, is developing throughout this council meeting. And I think censure is in order because at all, at all moments of self-control, council meetings should be emotionally contained. And that's, I, I understand it's difficult. I get that. So the private conversation that you had, wait a minute, hold on. The censure is, do we have to vote on the censure based on the private conversation or the, or the, or the, or the, what, what's on, sorry, this is a, this is a this, question. This is for a, this is a vote for censor of Councilor Galanese based on the ethics board recommendation of violating of, of tenants. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Cam, is it pertinent to the discussion or can we yes, call it? Yes, it on? is. Yes, it I is. I hope so. Okay. So I want, for the record though, I'm asking all, the only thing, the, the whole resolution in both cases the, the language of, of the resolution, we're sort of splitting this into two. The language in the first part of, of uh, the resolution down to the therefores, we're splitting really the therefores. One is asking for censure and one is asking for a, a request for a resignation. So yes, I would sir. like the verbiage for the rest of the resolution that, it, that precedes it, I would like that verbiage to stay intact and that that we just split the two last paragraphs. That is the intention. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, clerk, please call the roll. I wanna be clear that I do have to call on Councilor Galanese. He does have to say that he abstains. Yes. He's not going to be voting. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, I just wanna make sure that was clear. Yep, thank you. Okay, so I, Councilor I Pruitt, go ahead. Can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Okay, so also I wanna just say, that the rules of ethics and the ethics board need to be looked into because from day one of this council getting together, there has been some pretty, I'm going to say false claims or accusations that they've made. And if you look at the resolution that was written up of the ethics uh, board in the ethics uh, rules of procedure, they're not operating under those rules of procedure that it's supposed to take place. It's supposed to become before council. So I feel 
when it all comes down to it, once again, the rules of procedure of how they're supposed to take place, we are not doing them properly. And I feel that anything from this point behind us is, is it shouldn't even be because rules of procedure are supposed to be followed. If you get a, a, a speeding ticket and if a police officer doesn't fill out the paperwork properly, the, the, usually the, it's gonna be thrown out of court. And I believe that the way that our ethics board has been handling these things, that's neither here nor there, but I would like counsel and our attorney to look into that of how the resolution was written up and make sure that the rules of procedure are followed from this point forward. Council Peeler has already requested that. That's taken into consideration. We will be doing that. Clerk, please call the roll. Erwin? Oh, aye. This is for the censure one. All right, good. Councillor Noon? Oh, sorry. Let me unmute you, Councillor Noon. Let me unmute you. Aye. Councillor Galanese? Abstain. Councillor Burrell? Aye. Councillor Peeler? Aye. Councillor Regan? Aye. Councillor Camera? Aye. Councillor Salamandra? Aye. Mayor Valentino? Aye. Motion carried. Okay, now we're going to call a vote on the resignation portion of this resolution. Do I have a motion? motion? Councillor Regan, second. Councillor Camera, discussion? I hope not. You will find me not in favor of this. I've already voiced my opinion. I don't need to double up on that. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Regan? Aye. Councilor Camera? Aye. Councilor Salamandra? Aye. Councilor Pruitt? I'm working on mute you there, Councilor Pruitt. There you go. Please, there you go. Oh. Maybe because I don't think it's within the chart. I don't think it's within our legality to do. So Councilor no. Noon? I already outlined my thinking and I hope uh, council will take serious some of those proposals that I brought forth to bring actual real solutions. So I vote no. Councilor Galanese? No. Councilor Burrell? Uh, I believe uh, Frank has to abstain. That would be proper. I would agree with you completely, Councilor Burrell. I don't have to abstain. Why do I have to abstain? You can, vote, was... for your, you can vote for yourself. Why can't you vote for yourself? Yeah, I voted for myself in the election. Why can't I vote for myself now? Uh, legal, can we get some support on this? That's, that's legal question. Please, okay. I think this motion uh, differs from the censure motion. And I think he's uh, allowed to state his opinion on whether he should have to retain or not. Thank you, sir. Censure motion is a different concept. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thanks, Hank. Right. I, I will say I haven't checked with Robert's rules of order on that. Thank you, Abel. Aye. Councillor Peeler? No. Mayor Valentino? Nay. Motion defeated. Did I okay. vote? Did you vote? <laughs> yep, you were the second one that I, no, the third one that I called. Yes. Okay, so continuing with ethics uh, recommendations, um, there's one comment that was brought up in public comment that is we're supposed to, these two were supposed to be read last meeting, but since we had a marathon meeting again, um, they didn't get read, so I will read them tonight. The first one is Frank Galanese. A complaint was made by a citizen in reaction to Mr. Galanese's claim, exclaiming bullshit. Um, after the citizen's public comment, the board found Mr. Galanese in violations of 10 to 3.5. It is our recommendation that he is issue a public policy during the council meeting for the comment. Um, the next one is. Councilor Cameron, Mr. Cameron has once again been found in violation of tenant three. The most recent violation of this tenant was a result of Mr. Cameron's disingenuous and inappropriate public apology made as a result of one of our previous recommendations for violation of tenant three. Therefore, I recommended a formal censure be written and put in Mr. Cameron's personnel file with the city of Geneva. Rather than make an attempt at another apology, we find it more appropriate for future voters to have the ability to be aware of Mr. Cameron's repeated tenant three offense. This resolution reads, whereas the city of Geneva has adopted a code of ethics containing 17 tenants of good conduct of public officials and employees of the city of Geneva, whereas tenant three of the city of Geneva code of ethics reads as follows, the professional and personal conduct of public officials must be above reproach and avoid even the appearance of impropriety. Public officials shall refrain from abusive conduct, personal charges, or verbal attacks upon the character or motives of other public officials. And whereas this, this Geneva City Board of Ethics 
has delivered the following recommendation concerning a complaint filed by filed regarding city councilor R. Kenneth Kama. Uh, whereas council Kama had signed the, the city's ethic pledge in which he agreed to adhere to the tenets of good conduct for public officials and employees. And whereas the city board of ethics has found that council Kama has violated tenant three of the city code of ethics. Now there, therefore be it resolved that the city of Geneva city council adopts the recommendation of the board of ethics and determines council Kama has violated tenant three of the city's code of ethics. And it is further resolved that the city, Geneva City Council censure City Councilor Camera for violations of the City Code of Ethics. And it is further resolved that a copy of this resolution be placed in Councilor Camera's personal folder. Do I have a motion? No motion, resolution dies. Moving on. Okay, uh, this is uh, a resolution establishing implicit bias training for the City of Geneva staff and the City of Geneva Council presented by our city manager. Great, thank you, Mayor. So this action um, as well as the No Place uh, for Hate proclamation was brought forward uh, to me by Erica Collins, who is our staff liaison for the Geneva Human Rights Commission, also for Community Compact and is our newly appointed uh, fair housing uh, officer. And I think this resolution in Pleasant Bias uh, is refers to things that we might do from that are unconscious uh, behavior from biases that we have. And I think it's important as a city to start with us, you know, our police department uh, does do the bias training, but I really would like it to be all of uh, city staff. And I, this resolution also makes the request that city council would join us in doing that training. We are seeking community partners to help us with this uh, and the goal is to have it uh, be at, at no cost and more of a partnership and would hopefully grow to expand uh, throughout our community as well. Thank you, city manager. Can I have a motion, please? I, I will second Councilor, Councilor Noon made the motion. Mayor Valentino seconds it. Any discussion? Uh, Councilor Cameron? I just have some questions. Um, so, so the thing is, is that is it true that our police department went through implicit bias training several years ago, right? So this is now we're all going to. You just want to add, you want to expand it, but would the would the police force also go through it again as well? Yeah, and city council looking at the you know different training models that'll be you know for for us to participate in. Okay, so and and so we might all be. You you might put you know I don't know half the people in city government, including police officers and everything in, in, in at a ramada, and present and discuss, and then the other half of city government do a two sessions or something. How much is this going to cost? COVID nineteen will be creative on how it's done. Right. I don't have specifics on what it would actually physically look at look like yet. And the city manager mentioned we're going to try to do this at no cost, counselor. Okay, thank you. Okay. Please, please call the. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Salamanca. Hi. Uh, well, I'm just wondering um, all the evidence I've looked at for implicit bias training, there's never any measurable effects. And so I'm wondering who comes to the decision about. I saw in an email that you said that this was going to be part of a like multi prong uh, initiative. I'd like to know what the other ones are. Mm -hmm. And um, I also think maybe it's premature until the, I would be, if it's at no cost, it's a different answer from me than if there is some cost. So I would like staff to come back if it, if it does in fact inc incur a cost. Councilor Cam, you have another comment. Council Pruitt, well, let me get wait, let me get Councilor Pruitt first. I'm sorry. I just had a question: is is this elective or something that everybody will will do? We do triple bottom line trainings, and we have done um, you know different topics, and so the idea was that this would be included in that. So triple bottom line is just us looking at a city of what is our social and environmental and, and financial impacts. Um, and so we have done trauma-informed 
um, trainings uh, with with staff, and we will work to have everyone uh, be able to participate in this. And I'm hoping that if you say yes, that you are on board for yourself to be able to participate in this. Well, it depends. Is it just a one-day session, or it, really what's involved? It's yet to be determined, I believe. Well, the, the, yeah. the vote tonight is that we'll have the city manager move forward with establishing some training. We don't know the depth of that training. We're hoping there's no cost. So it'll come back to us. Okay. Also, Camera. Well, just, uh, you know, I, I just went through um, sexual harassment in the workplace training. Um, you know, we we'll probably all know that we have to do that in New York State. And, um, you know, it took a, you know, it took an hour or so of time. Um, is it, the thing is, is that we have, this council is working overtime. And um, well, well, maybe over, over, over time compared to what my last eight years of experience uh, sort of indicate. And so, you know, one of the things that I worry about is we're, we're not being effective where we, we're most needed and that this is a, in a way could be a distraction. Um, we have, we have to focus and our energies on some very, very um, difficult decisions to make in the next uh, several months or the next year uh, related to the financial health of this community and all the, all the, you know, we talk about, you know, there's just a lot that's coming at us and it's going to, and we've still got so much work in front of us. Tonight is established the, these three working meetings that we're having about police accountability and everything else, it creates this perception that we're working on this, but we already know now, we all, we all have our, our biases and everything, and they're, they're all out there for everybody to see. And I'm the first one to admit I have some problems myself. So the, the thing is, is that taking one or two or three hours or whatever out to do this in the next month or two, to me is a distraction from work I have to do in other areas for the city. And that's that's a concern of mine. So I think it should be optional. If, if, this, if the city manager wants to make them available, that's fine. But uh, I don't want to be required to do it the way my firm required me to do it. In other words, it was there was no discussion. I, I did one last year and I passed. And, you know, they're, they want me to do it again. And I did it because there was no questions asked, it's do it. Clerk, please call it. Oh, sorry, city manager. I was say that we had we put a target of by next March. We have all have a lot on our plate, but I do think this is important. So I hope you do it. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Noon? Aye. Councilor Galanese? Aye. Councilor Burrell? Aye. Councilor Peeler? Aye. Councilor Regan? Aye. Councilor Camera? Aye. Councilor Salamandra? Councilor Salamandra? Any, I don't see her anymore. Right there. Cal Councilor Pruitt? Aye. Mayor Valentino? Aye. Motion carried. Okay. Next, we're moving on to resolution establishing a public hearing on the sale of eight one mile point. Presented by our assistant city manager. Sorry, I was an I. I'm here. I'm just off camera for a second, and you had me muted. I Thank see you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Adam. So, uh, what we have here is a resolution just to establish this public hearing um, for the sale of One Mile Point. Uh, this is pretty standard stuff that we do. I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Um, anyway, so the public hearing would be scheduled for the October City Council meeting as well as the approval of sale. So what we would be looking to do tonight is just establish that public hearing. We did put this property out for sale and we received, I believe it was close to 10 sealed bids. Uh, we chose the one that we feel was most effective, which was a, um, 
a purchase price of $125,000, which um, would be a big win for us, not only getting the, the revenue from the sale, but also getting a property that would be, that have a pretty significant assessment back on the tax rolls. So um, this property, the intention is not to develop it. It's, it's uh, got some terrain difficulties. Um, and so the person just wanted to, the person that, that is purchasing this or tentatively purchasing this has property in that area and um, just wanted more property in that area. So um, no development, but there is potential, but there's no development proposed in uh, the proposal. So what we're looking at is a purchase price of 125,000. There would be no owner occupied requirement because there is no there is no actual house on the property. It's just vacant land. Um, it's wooded land and is a lot of hills. So um, what we'd be doing tonight again is just establishing that public hearing for the public to have the ability to speak uh, in October and approve the sale later in that meeting. So I can answer any questions if there are any. Okay, let's get a motion to put it on the floor first. Councilor Cameron, second by Council Burrell, um, and let me unmute some people. Uh, who would like to speak? Councilor Cameron, and then Councilor Pruitt. A, just a couple of questions. Um, so, if it if if we sell it for a, if we sell it for one hundred and twenty five k, so um, will it go on the tax rolls assessed at one hundred twenty five k? Uh, I'm not sure that would be a question to the assessor and his methodology, but I would assume um, that it would be 125 at a minimum. Okay, so your professional guess is 125 as, as a minimum. So if I multiply that by, I don't know, 18 for the general fund, that means we'd be getting two, you know, more than $2,000 a year of tax of, of money besides the sale, right? If all of those figures you mentioned hold, yes. Okay. So, um, okay. So, um, is this, this is not, I understand that we, we also have you and the city manager working on developing all of our city owned land to help develop a, a project that would be an infill development for the city, right? Yes. You're, you're working on that. So, th this doesn't, this doesn't fold into those plans, does it? No, nope, it's, it's not that kind of a lot to build on or anything. Correct. Okay, thank you. That's a fruit. Sir, I was just a point of clarification. Uh, I noticed on the on the sheet that we have, it says the assessed value for the land is 419,000 and the market value is a million 53. What do those numbers mean? So those are just, those are what, the, the assessed value is what um, our assessor has it at right now. Sage, did you? It, it's over, not the, the, the value of the property is based on the pump station that is ours, that will remain ours. So that'll be carved out of the property. So that value is is referring to uh, our assessed. And this is just the establishing the public hearing. This is not a sale of this property at this time. Okay, thanks. Council Peeler. Hey, just uh, for sake of public review, Sage, can you th can you throw this up on the map? It's a, it's on the stuff. It's on the uh, no. I know. I know. It's, it's in on the minutes. The stuff. I know it's in the minutes. I'm hoping that we what can. What Council Peeler is asking is the rest of the world gets to see it here. Just you know, let people know. I mean, this is lakefront property, if I'm not mistaken. No, it's not lakefront property. No. One mile point. No. What am I? Lake adjacent? Am I in the wrong? This the, the this property has no access to the lake. Correct. It's it west has, of the railroad. Has, it's west. Sage, it's west I can of the share. It. Tracks. I, I think I can share it. There it is. Yeah, it's right here. Right I'm there. sharing. Let, let I'm the city manager in. take care of it, please. So this is our we have our pump station facility. The land is right here. Um, Adam's working on the, the details. There is a small sliver right here, and that'll be 
brought forward and we could have those those maps of what would be subdivided out and what would be would remain. How is this not lakefront property or or for, I mean people because have it's, property it's it's west of the railroad tracks and it does not go east of the tracks. It's not it, it, it's not lake time access. out time out can we let the city manager speak please? There is a small sliver right here and we will clearly display that for both the public hearing and the documents for it and then any sale as well. And it's not buildable though, that sliver. Is that, sorry to, sorry to interrupt, I'm, I have follow-ups. Yep. yep, go ahead. So is that, uh, is that because of the uh, linear feet footage that's available to build on it, Adam? Correct. Okay. What's the minimum again? Is it 50 feet? Um, Sage, do you know off the top of your head the minimum? I want to say it's 75. 75, I thought. Yeah. Okay. Is it? Okay. 75 by 150, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Council Pruitt? I really like the fact this is go on the tax rolls, but how did we value this at 125? The, the assessor isn't always that accurate. We didn't, we didn't value it. We put a, we put a, a bid out. And that was the highest bid that came back. So there's a difference between the bid amount and the assessed value amount. And that's what Adam was trying to tell us is the taxes are questionable at this point based on what the assessor finally assesses are for after the subdivision. That's right. Also, could, Sorry. Uh, follow up question. Though you cannot build on it, is does the property include an easement or uh, any type of act lake access as part of its rights? Um, maybe a, sometimes docks and boathouses aren't necessarily structures that are considered uh, building. It will not. There are there will be some easements for um, I believe gas lines or sewer lines that, that run under there, but um, only on the city side. So nothing in terms of like that. Okay. Amal, I see your hand being raised. Mute me. So um, one explanation for the assessment is that lakefront is lakefront and the assessors have a methodology for assessing lakefront so much per foot. It could be the quality of the lake foot and everything it could be a thousand, it could be 2000 or more a foot. So as far as, far as why the assessment is so high, uh, that could be part of it, um, I, I believe. Okay. So clerk, can we call the roll, please? On the Council public camera. Aye. Councillor Salamandra. I'm trying Councilor to unmute you. Okay. Aye. Councillor Pruitt. Aye. Councillor Noon. Aye. I'm trying to unmute him too. Give him a second. Aye. Aye. Councillor Galanese. Aye. Councillor Burrell. Aye. Councillor Peeler. Aye. Let's get some Councilor more levy. Councilor Regan? Aye. Mayor Valentino? Aye. Thank Motion you. Motion carried. Much. Okay. So, next on the agenda, we have a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a fast charging station contract agreement with New York Power Authority, presented by our city manager. Great. So, I'm going to screen share in, in the middle of talking in a moment. So, hopefully, that will go fine. Uh, the New York Power Authority came to us to partner, uh, they're partnering with DRI communities. To put in some fast charging stations. So we are a community that already has um, some uh, charging stations. One is brand new behind City Hall. It's a slower charging station. We have a spot for a second one. We didn't have the funding, but we have the electrical set up for it. The Finger Lakes Welcome Center of the state also put in several charging stations, not fast charging, uh, but charging. Uh, we have had people using it. Uh, we we're on the on the map for City Hall, and so. I've seen several take advantage of it. So this, and I'm going to do the screen share while I'm talking, this is a program that they would install three to four. And I'm just going to pull up the map. Great. Um, because I know for us where it's located is um, important to the conversation. So these fast charging stations are a little bit larger and they need the space in the room to be able to have the of the utility piece work. And so we, um, Katie Levy, who's our community planner, 
uh, worked with them and then worked internally to look at different parking spots. What we're looking at here is uh, off of Seneca Street and Scott LaFaro Drive, we've got the Smith Opera House. The parking spaces in, in red are currently marked for 10 hour parking. These are also 10 hour, uh, I believe, longer parking. They would take, utilize these uh, for 10 years. They would, we would be committed to that. So that's something to consider. Uh, they would own the facility. They, uh, we would not have any costs except for if we wanted to do some signage for it, we would have to uh, snow removal and maintain them. And then if they take them out in 10 years, if there's any uh, just on the pavement, we may have some additional things to do, but nothing uh, major there. Uh, it would be required that they were free, so they would they wouldn't be a, they would post the electric, so we wouldn't have a bill, but we would not be able to charge uh, for them. And there would have to be 24 uh, hour access seven days a week for it. So I'll stop there and then just be able to answer questions, and I'll also stop the screen share. We have a motion. I was muted. Councillor Noon and Councillor Burrell second. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Discussion or can we go right to the vote? So I just want to confirm no costs, right, Sage? The, the, the time to plow, which we do now, uh, some signage costs if we wanted to be able to do signage to get folks there, although the most a lot of the people probably want to do that. We have not done that for City Hall yet, uh, but most people use a, a service that they're finding out where the spots are right there so <clears throat> I think yeah I just said just said did I hear you say though that even for use of it there would not be a, a charge like for citizens to pull up and charge their vehicles or is there a charge for that there's there's no parking fee and I believe that there's no cost they would be paying the the cost of the electricity no I mean so so an individual who has an electric car would be paying to charge their car. Is that right? Um, that's, that's, I don't believe so. And I'll look as we're talking unless there's no more. I believe that we have to provide access to it. They're yeah, making a charge on their end because they're, so Olympia operates a charger. I, I'm not 100% sure if there is it to be similar to where you have it in other places. We cannot charge a fee for our parking lot. And I didn't think that they would be charging, but if they did, it would be comparable to the, the rate of mine. Thank you. Councilor Kama. Just, um, I'm looking at the brochure and everything. Um, you know, there's, there's the picture where it's very, you know, it's highly marked and branded. Um, you know, it's a very, you know, sexy, picture and everything. Are we going to do that so that it's it's very visible where it is? Because I think that, you know, it's in the back of a parking lot. Uh, you know, it's a fairly well used parking lot and everything, but it you know, I think we've got to make a big deal of it. So will the will NYSERDA do all that painting and signage and everything else? Or will that be something we have to do? They'll do all the site amenities. The signage is the piece that they that I, my understanding is that we, if we're trying to get people to it, we would do the signage to get folks to, to the facility. But they, the pictures of them doing the, the actual charging stations are fairly broad. I think some of the, the pavement markings, as you see it in the council briefing packet, they would be doing. They'd be doing the pavement markings where the sign, where the, where it is. Okay, thank you. Okay, clerk, oh, Council Burrow again. Good. I think the location is absolutely fantastic. Um, it's, it's very pro-business um, for those that uh, have a car that needs to be charged. Um, I would caution uh, the city manager, however, that uh, post-pandemic on a Friday night and when there is an event at the Smith Opera House, these spaces will be used by people who are not charging their car. So um, if we can alert uh, enforcement, um, particularly when there's a show at the Smith, where oftentimes people are parking at the south end of the skating rink, um, that that vehicles be 
to say the word, but uh, be towed for those that have electric cars can actually charge their vehicle. But this is just wonderfully friendly and a great place. Um, and by the same token, um, I can also predict that perhaps um, people that live nearby with electric cars may get in the habit of charging their vehicle in the night and leave them there until they go to work in the morning. Um, not knowing how much turnover at those hours of the day, <clears throat> it's just something for uh, the patrolmen to be aware of. But I love the idea and it's a great location. I have Councilor Peeler, then Councilor Noon. A quick follow up uh, and possibly question for Tom or clarity from Tom. So, uh, sorry about my dog barking. And uh, for Sage, if we do um, require enforcement of that parking, I believe it's going to require ordinance change. It may, yes. Yeah. yeah. And who will do that enforcement? Is that police? For all of our parking, yes. Okay. Councilor Noon? Sage, who will be paying for electricity? So NIPA is paying for the electricity and I did, I did find it when I was thinking that they also will uh, pay for electricity costs for the chargers, so. Thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. Aye. Councilor Galanese? Aye. Councilor Burrell? Aye. Councillor Peeler? I, wait, I got to unmute him. There he is. He's, he's two thumbs and up. There he Aye. Councillor Regan? Aye. Councillor Camera? Aye. Councillor Salamandra? Aye. Councillor Pruitt? Aye. Mayor Valentino? Aye. Motion carried. Next on the agenda was we have the Genesee Park remediation plan and next steps over we've got a city manager. I'm going to disappear for a minute because I have. Great. I'm going to do uh, some screen sharing again as well. So we are in a similar position that homeowners and property owners have been in if they're in the foundry area for remediation of uh, getting soil samples back and having to make you know, decisions uh, around uh, the remediation. So this is a very special park, Genesee Park, you know, middle 1800s. And I'm going to bring up some pictures. Uh, bear with me. We'll start actually with some of the pictures of when it was at its beginning. And um, you can see the, the homes in the background. You can also notice different details that have been done to those homes if you go a look today as well. Uh, but you can see this is looking uh, back. Actually, uh, kind of going towards Geneva Street on the Lewis Street on that side. And another one, uh, here, here's the park when the trees are starting to mature some. And so what we're, what we're before us, and I'm gonna put up kind of a map in a moment, but we were uh, quite uh, concerned with this park because we have so many mature trees. This is a, uh, you know, a, a park that so many of us enjoy. Uh, not only the neighbors that love it, uh, that live next door, uh, but many community members. And so we asked them for additional soil sampling because we wanted to make sure that any recommendation really took into account uh, what was around the trees. And so um, they did uh, over uh, 50 samples and I'll show that, that picture, but the concentrations of arsenic and lead uh, were high so as high as 150 parts per million for arsenic and 16 parts per million is the site-specific cleanup goal um, that was identified in the January 2017 record of decision and 680 parts per million for lead is what was found on the, the park. Um, and they're trying to get a 400 parts per million for the site-specific cleanup goal. Um, and so they did additional testing around the trees and let's see if I can change my view. And um, much to my uh, disappointment, uh, there is in the park uh, six inches. So the depth at which they have to come to remediate is uh, their six inch, which is the blue. 
you can see my uh, screen here is the blue areas here, here. 12 inches is the pink area. And so just to give you orientation, you can probably see it with the concrete. We've got um, Lewis Street over here on the right. Uh, you got Genesee um, Park Place on the, the top side. You've got Genesee Street on the south, just to give you a little orientation there. Uh, 18 inches over here, which is in green. Uh, oh, sorry, in orange are the 18 and then 24 inches in the green. Uh, and so what this means is the they had an arborist, Jerry Bond from Urban Analytics, take a look at the trees, the age of the trees, the health and condition of the trees, and try to make a determination of would they survive doing remediation. And what the most uh, prominent tree that's there is this big uh, bur oak. I think it could be one of the original trees. If you look back in the picture, the size of it, the diameter. And if you look at we, um, the, Carrie Lippincott found that, looked back at the deed and oak trees are in the deed as plant trees to be planted. Um, there aren't as many oak trees there, but it does make me wonder if originally there were many more. Um, and so what we're looking at is the recommendation that they're able, this one is uh, 12 inches around on the pink to be able to do some of a vacuum process. They're doing it for uh, a chestnut tree, just kitty corner away to see how that will work. Um, and then also there's a smaller uh, eastern red bud as well. Uh, but the determination was that the uh, other trees uh, would probably not make, make it after the remediation um, and then just the health of them. And so what we're looking at, and I'll stop screen sharing for the moment, uh, is a significant uh, change for the park for the next uh, 40 years. And um, until that, when not say 40 years, if you can watch all of our street trees growing, it's much less than that. But we have uh, a lot of shade, a lot of mature trees. And uh, we're looking at doing is doing a, a significant amount of replanting for trees and bushes. And so uh, we're taking a risk with the big burr oak. If it does fails and, and dies, it we will be um, taking on the liability of that and the cost to remove it, but I think it, it, it is of such significance that I don't think that we should do otherwise. Um, one thing that, as I'm, as you all know, an, an optimist and always look for the opportunity. Um, we, I had the initial meeting with the Shade Tree Committee and the Historical Society director to come out and and meet uh, with us to um, get some advice on what was being proposed. The next uh, step I have this Saturday, uh, 10 o'clock in Genesee Park, uh, the residents and anyone that's interested uh, to come with masks, please, uh, to, so I can go into more detail. It's a lot easier when you can be on site and looking at the trees. But the opportunity that we have is that over the winter time, uh, a lot can be planned. So the Shade Tree Committee is really wanting to take this on, the Historical Society wants to be involved and I would love to have any neighbor resident or other interested um, community member help us re-envision the park in terms of how are we going to make it prominent over the next hundred years. Um, and so uh, I have not, I will be signing, I have not gotten the city consent, but that should be uh, forthcoming and they're looking at sometime as early as, as next week or the following is when they'd like to start. The, the oak tree in terms of survival from the um, arborist is recommending a fall remediation because the contaminant levels came in so much higher than they anticipated. They pushed it up and really want it to happen this fall so that it can be uh, cleaned up uh, for our community. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there, but wanted to give updates and hope that anyone will uh, join us on Saturday. Okay, I've got Councilor Gallinese and then Councilor Pruitt. Um, Sage, um, I got a question. Is there any water or sewer mains that run through that park? I sort of think that they're from years in the past. I think there's something big that runs through there, and I don't believe it's that deep. Am I correct? So there's the water main that runs under the the sidewalk concrete path 
and they're still looking at whether that will be replaced. It wouldn't be in danger if it does, the sidewalk was replaced uh, like for like, essentially, it's, it's is, fine. Is, is, so, that, is that figured into the cost if when doing stuff around there that main, because it's so old, uh, breaks that we have foreseen costs in there just in case? No, it's it's been looked at. Originally, it wasn't going to be touched at all, and so they're looking at that. But it, that doesn't seem to be a concern. But it is it is on the just the radar to make sure. But it does make sense. Council put. Yes, I'm curious. Why do we have to do this? Is there a law or requirement or funding or something that's forcing us to do it? And do we really have to go down 24 inches? You know the. The, is maybe six inches all over. I, I, I think we've only got maybe a dozen real landmarks in Geneva. This is one of the most beautiful treasures we have and we're going to denude it. It's good. I can't imagine anybody doing this in Paltney Park, even if the DEC said so. So why can't we figure out a way to try to save these trees that are in there, even if it might mean that we that some of them don't survive? I'm really opposed to really digging all this up if there's any way at all that we can get around it legally. We, we can't do half halfway. We can we could say that we were not going to follow the direction of the, DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation and the Department of Health and do the remediation. Um, but I would just strongly have, we have to really consider that because this is coming out of public health and safety for our residents. Um, we, petition? we couldn't do six inches and have the cleanup. It, it wouldn't because of the level. Um, and as the map showed, some areas are two feet, some are a foot and a half, some are you know a foot, and some are half a foot. And you so, know, Sage, I'm concerned. I grew up on State Street. I used to play in that stuff behind the foundry as a little kid right on the tracks. And I, I don't live there now, so that I'm worried about remediation. But I mean, really, you, there's all over. Uh, there's a driveway in, in my ward where the guy says remediation stops halfway through his driveway. I mean, there's got to be some flexibility in here. And for something as important as this this park, I'm wondering if we can't petition the DEC, try to get a better level of judgment in there, or do something to try to save it rather than just let it go. I know it'd be nice to replant it again. It'd be fun. I, I enjoy the shade tree, you know, group as well. But I really think we got to try to save this. You know, Trinity Church is going to go. This is going. I mean, really, we're not going to have much left uh, unless we, we try to hold on to some of these gems. I'd, I'd go to great extremes to try to keep this as it is. It's important. Councilor Cameron. Well, I want to echo John's um, sentiments. Uh, I think we need to do, I think this is really a sad thing. And um, I'm, I question whether there are tangible health benefits to be derived by denuding this park. Um, I don't want, you know, it's just, it's the perfect is the enemy of the good. You know, if we could just maybe take off, I know it's not perfect, but take off three inches or four inches and resod it. Um, that adds a level of, uh, of um, uh, protection for people using the park. But I wonder what the real health risk is. And I think we should do what Councillor Pruitt said, we should, really look hard and scour the, 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 you know, the, the way to, you know, just really pin the, the DEC uh, down on this and say, we, you know, the sentiment is we don't want to lose this park. We want it the way it is. Now, I know there's a couple of sick trees in the park. So there's some opportunities to go deeper where the, I think there's one tree that is sick, right, Sage? There's one tree that's dead, but it's not in the area that has to go deep. And so I don't think we can, we can't, we can't do it halfway. And that's right. the challenge. And I am right there with you all in, in not wanting to lose those mature trees. Uh, if you look at them, I mean, they're in different stages and you of uh, maturity or growth or health. Um, and so there are, are but you can't also replace a tree. However, I, we also have to consider looking out 100 years, 150 years, and what is our responsibility uh, for following through with a, a cleanup that has come from the state. And that's something that you had, the hat of wearing for public safety. And against, and I understand because I 
you all know, I was the chair of the Shade Tree Committee. I think trees are, you know, besides our, our people, are a huge asset in our, in our community and we're behind in, in planting trees. Um, but it, I would love to hear from everyone. This is a really uh, hard topic because mm -hmm. you can't, once the trees are gone, the park will look very different for the next few decades. Well, I, I question the re level of risk to the pe people because the way this park is used, it's not used like someone's playing in their backyard and digging it up and, you know, uh, having, uh, you know, uh, uh, building a pool or something like that. I've, I've gone by that park almost every other day for years and I've never seen the level of activity in there that disturbs the, the ground or um, uh, it, it in some kind of way that would um, release, uh, you know, lead and arsenic. Uh, so I, I just, I really hope we do everything we can to not go through with this. There may Councilor be other Salamandra. methods, could be putting plastic I, down. Gentlemen, come on, can we stay to order? Councilor Salamandra. Um, I hope that we'll do everything that we can do to protect foundry residents from lead and arsenic because we failed to do that before. And I love trees. Um, I'm interested in this neighborhood meeting. I think one important thing is that um, we really need to listen to foundry residents. So before this council makes a decision, I would like to attend the meeting on Saturday and see how it goes and what the people who are living there next to the park and next to the poison have to say. Um, so my question is to Sage, and I'm happy to help. How are you alerting the people directly around the park? And if the city were to produce a flyer, I could take it around. Um, and put on mailboxes. I just really want to make sure that there's an initiative to get the residents of the foundry there to decide what happens. So Jessica, Jessica has been working on that. Um, I think it's uh, so important to weigh all the factors, but we also, as a city, have to weigh where you stand on the public health and safety and whether if you don't, if you don't do the remediation, uh, then we won't, you know, get a clean bill of health, which means that, you know, in the future, you city could have, you know, be uh, charged to do that. And also, um, you also just making a statement about the the project in terms of the, the cleanup efforts. And so it's, it's very, it's a, I would like if there was, we need a, a request, I guess, a, a motion on the table, if you're wanting to, to, to pause these efforts because they're wanting to, to be able to do it in this, this fall because of the test results that we need. Um, and if you want, if you do, we may, might be a pause that would take them into the next year. And so I would like to hear from everyone. And if we're looking at a pause, then I think it needs to be um, maybe a motion on the table, which I can help with, but I don't think we've heard from everyone yet. Council Bro. Oh, let me let me let me do the thing here. Sorry about that. So I I think it's uh, equally important to look at the science behind um, arsenic and lead poisoning. Um, we have public water in the neighborhood. As far as I know, nobody has well water uh, that could be affected um, by the contamination in this park. Um, I don't foresee a public playground. Um, uh, being in this park. Um, and secondly, I don't, I don't foresee this plot of land being turned into a community garden where people would be harvesting radishes and carrots uh, where they could be exposed to arsenic and lead poisoning. Um, along that line, uh, we just sold a piece, we're hoping to sell a plot of city-owned property. And are we concerned that someday um, a council uh, that's coming up may actually want to sell Genesee Park, where now we have created perhaps a, a liability for someone who wants to build a home here or to have a garden here. Um, I, don't, I don't see those things happening. Um, so I, I guess I'm wondering if we are 
creating a solution to a problem that is unlikely would exist. So I'm, I, since it is an option, um, I think we should uh, explore um, what the probability is in its current state of someone getting arsenic or lead poisoning. Okay, um, my two cents is uh, thoroughness. So when we talk about remediation of the foundry, this is kind of one of the last pieces to the puzzle. And what I would not want to do is leave the city exposed or the, excuse me, the residents exposed first, number one, and the city exposed number two because uh, of the unknown factors of lack of remediation or complete remediation, which I think is key. And I think there's also, you know, I've had discussions. I think there's also opportunities because there's some great technology out there where instead of planting a, a sapling, I guess you call it a small tree, there's opportunities to uh, have them invest heavily to bring in larger, more mature yes. trees and, uh, you know, maybe not turnkey from remediation to fully develop, but something better than just uh, waiting 20, 30 years for this thing to be full of trees again. So I think remediation is key. And I think the best thing we can do to develop mature trees in that area would be uh, very important. Councilor Peeler, let me unmute you. Thank you. Um, I echo your sentiment. I don't want to increase our exposure to lawsuits, therefore increasing our burden on our taxpayer. Um, if we don't echo, if, if, if we don't echo that when it approach when it uh, is presented to us, how can we say it for other things? Uh, also, I'm a bit. I would be. I would be worried when looking for the DEC or the state to somehow sanction the use of this park as opposed to all the other areas that we're remediating. And they say that those areas are you know, of concern, but this park isn't. That would be a weird contradiction. And it would also kind of, I believe, kind of approach the, the concept of opposing legal. You know, we, sh we shouldn't be, look we should be trying to help people. Um, and the feedback that I've heard about this park is that we have an opportunity to possibly modernize the space. And we can creatively do that with uh, paying homage to the history and the vibe and the culture that represents that park and also bring in more modern amenities that our people in a hundred years are gonna care about. Seating, possibly wireless internet, um, things that weren't thought of 200 years ago. And it would, it would behoove us uh, to consider those. Uh, and I'll get into that possibly a little bit more when I do my council report uh, from the Recreation Board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I haven't heard from, uh, I'll go Council Regan and then Council Noon. Oh, let me, I'm sorry. I gotta do that then. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I have to say, I, I do feel kind of uneducated on this. I, I very much appreciate the park. Um, I felt terrible about all the, the things that the, found, the people who live in the Foundry area went through. And it, it would be a truly sad moment to have to do some of the things that are being suggested here. I mean, I, so I lean towards a, a pause so that you know, maybe there, I don't know, I'm always hoping there's another solution. I, I um, yeah, I'd hate to see it um, get destroyed or get those, those, ma those mature trees have to be taken down. Um, and I hope it doesn't come to that. I think we could modernize it with those trees still there in some ways, if that's, if that's a goal. But um, uh, I don't know, I, I would elect for a pause, even just to better educate myself. And I'm, I'm going to be at that meeting to as a first step towards that, thanks. Okay, Councilor Cameron. Just one more. I oh, just excuse me, wait, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hold up, I forgot Councilor New. To me, this, con this conversation is much simpler than what it's turned into. Um, I'm not quite sure, I am 100% for trees and, and the environment and, and keeping as much of a green space as we can here in the city. Uh, but at the same time, not reaching out to the, we, we really need to make sure 
that the remediation is done correctly uh, and that we go into the fifth and sixth wards and, and talk to those residents. It should not be up to us nine um, trying to decide what really should be done with this. Those are the residents that obviously have been impacted by the foundry for decades. And, and those are truly the people that, that need to be reached out to. And anything short of that effort uh, is irresponsible. Uh, so I really hope that we can find a common solution here uh, that obviously not, that enhances the park, uh, but doesn't clean around and leave poison in the middle or, or anything of that sort, but, but making sure that the remediation is done correctly, uh, but most importantly, just doing what's right for the residents, not what's doing what's right for us, but, but really reaching out to those fifth and sixth ward residents, particularly in the area. Uh, and then once that is done and, and you know, the remediation is complete, hopefully correctly, uh, and to everyone's benefit, that we work to improve Genesee Park uh, and make Genesee Park look like a bicent bicentennial or, or Paltney Street. Uh, as I've heard many residents bring up the fact that due to its location, it seems to always be neglected. Uh, and, and it might be due to just the, the population that exists in that area, and that's not right. Uh, so I do hope that we do work to improve, uh, but also preserve the history of it, but, but make that park look just as, as good as any other park in the city and put forth just as much effort in that area of, of the city as, as we do others um, and, and make that obviously equitable. Also, Cam, I see you raising your hand. Um, I, I think that everybody that expressed um, a desire to save the trees and to preserve the park's character, we're not suggesting that uh, um, we do that at, the, at the, uh, the harm to the residents or that the residents shouldn't have a voice in what's going on. I think uh, Councillor Noon's uh, sort of inference that uh, the rest of us don't care or the people that expressed a, a desire for the trees, it was, uh, it was this tone of voice that was very interesting. So um, I think and one of the things that's- Paul, with that's every so, single thing I do, Ken, every um, time. Not every single right. thing. Time, time out, time out. That's, that's 10 at three. I, I, You're a Let's respect I each think, other, please. I Let's think that the mayor, I think that the mayor made a good suggestion. Um, I have, um, when I was uh, uh, involved with Buildings and Grounds 100 years ago at Hobart William Smith, there were, uh, the, 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 the colleges suffered uh, the elm disease thing and had to take down every elm tree on campus. Um, it lost an awful lot of trees and in some, some special places, they brought in really, really big trees to replace them. And um, uh, it's, it's a task and uh, it's a chore to maintain them and they need, to, they need uh, ongoing care to get them well established. But I'd let, I think what the best way for us to, to handle this is if the city manager can come up with the options and the costs of these different alternatives and what, you know, what uh, sort of um, options we can play with and so that we can better inform the residents when we meet with them. But I think, you know, uh, I'm glad that uh, the residents would be involved and that Laura's, uh, Laura's ability to contact them and get them out there and so we can hear from them um, is, is, is part of it, but, um, I don't think I was, uh, speaking just for myself when I said I was disappointed that we might, um, lose that character. I think there are people who live there that would feel the same way as I do. City manager, I believe you had something. Uh... Just a note on, on the trees. There's two, two different approaches that are being looked at. One is the, the larger trees that is more in the spade that comes in the dig out the roots and, and they transport. Um, some trees do better than others in that process and that size. The other one, it was developed um, by actually one of my former Cornell professors uh, is called CU soil and they've been using it. Um, and it gives, ends up planting a smaller tree but it gives a lot of nutrients to the root. Um, and so the, the care of the, of the trees is something that is uh, being looked at and the options about what would provide a faster uh, growing tree. So I think there's a, we, some good discussion here and I think there's some decisions to be made. The, uh, the way I see it right now, um, remediation is, is eminent if, if it's recommended for the fall. And I believe what the city manager is asking us is if we, if we want to prevent the, rem, the remediation to take place, she would need a motion and a vote on that. So 
if somebody wants to make that motion, we can follow through with that process. Councilor Pruitt, you want to make a motion? I'll make that motion to, to delay until we get more information. Well, I don't know if delay is an option here. Is delay an option, city manager? I will, I will definitely find out on the, the pause and, and their timing for that. So if you're looking to pause, I guess I, it's still unclear and maybe you're wanting more information, but I, we well, won't be able to do a halfway remediation. And so I am still a little unclear of where folks are landing with that. I do well, hear that the, the preservation of trees and that's what we've been, uh, the, the meeting that we, that we had was how do we, um, be able to do that for more of the trees and that's an issue just because of the, the depth. Um, some of the ones that there's a really more prominent maple tree on the north side uh, that we've been asking about but it, the concern is that the tree won't survive and then um, we would have to you know just um, take it down. Um, so I guess if you're wanting to pause I will I will see it may delay to a different season and there was concern from the DEC on that um, that process just because of the contamination but I, I do would love actually though Sage you're, what you're asking is what would the pause mean and what I would say is go to Cornell and get your old professor or a couple of other people that haven't looked at it yet and ask them if there is an alternative and, uh, and then talk to the DEC and see if there isn't some you know to tell them the council's concerns this is important is there another way to look at it so I guess I need clarity on that I think what you're asking for and we can give you more information on that of what Jerry Bond the, the arborist did I, I was talking about our resources for looking at options for new tree planting I I do not feel comfortable or not an expert for going out to find out a different advice uh, but what I'm hearing is that you're wanting to to pause it and I will find out tomorrow or over the next couple of days schedule wise and then um, if you're um, hopefully maybe even before our meeting tomorrow night I know that's not on the topic but um, I would I'm looking at what I'm hearing is that a pause for delay to find out if there's any other options for saving some of the trees and what I we have been digging and asking and I don't think that there necessarily is a different alternative but that's what I'm hearing the request is for us to look into. Thank you, City Manager. One last option, one last option, Sage, to consider is if I've seen this done when we moved five and 20, when the five and 20 was moved, they brought out some, they moved some big trees, some that were a, a foot in diameter. And it's a massive, it's a huge machine. But if, we're, if we were picking up one of those trees, one of the, not the oak, but some of the other ones that are smaller than that, like the maple maybe, and picking it up and then remediating and then replanting it, that that's the, the most ideal use of that kind of equipment. Okay, uh, I believe, Emil, did you want to say something? I saw you raise your hand. I don't want to lose track of that because I'd like to keep moving here. Oh, we need to unmute them. There you go. Oh, you're not unmuted yet, Emil. There you go. Okay, thank you. Very quickly, uh, there's a number of factors here, one of which I don't hear being discussed is that uh, there, the city of Geneva has a national uh, a historic district, the Genesee Park, Genesee Historic District. This is right in the middle of it. And this district is also on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, Pulteney, I think South Main Street, Pulteney, and so um, I think when you're when you're considering this, you might want to be talking to Shippo about what you're planning and whether they would play a role, maybe a maybe a helpful role in the preservation of the trees and that sort of thing. But I don't think you can ignore that it's in a historic district. Thank you. Okay, I think we got good direction for tomorrow night. So we're going to move on to mayor and council reports. Uh, council Regan, if you'd like to go first, please. There we go. Okay. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I'll be quick. I mean, this, this was an emotionally draining meeting. I don't want to speak more about that. So I will <clears throat> just say 
first of all, um, I want to thank my uh, the residents of my ward who came out from uh, the town hall style meeting that we held in September. Um, it was raining out and we, we got a pretty good crowd and it felt really good to see people and hear voices live. And I'm glad people made the effort to come. Um, and there's another one happening um, next week, Tuesday the 8th, same location, um, the Geneva Community Center, 5.30 to 7. And thanks to the Community Center for lending me that space. Um, <clears throat> Finally, and I also want to do a little positive spin here and give a real shout out to two little groups. Um, one is the, the DPW <laughs> and the other is the Green Committee. I'm very proud of the Green Committee. Um, we um, met continuously through, through the pandemic and met in productive ways, um, including things like, uh, well, the pesticide res resolution that we passed a couple meetings ago um, happened as a result of the work of this committee. And there's been a retreat and so forth. Um, so that's, it's all been really positive despite the odds, you know, uh, of uh, being able to work through everything that we did. Uh, but to tie it into the DPW, um, it, it, the pesticide ban that we passed, the DPW took on very graciously, I have to say, um, especially in the face of um, deleted, uh, a depleted workforce, especially this summer. Um, and they began their work with, the, with this uh, restriction in place. They discovered bees at the Welcome Center and um, they really didn't know how to approach it without using uh, chemicals that were banned according to this um, new resolution. So Joe Venuti did reach out to me and the committee and um, asked for recommendations and that was just wonderful. And then our committee in turn reached out to the town, our, our, our neighbors and friends and the, um, our, uh, it, the similar um, committee that they have, which is, a, which is called the Sustainable Committee. Uh, Jennifer Grant is the chair of that. She has extensive professional um, knowledge of pest control issues. And uh, she did meet with Joe and members of his crew, provided several traps. And I thank her for that effort and the traps she provided. She reviewed other possible approaches with them, talked about other issues that they're about to come, you know, that they will be facing with this new uh, ban in place. Um, and Joe has come back with some questions and I just wanna celebrate this kind of um, working together of a, a, you know, a, a group of volunteers. They also did some weeding down at the lakefront, um, you know, again, on a volunteer basis, obviously. And um, it's, it's a great thing to see the expertise of our citizens uh, kick in and then to reach out to the town as well. So I celebrate both the DPW and, uh, and the Green Committee. And I'm happy to be a liaison to that group. Thank you. Also, Burl. Uh, yes, I've been asked to um, read a report from the City of Geneva Board of Ethics. Um, and I can't be brief because uh, it's three and a half pages. So um, this is the decision recommendations on complaint against Mayor Valentino, Councillor Noon, and Councillor Peeler on 24 August 2020. Uh, one, nature of complaint. A complaint was filed by an anonymous citizen on July 8, 2020 against Mayor Valentino, Councillor Noon, and Councillor Peeler for their conduct at the July Council meeting. In the same complaint, Councillor Galanese was called out for allegedly making misogynistic facial expressions toward Councillor Salamandra at the June Council meeting. Finally, the complaint cites letters by citizens calling out Councillor Salamandra's behavior, stating that these letters went over the three minute time limit. The board has chosen to disregard the accusations against Councillor Galanese for allegedly inappropriate facial expressions and letters due to the fact that facial expressions can be interpreted in any number of ways by any number of people and cannot therefore be given as a reason for unethical behavior. The board has also chosen to disregard accusations of letters, readings going over the three minute time limit have been levied by citizens on all sides of the political spectrum. This is a separate issue which the board will address when they present a forum for city government on the code of ethics which will be given at whatever point the city deems safe 
considering the COVID situation. Content notwithstanding, the point is that all public comments should be limited to three minutes as per standard city council practice. The board will therefore concentrate on the accusations against Councillor Peeler and Noon, as well as the mayor for comments and actions taken at the July 1st council meeting. Two, deliberation. The board duly noted that the July 1st council meeting was excessively long and extremely hard to follow. The board also noted that the conduct of the meeting lost control at a certain point and that several counselors seemed genuinely confused as to what was actually going on. The content of the July 1st council meeting is readily available, so specifics won't be given here. Councillor Peeler is seen to display a handwritten sign with the word, quote, order, unquote, while Councillor Salamandra was speaking. As the dialogue between Councillor Salamandra with the mayor and others begins to break down, Councillor Noon interrupts, calling out Councillor Salamandra as being, quote, blatantly disrespectful every single time to multiple people, unquote. When Councillor Salamandra presses the mayor for a quote, vote, unquote, on an Im impending resolution, the mayor tells her, quote, you will have to hold your breath and turn blue, unquote. It is not up to the board in this case to determine the validity of Councillor Salamandra's comments or to likewise determine the validity of Councillor Noon's comments, but rather to point out where the board felt the code of ethics was violated by Mayor Valentino, Councillor Noon, and Councillor Peeler. The board has taken into account the inordinate length of the meeting, parentheses over six hours, in the apparent physical mental condition of the participants, but has decided that certain tenets of the code of ethics were violated. Three, decision. Upon further review of the evidence, it was found that tenets of the code of ethics were violated. The board's decision is submitted as follows. A, Mayor Valentino. The board found the mayor in violation of tenants three, four, five, and 16. Tenant three, conduct of public officials in particular, public officials shall refrain from abusive conduct, personal charges, or verbal attacks upon the character or motives of other public officials. The mayor's comment towards Councillor Salamandra was unnecessary and uncalled for, particularly in light of the fact that the meeting seemed to have lost direction by that point, and the mayor could have called for order in a less abusive manner. Tenant four, respect for process. In the board's interpretation, the mayor failed to maintain order during the council meeting, allowing for interruptions and less than appropriate commentary outside of the bounds of proper procedure. The board agrees that the mayor is ultimately in charge of city council and by extension, the proper conduct of the entire evening, entire meeting, excuse me. Tenant five, conduct of public meetings in particular, focusing on the business at hand, they shall refrain from interrupting speakers. Aside from interrupting Councillor Salamandra as noted above, Mayor Valentino allowed the meeting to fall apart towards the end, leaving councillors confused as to what exactly they were voting for and which of two similar resolutions they were voting on. At any point, the mayor could have called for order or at least a short break to allow participants to agree to what, if anything, would be voted on. At the very least, the mayor might have given better directions as to the order of speakers, which might have prevented unnecessary interruptions. Tenant 16, positive workplace environment. The mayor allowed the meeting to degenerate into negativity and exacerbated the problem by making a negative comment of his own towards Councillor Salamandra. It is ultimately up to the mayor to do his utmost to maintain positivity, even during lengthy and contentious meetings, and is also ultimately responsible for the maintenance of a positive environment. The mayor has the right to call out, prevent negativity, but in this case, failed to do so. B, Councillor Peeler. Councillor Peeler's offense may seem trifling, but this is the second time the board has observed such behavior and as such, it warrants the board's consideration. The board finds Councillor Peeler in violation of tenants three, four, and five of the code of ethics and is explained as follows. Tenant three, 
conduct of public officials. Councillor Peeler held up a notebook with the word, quote, order, unquote, written on it and held it up during Councillor Salamandra's commentary. Given that the council meeting on Zoom was live, this action may have been seen by others and as such would constitute less than professional demeanor. Regardless of whatever Councillor Salamandra said to trigger this action, Councillor Peeler had other options available to him to call for order. Among them, sending a private message to the mayor requesting that he do so. Tenant four, respect for process. In short, holding up signs does not constitute respect for process. Again, Councillor Peeler may have sent the mayor a private message on Zoom requesting he call for order, or he could have sat still and listened, as did most of those present. Tenant five, conduct of public meetings. Regardless of the motive, holding up a sign was interpreted by the board as a, quote, silent interruption, unquote, visible to others participating and watching the meeting. Rather than create order, Councillor Peeler's actions contributed to the increasing disorder of the council meeting and thus, in the interpretation of the Board of Ethics, interfered with the orderly conduct of the meeting. Finally, it is not up to Councillor Peeler to maintain order. That is the job of the mayor. C, Councillor Noon. Councillor Noon was found to be in violation of tenants four and five of the Code of Ethics explained as follows. Tenant four, respect for process. Councillor Noon spoke out of turn to make personal remark and was thus out of order in accordance with proper procedure. Tenant five, conduct of public meetings. Councillor Noon's remark was of a personal nature and expressed his personal opinions, which were not germane to the business at hand in a manner which interrupted the orderly conduct of the meeting. A personal message to the mayor would have been a more appropriate action. Recommendations. While the board has found Councillor Noon in violation of tenants four and five of the Code of Ethics, extenuating circumstances were taken into account and the board recommends no further action. This notice should, however, be considered a verbal warning. The board has found Councillor Peeler in violation of tenants three, four, and five of the Code of Ethics. The board recommends that Councillor Peeler make a public apology to city council for inappropriately undermining the due process of a city council meeting. Mayor Valentino has been found to be in violation of tenants three, four, five and 16 of the Code of Ethics. The board recommends that he publicly apologize to Councillor Salamandra for his comment and publicly apologize to city council for not maintaining order and decorum. It is the board's hope that the mayor will make a greater effort to maintain order while at the same time running city council meetings in a positive and exemplary manner. Respectfully submitted, the City of Geneva Board of Ethics, which consists of James G. Petropoulos, Chair, Rebecca Sedzkowski, Sedz Sedzkowski, Vice Chair, Nate Miller, Secretary, Victor Nelson, Sharon Dutcher, and Stephen Lee. Thank you, Council. Do you have any reports you'd like to report on? Um, I do. Um, as a liaison to the Geneva Business Improvement District, uh, we're happy to report uh, that we have four new businesses, um, three of them retailers and one of them a partial retailer that will be opening soon in downtown Geneva. Um, many people, hopefully all of us here, have noticed that we have three new kiosks um, in downtown Geneva that were fully funded by the Finger Lakes uh, Visitors Connection. Uh, one of them is at the corner of Scott LaFerro Drive and Seneca Street. The other one is on East Castle Street. And the other one, I believe, is in front of Bicentennial Park on Exchange Street. Uh, the BID is, um, is under a uh, Commit to Geneva campaign. You may have seen the posters in downtown businesses. And they're also uh, starting and moving through with our new banner program, uh, which has been absent for a number of years. Um, I'm also the council representative for the Historic Districts Commission. 
Uh, we met on Thursday, July 30th uh, for the first time in a little over a year. Um, and we had uh, election of officers in the uh, chair, uh, Ford Weisskettle, Vice Chair Tim Buckley, and Secretary Victoria Lehman um, were uh, elected to fill those slots. Um, we had a uh, historic, lengthy discussion on uh, 690, or excuse me, on 815 South Main Street, uh, where a, pres uh, a presentation was made uh, to um, to subdivide that parcel and to build a new home on the property. And after um, much conversation, um, I wanna say it was close to two hours, um, the Historic Districts Commission uh, denied a certificate of appropriateness uh, five to zero with two members recusing uh, due to the relationship to the applicant. Um, we also talked at that meeting about the uh, new roofing material on St. Peter's Episcopal Church, um, which was uh, approved. And then a week later, uh, we had to reconvene because the um, uh, material was changed as a result of the expense and that was also approved. Um, the College Livability Task Force uh, had their first meeting um, during our tenure, I was not able to um, attend that, but fellow counselor Frank Alanese uh, can make that part of his uh, report. Um, we have a next blood drive in Geneva is Thursday, September 10th at St. Francis um, Church on Exchange Street from 1 to 6 p.m. And I really want to give a heartfelt and appreciative shout out tonight to our city clerk, Lori Guinan, who has assembled um, 70 or 80 pages of uh, stakeholder comments on the issues that we are working with. Um, if there is ever an MVP uh, in this community right now, um, it would be a unanimous vote for our city clerk. Um, thank you so much for all that you do. Um, I will stress, and I'm hoping that we can meet in person as Zoom council members uh, just as soon as possible for those that would like to meet in the same room via Zoom. Um, perhaps we could do this tomorrow at our 5.30 work session. Um, and I would like to just end by um, encouraging people to listen, be respectful, have control, patience, return all your telephone calls, and let's make it a goal again to put the ethics committee out at business so they have nothing else to do. Thank you so much. And my goodness, I can't believe we're going to get out of here tonight before the morning whistle. That's the end of my report. Not out yet. Um, Councilor Pruitt. Right after you say we're not out yet. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm going to probably abbreviate mine. I hope we get back to the point where we can spend more time on, on ward issues uh, because we've gotten away from it the last few meetings. I have literally 10, 11 items on my list. So I'll try to synopsize and just get to some of the ones that are more uh, immediate. Uh, and that's the first thing is would be on my li liaisonship for the Historical Society. Wanted to bring you up to date on a couple of things that they're doing. First of all, they're working with the Bank of Canandaigua that as you probably know is moving into the Friendlies building. So that's really a, a feather in the cap of our, our, our city management for bringing a new business or an expanded business into town. And it'd be nice to see that building used. So hats off to our city management for that. Also, um, they th I thought it was interesting that they'd gotten 27,000 posts on the roller drum when they'd shown that as a as a, something in the history uh, 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 website that they have. So I, I'm thinking that there's a way for us to utilize that, that resource down there to a greater extent. Just wanted to plant the seed with you folks. Uh, they're still operating at about 25% of their time out at Rose Hill is very limited. Uh, they do have a By Geneva initiative that they're looking at very strongly. 
In terms of the fall program uh, from their meeting, it's all gonna be uh, Zoom, except in October, there will be a tour of the St. Uh, Patrick Cemetery here in the sixth ward. And that's, those are fun. I think everybody likes those. So be aware that that'll be coming up and be listed on the GNRC website. <laughs> also, um, they are starting to um, doing online auctions. And so they're looking for people that might have auction items that you can donate to the Geneva Historical Society. And they're also asking specifically uh, authorized to be able to have those auction items included in a GNRC type of uh, notice because they're looking to get people interested in doing the auction. So if there's something that could be done there, I'll be following up and writing to our city management on it. Um, I also wanted to make a point that you don't have to be a member of the Geneva Historical Society to take part in anything that they're doing. Their programs are open to the general public for anybody that lives in Geneva or outside of Geneva. Uh, they're also changing their name to Historic Geneva versus the Geneva Historical Society. So that, that'll be, I think, a, a, a better reflection on what their motives and, and uh, mandate is. I think something else I wanted to comment on that I think most of us missed, and that is I wanted to commend Katie Labby and also uh, Jacob Clyde for putting on these programs for zombie houses. Uh, I was the only one that attended Ward 6. It amazed me. They had such good information, uh, 106 tax delinquencies here in the ward, 196 not owner occupied houses, second highest uh, absentee, land, uh, absentee uh, ownership of the homes here in the area, 11 empty homes, property values decreasing, quite a few things that came out that they've done wonderful research on and that they have uh, an impetus on. And I think it really behooves we as counselors to get more involved in what their activities and working with Katie to find out where our, our uh, wards stand relating to something very important, which is these zombie houses that would like to get rectified. So hats off to those two for really getting that done. I think they had a, a meeting for Ward 5. I don't know how that turned out. And also I think, uh, Jan, up in your area, they were going to have one. I don't know if that commenced or not. I don't know if the rest of the counselors are, are looking to have such a session for themselves. I hope so. Um, I also wanted to thank Joe uh, Venuti for his excellent follow-up. I've had two formal complaints and one that came in afterward in terms of odors down here. And uh, he did a fabulous job of following up. <clears throat> it, uh, I, I think it really had a full gamut of, of alternatives in terms of what could be causing an odor. Could be Libby's in terms of a lot of their, you know, their processing. Could be Casella. Could be the diesels from the trucks. It could be just organic waste in Marsh Creek that floods in from, you know, during water, uh, during rains, if you will. Uh, and all of that, I think, was very useful to the people that I had to talk to here to try to assuage their concerns. He also went way out of his way to walk along the, the Lehigh Valley berm to look at trees that might be in jeopardy of falling over on people's property as well. And uh, is coming up with plans for that. So again, you can't ask for more than what we're getting out of our Department of Public Works manager at this point in time. Um, I also wanted to mention that the, uh, the public garden, the Crystal Street Public Garden, is up and running and looking beautiful, thanks to the city for allowing the lease on that property and for blueprint for, uh, for really organizing everything it took to get it together. And they're having an open session. Remember, this is not just for Ward 6, it's for the whole city. So if you want some free vegetables and uh, some, some refreshments and good camaraderie, September 10th from 5 to 10 on Crystal Street, which is right there near the tunnel on, uh, you know, next to Marsh Creek off of East North Street. Please come to attend if you can. Uh, I also saw something in the quarterly report from city management that there's a review ongoing for the, the water, uh, or it's either the water or sewer program with the town of Geneva. Uh, but what, what's going on there and what, what kind of negotiations are going on? I think we've all brought it up in the past if there was some way to really uh, homogenize our interest of the communities around us, that would be good. And I saw in the newspaper that Phelps and Waterloo were working on, I think it was a sewer project together. I thought, gosh, we're right in the middle. Are we involved in that? And so if we could spend some time on really that portion of the, of the city manager's quarterly report, that would be great. Um, and final thing is that, uh, again, this is still abbreviating the reports. There, there's uh, two, Two different people have, uh, have indicated to me that a lot of people are speeding on the small side streets. And I've got it from the war one Ward 5 person and one Ward 6 person so far, and actually a couple of Ward 6. And I looked it up. I wonder if, uh, is there anything that would prevent us 
or even from me from supplying these rubber speed bumps. Uh, like firemen use it to cover the hoses when they, you know, they don't want someone running over it in the street. And I noticed on eBay, they're not that expensive. Uh, uh, again, it could be, it doesn't have to be a city expense, but would there be any problem with putting in removable speed bumps that could be put in or out, I guess, during separate times on a couple of streets if they were needed? So I'd like to get that clarified and I'll be following up with Sage and Adam on that later. It may be something, if any of you are experiencing the same thing, I wanted to bring it up to see if it's a problem that should be managed on a broader citywide basis. So that's, uh, again, outside of taking more time late in the day, uh, I hope we get back to more time on city council business in the future versus ethics and, uh, and public comment because it is, these meetings really going on for six hours or so are, are, are difficult to contend with. I don't think we're getting as much done as we should. So thank you, folks. Thank you, Councilor. Right Councilor, Councilor Cam. Um, I have uh, just a couple of items uh, for, did you say me? Yes. Okay, I have a couple of items. Uh, you all might know and have had the pleasure of driving up and down uh, Lafayette Avenue the last uh, month or so. Uh, but actually, the last couple of years, Lafayette Avenue, I would say, is reputedly one of the worst streets in the city of Geneva. And uh, it's finally getting its day. And um, all the utilities are being replaced. And um, I have to say that uh, all the contractors are really great and well behaved and uh, try to accommodate um, the traffic and uh, access to the, uh, you know, to our, our homes and stuff like that. So that's great. The, uh, just the fact that Councillor um, Pruitt brought up the idea of the speed bumps. Um, the, you know, what, this street is going to be repaved and it's going to be as smooth as glass uh, in the next month or so. And I am a little fearful of the uh, speeding uh, that's going on, um, you know, around in the neighborhood. For example, it's um, it's funny, but when people are coming down Lafayette Avenue to Oak and Lafayette and to that stop sign, they tend to go more slowly because they're coming to the stop sign and 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 um, they've got a lot of momentum. So when they're going down, they're going more slowly, but when people turn the corner or go, through, you know, from off of uh, Oak and go up, I just seen people accelerate, and I'm sure they're getting up to 40, 40 or 50 miles an hour by the time they uh, get up to the uh, close to Maxwell. It's amazing, but they're impatient about going up, and um, so I don't know whether there's a, a speed bump or something that can be integrated, um, you know, like a Hobart and William Smith kind of. Uh, bump in Pulteney. I know that just one here or there, there are just places where I wonder if that's something that can be accommodated. The other thing is, is that um, if I had time, I'd probably set up a camera and just record all the people that just drive through the uh, intersection at Oak Street and Lafayette. They're on Oak Street and they just, they just uh, get up close, they take a look up and down the street and they just drive through. And I, it's really amazing how often it happens. Enough of that. That's my concern in my neighborhood. Well, one last thing. I did have some contact with Joe uh, Venuti related to this massively wonderful, huge, it's got to be a 150 year old tree at the corner of Oak and Lafayette. And it is going to get disturbed a little bit by all the uh, repaving and everything else. It's very close to the road. It wouldn't have ever been planted there, you know, if but it's it was it wouldn't today be planted there it's just too close to the street but it has a wonderful and gracious impact on that that intersection and i'm just hoping that they can do the best to inform the contractors they have to be careful because that would be a real that'd be a travesty to lose that tree um the last thing is it's just a one item it's related to our membership in the seneca watershed intermunicipal organization you may be following their uh, exploits. Um, we now have a watershed manager for the lake, a full-time person called Ian Smith. Um, they're, they're in full-blown into the nine element plan, which is basically a Department of State, New York State Department of State funded uh, study that will basically look at, if you do this, then this will happen. If you do that, this will happen to the lake. So it's 
what ab, you know, what they're trying to do is, is they feel based on the science that they've developed and the other plans they've developed, they can understand what actions we take will have on the lake before we actually implement them so we can consider them. I mean, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be interested in, you know, if we waited on the, the marina, this nine element plan is going to be done in the next year. If we put that in, what does it do? What does it do to the sediment, to every blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's what's going on. We are a member. The city of Geneva has led in the past and contributed money to the support of this organization on an ongoing basis. And they have leveraged this, our support along with the town of Geneva and other communities along the, in the watershed and gotten big grants like this nine element grant, this nine element plan cost something like three or $400,000 to complete. And it has got a lot, of, a lot of scientists and people involved and it's got a consultant that's working on it as well. Um, they, the, the fair, there's a fair share formula now that has been developed for all the municipalities that are members of the Seneca Watershed and Intermunicipal Organization. And they've come up with a number and they're asking for, again, annual support. Now, one of the things that's nice is because it's water, we support it out of our sewer and water funds, which have, you know, people pay for. So the, whatever, whatever people are paying in fees for water and sewer, you know, we're distributing the costs of those funds to the general public. But they're asking for uh, basically around nine, thousand nine hundred and sixty nine dollars for our contribution based on the size of our community and what we contribute and everything else. So I'd like to ask uh, that we consider putting that in the budget, splitting it between the water and sewer funds, and then we fund and we continue to be one of the leading um, municipalities in the watershed to protect Seneca Lake, which is at this point, based on all indications that Finger Lakes Institute is a, a, a stressed out lake. So that's that's the end of my report. Thank you very much for listening. Also new. I just was curious, Sage, where we're at in regards to making this month the very last month that we meet via Zoom. I know that those conversations have been um, being had and I was just curious as to where we're at with that. That's all I've got. Okay. Hopefully, Sage, you can kind of address that in your report. Councilor Sal, oh, I was clicking on something. Councilor Salamandra. Um, I'd like to second Tom's comments about Lori. Uh, her work has really been extraordinary. Uh, I'd like to thank her. Um, I also attended the Let's Talk Zombie Properties meeting. I'm glad to see so much interest in this topic because it's a major issue in our city. If you believe there's an empty property or have issues with a property in your neighborhood, please email complaints to complaints at geneva.newyork.us. I look forward to continuing to address uh, this together as neighbors along with Katie, Jessica, and Jacob who did a fantastic job. Shout out to the Boys and Girls Club who have stopped meal production after serving 70,000 meals daily since the beginning of the pandemic. Also to Blueprint Geneva for handing out over 4,000 uh, meals uh, with Chef Samantha Biskis uh, volunteering her time. Blueprint's operation was entirely volunteer run, um, including 50 deliveries uh, to homes, motels, and boarding houses. Also, thank you to Kevin Dunn and Love Geneva, who will continue to hand out hot meals Sunday at noon on the corner of Castle and Exchange. Um, what a remarkable and inspiring accomplishment of what can get done when people come together. Also a reminder of what your neighbors are capable of. There was no roadmap for this, but time and time again, uh, we see how creative, resourceful, and cooperative residents of the city can be, and just how dedicated they are to each other. Another world is truly possible. The COVID-19 Task Force Health Services Communications and Housing Subcommittees continue to meet. Just a few updates from those groups. 
please continue to access Connect Geneva website if you need help with rent, food, uh, or mental health care. Catholic Charities still has housing vouchers available, so please do not wait to reach out for rent help. If you need help with eviction, please reach out to Legal Aid of the Finger Lakes at 315-781-1465. The services committee reports the need for food is up and are preparing to respond. I'm available to help act as a navigator to help residents get access to these services. So please, please reach out if you need anything at all. I also wanna commend Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Since they've reopened, they have processed over 1900 COVID tests. They drive them to Massachusetts so they can get results in 24 hours daily. I know how many Genevans were worried about students coming back and the possibility of an outbreak. I think so far, HWS has done an exemplary job and they are prioritizing our public health as they should be. On PAB, I've been in touch for several weeks with a law firm that is willing to consider offering its legal advice on police accountability to the city on a pro bono basis. They're only waiting for the answers to some very basic questions from the city staff. I'm glad they were able to deepen our understanding of the legal issues as we work on the PAB. As soon as city staff responds to the firm, we will be able to move forward with scheduling the presentation that council wanted on a consensus basis, but was unwilling to pay for. We've had some questions at this week's work sessions about training PAB members. I'd like to report that organizers from the PPP have also been in touch with public defenders about training for members of the PAB. This training that the Ontario County Public Defenders along with other community stakeholder describes as standard for people carrying out these kinds of investigations. We're pretty sure it will be possible to arrange training for PAB members at no cost to the city. Finally, I would like to publicly acknowledge the tragic death of Daniel T. Prude. It was announced at a press conference this morning that Mr. Prude was murdered by the Rochester Police Department on March 30th. Three officers restrained him, including one who put his weight on Mr. Prude's neck and kept it there for several minutes after he stopped breathing. EMTs later resuscitated him, but the lack of blood flow to his brain left him completely brain dead and his families took, family took him off life support a week later. While they killed Mr. Prude, RPD officers joked and bantered casually. The medical examiner ruled it a homicide and the entire city leadership knew a murder had taken place, yet they covered it up for over five months. Mr. Prude's brother called the police because he was having a mental health emergency and needed help. Instead, the police killed him. I extend my deepest condolences to Mr. Prude's family. Also, Peeler. All right. I'm going to be brief. I am reporting from the Geneva Housing Authority. They currently are still processing a very large wait list of people trying to, people who have applied to get into their system, hundreds of people. And it might be an opportunity for us to, and a vast majority are outside of Geneva. Uh, it might be an opportunity for us to possibly explore how the communities that they're coming from and why those communities are failing them. Um, they are also in the process of converging or merging their various organizational entities that exist to manage the Lyceum Heights project. And they hope to consolidate that into one management entity to improve efficiency. And I'll, now I want to segue to, and that, and that wraps that. I'd like to segue to the Geneva Recreation Board minutes. And these were being finalized late this week. So I'd like to, is it possible to submit, submit these to the minutes? I, I missed the deadline, but I have the report, okay. So some of the things talked about are, of course, sad in nature because this year was a was a very a bad year for recreation across the entire state, and especially in Geneva, with much sports and activities canceled. 
That being said, there are some things that are on the radar for next year. Technology-based events like Chromebook education, STEAM and STEM events, eSports, technology for seniors, hopes to partner with FLCC with opportunities for enrichment for all ages, pickle and pickleball. They would, we would like to survey the community for recreation shortfalls and, and a survey monkey in partnership with Mary and Sarah. I believe that is, that, that's Mary from the Y and Sarah from the Y to partner there. And Also on the table is if the marina moves forward, how the recreation department can also exist in that space and, and make sure that the marina stays accessible to the public since it will be public and, and hopefully the, or the rec department can be engaged in marina or lake-based events at that space and, 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 how, and how that might look. Um, Additional recreation ideas include drone, drone school, ping pong, or table tennis for the layman, astronomy, tours, and park tours and hikes. And of course, they are planning next year for the pumpkin roll, the garden walk, music and music in the parks and, and musical porches, scavenger hunts, events with pets. That's one of my favorites and outdoor and indoor movies for hopefully people to congregate once again with. So that is why I, that is why I segued into Genesee Park, possibly tying into maybe some of these surveys and from community feedback uh, from wards five and six and the rest of the community. That is going to, I was going to, I'm going to, I'm going to hold off on some other commentary that I wanted to address. We had some, we had some public comments tonight that talked about controlling the narrative and, 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 and the narrative. And I believe that narrative needs to be discussed. And I think, it, I think it'll be a good idea to bring it up next month. Because there are some things that I believe need addressing. One of them is that the council is somehow, and, I, and I'm actually going to talk about these three things. One of them is how the council is dismissing the police reform goals or disregarding people in that movement or obstruction of the movement itself. And I want to emphasize, uh, and, and my experience with this council and I, I, am, I in particular, because I am the best person to speak for myself, I believe Black Lives Matter. And I believe that police accountability is important and police brutality is deplorable and transparency is important. Um, so those messages are, are somehow being lost on the narrative. And I think it's important that we bring those things back into the narrative because my objective observation is that everyone on this council cares about them. They care about them in different ways, but they care about them. Um, I digress. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Galanese. Um, so I want to talk about the, the planning board. Uh, the planning board hasn't met in, since COVID started. I've been getting a lot of emails of when it's going to get back up and running to have uh, meetings and open. Um, I know that the Trinity Church Project is anxious to get uh, going and people are anxious to hear the feedback of the direction that that's gonna go. And I did send an email out to Neil and he told me that uh, he's gonna set up a meeting in October and that's gonna be in regards to the car wash on, on Norwood, a site plan review. And uh, He's working on to have a, a, a public hearing also for that. Um, so when, when we know, I'll let everybody know that's going to be in October for the special use permit. Could also be for the special use permit for uh, Trinity. Does that, does that sound right, um, Sage? 
Am I missing anything or leaving anything out? Does that sound correct? Okay. And then I just want to also just take a moment. Um, I want to take this time to publicly thank all the good people who have called me, stopped at my house, or sent an email or text of support to me over the last three weeks. I sincerely appreciate the overwhelming loyalty <clears throat> in the friendships, some new, some old. I also want to publicly thank my family for their daily support that has been solid from the start. It's been unwavering. This hasn't been easy for them, and I thank them, and I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Um, the LDC met today. Actually, they met a couple times since I've been given a report. They, uh, they approved their 2021 budget which was a positive effort. Um, but also uh, looking at uh, a project that, um, for refinancing with HWS. And that is kind of on hold right now because of the financial market and the conditions right now. So that's uh, taking the background. I also um, look forward to a positive progressive council as we move forward. I know um, this position has been new for me and this council with the exception of Councilor Cameron, is new, and we're all trying to, to trying to find our way and move our initiatives forward. So, um, I want to retain a positive attitude. I want to look forward to more positive movements together, and um, more cohesiveness, so we can get some things done. City Manager, your turn. Great. Uh, so, I really appreciate there were a lot of. Uh, Kudos and thank yous to staff and to community partners and volunteers in our community. And just want to express my gratitude for all of you or many of you sharing um, the different uh, points in which you are just proud of our, our community members and our staff and, and our partners. Uh, there's uh, several of our traffic lights are flashing uh, and you've probably gotten questions, residents may. Uh, we have very old traffic lights uh, that have had a lot of deferred maintenance. Uh, some of the issues are pretty easily resolved. In some of the spots, you may have, you know, see a benefit in terms of having a, a red uh, stop, flashing light to stop and slow traffic. Uh, one in particular that we're spending um, time trying to address and fix is right at North Street and Carter. And that is, and stop signs went up today and the lights are off and that is you know we're trying to work to to fix that if we cannot um, that will be that way for school starting but we do know that that's an issue uh, we have the the blessing of just the school starting a little more slowly um, to work on that and hopefully address it uh, Laura did mention we are piloting a new uh, complaint uh, email and so that will go full blast out soon to residents but if you're listening just again we're trying to streamline and track complaints so that there's uh, the complaints come to my office, Neil, every single office, and really wanting to centralize it for two reasons. One, to make sure that you know residents are getting uh, feedback and that uh, none of us, including myself, are dropping uh, the ball or missed an email. And then also to be able to see if there's a pattern that's happening as well that we need to address in a different way. And so that is complaints at geneva.ny.us. Uh, the town, uh, we do have a sewer agreement with the town of Geneva that we've been working on. And, um, uh, another one, it originally arose from a, a lawsuit that they have entered in for several years with the, the city and we did an extension last year. And so we are uh, working on that. And we've also in parallel been looking at more regional expansion. Uh, as you all know, we've been, going, we've been going through the seeker process for the second ATAD at our wastewater treatment plant. We, that is a necessary component uh, for us to be able to increase our uh, solid weight, our the solid capacity of our wastewater treatment plant to be able to really be able to offer it to other communities and, and grow what we're able to do. Um, just to note that uh, we did lighten up the executive order for outdoor events. We have been on more conservative than other uh, communities in that. Uh, marches, rallies, and demonstrations is a First Amendment right, and so uh, those have continued during uh, the executive order, uh, but we did reopen applications. We have uh, Dave Sharman and the recreation team uh, ready to help and assist on that. 
course, following all the governor's guidelines for under 50. There is a separate just application for marches and demonstrations and rallies. So uh, make sure that we're well coordinated and keeping everybody safe. But um, that is back open and available for outdoor events that are under uh, 50 again. And, and again, our rec team will help navigate through that process with the additional safety guidelines. And Lori Guinan and, and Peter uh, from our IT have been working on uh, trying to get a hybrid of being back in person and also remote. Uh, a lot of logistical challenges for us um, and continue to you know, just have um, the making sure that we can have all the safety precautions. So we are looking uh, at a new location to have counselors back in person. I will hope that everybody will still wear masks even when we're in the room as five hour meetings are still five hour uh, meetings in a space. So, Lori, again, is, is working diligently on that. Um, the 9-11 ceremony is going forward. We have to keep it under 50, and so we will be uh, streaming that live so and recording it. So if you can't see it in person, if you're not um, part of the actual ceremony, uh, we want to make sure that residents can either uh, watch it live or be able to see it afterwards. And that's something that has been a, a, an important um, ceremony. And just lastly, uh, we are, Adam and I are focused very heavily right now on the 2021 uh, budget. So all the details and, and meetings will be coming out, but that is a process that will be in September and October. Um, and that is uh, something with COVID-19 and our financial kind of shortfalls. It's uh, an extra difficult year uh, for doing that process. And that's all, thank you so much. Ooh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Can I ask one, sorry, sure, can sure. I ask one quick question in case other people missed it for, for Councilor Pruitt. Can you just repeat what the time on the um, September 10th Crystal Gardens um, uh, event? Yes, it'll be from 5 to 7 p.m. and there'll be refreshments and, uh, and reception activities, food, that sort of thing. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Motion. Councilor Noon, second by Councilor Pruitt. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Right. Take care. Have a good night. Be safe.